Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome to tonight's City Council meeting. I now call to order this joint regular meeting of the Mayor and City Council, the Mayor of City and City Council, acting as a successor agency to the Redevelopment Agency of the City of San Bernardino. Tonight is December 7, 2022. It is my final meeting tonight. And at this time, I will ask our chaplain, Chaplain Paul Lujan, from Victory Outreach Church, would you please lead us in tonight's invocation? And I will lead in tonight's pledge. Chaplain. Thank you. We stand, please. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Precious Lord, please give us the guidance in this meeting because of lack of guidance causes a nation to fall. But victory is won through many advisors. Lord, let us not be misguided in this meeting so that we do not lead to decisions that produce ineffective results. I pray that you direct our steps so that this meeting can achieve our kingdom's aim. We place you at the center of this meeting. We ask for the peace of God that surpasses all understanding to take place in this meeting. We pray for your reverence for our leaders, our community, our representatives here, Father, that we could work in uni unity and not work against each other. Let us work, my God, according to your will. Please, Lord, come and take control of this meeting. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Joining, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Okay, thank you, Chaplain Lujan. It's a great uh, pleasure to have you come and uh, in, uh, provide service um, to our city and to our um, city council meeting tonight. Thank you. At this time, uh, I will ask our city clerk please to call the roll. Councilmember Sanchez. Here. Councilmember Ibarra. Here. Mayor Pro Tem. Here. Councilmember Shura. Here. Councilmember Reynoso is absent tonight. Councilmember Calvin? Present. Councilmember Alexander? Here. And Mayor Valdivia? Here. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I do have a special announcement that I'd like to read uh, to the public and those viewing by audience. The Mayor and City Council, on a vote of six to zero with Mr. Reynoso absent, has reached a mutual agreement and understanding with Mr. Phil, our city manager, concerning his resignation effective January 16th of 2023. The Mayor and City Council wish Mr. Field well in his future endeavors. And Mr. Field, thank you for your service to our community. All right, moving on, um, I will um, ask our city attorney for any additional closed session report out. We do not have any re additional reportable action there. Okay, very good. Uh, Mr. City Manager, your report, please. Okay, here we go, one more time. Um, just pull it up, please. Who has control? Hello. Okay, um, lots of stuff going on, of course. Uh, today is the 81st anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor uh, in 1941. Um, so we commemorate this every year. Uh, it's a somber occasion, uh, but appropriate that we remember all the servicemen who died that day. Next slide. Um, San Bernardino, the Santa Fe Depot, is being honored by the United States Postal Service with a stamp. Um, it's one of only five, uh, <coughs> five depots in the United States that's being recognized this year. And so uh, look forward to being able to, uh, to go down to the post office and pick these up. I'm sure it'll be, they'll sell pretty well here. Next slide, please. Uh, we recently received a grant uh, for broadband planning around the city. Uh, it's a pretty important investment in the future of the city, uh, bringing technology and, uh, to various parts of the city. Um, $425,000 from the California Public Utilities Commission. I want to thank our uh, internal services group for, uh, for getting that uh, grant submitted and approved for us. Mr. Field, hold on. Yes. I'm going to ask some members of the public if you could um, suspend your chit-chat and talk. We're trying to conduct a public meeting. And I'm going to ask for your indulgence, please. Members of the public, if you have a 
conversation. We have a big lobby outside. You can have your conversation outside. Sir Field, please proceed. Thank you. Okay, so Miracle on Court Street. Uh, we kicked that off on December 1st with the uh, tree lighting ceremony. A, uh, a great event. It's going to continue nightly through December 20th. Anybody who is uh, brave enough to go out and uh, take a shot at, uh, at ice skating, uh, more than welcome to. Um, it's only $5, so uh, please feel free to indulge. Uh, next slide. Thanksgiving at the animal shelter. Our staff and volunteers did a really nice little feast for the animals who are uh, currently residing there. Um, we uh, had ground turkey, vegetables, rice, and a pumpkin, a pumpkin pup cake, a cupcake or pup cake, excuse me. Um, a lot of volunteers helped on that. Uh, please, we are we still have a pretty full shelter, so uh, if you get a chance, stop by. We're doing free adoptions uh, right now uh, to help empty the empty the shelter. The, uh, the old Pep Boy site on E Street, uh, near, very near the 66ers Stadium, the building had caught fire, and uh, we recently used, uh, resorted to our demolition fund, our abatement fund, and it cleared that site. It was an unsightly, it was dangerous, and uh, it, makes a way, it makes way for, hopefully, for future investment and uh, economic development there uh, along the E Street corridor. Police Department. Um, we have a little bit of news there. Two big drug busts by the police department. They've been really successful and aggressive in going after um, this scourge. Uh, methamphetamine, 40 pounds, 14,000 fentanyl pills. Goodness, you know, only knows who, uh, how many people that would kill. Um, and some cocaine as well. Um, so great work there. Police explorers have joined with Dr. Nag group for cleanup and uh, worked out with, went up to the Del Rosa Neighborhood Action Group uh, to, to clean up our streets. So I want to thank the police explorers for, for doing that, <coughs> putting that effort in. Finally, uh, we have a couple of council members uh, who have been a, um, a, engaged in uh, statewide issues. Uh, Councilman Alexander uh, has been appointed to, uh, to serve a one-year term on the Housing, Community, and Economic Development Policy Committee for the League of California Cities. Um, and then council members Calvin and Alexander have com just recently completed Southern California Association of Governments, uh, better known as SCAG, their housing training. It's a 10-month housing policy leadership academy. Um, so I want to congratulate them on, on their efforts to uh, bring better uh, opportunities to the city. So with that, that concludes, concludes my report. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I know the public and honorable members of the city council, it has been in, indeed a great honor to serve the people of San Bernardino as your mayor for the last four years and as third ward city councilman from 2011 to 2018 here in the city. I have always been a results oriented community leader, a representative dedicated to getting things done and making our city more accountable to the citizens of this great city. As a councilman, I had the incredible pleasure of representing the southern portion of our city and nearly 35,000 of our residents, including small business owners, neighborhood associations, and mobile home communities. During my seven years on the city council, I was instrumental in securing seven new hotels, which came to our city from 2012 to 2018. These hospitality businesses responded to my call for new hotel rooms to serve the growing regional business community and corporate traveler. In 2015, when the Hilton Hotel, our only full service hotel in the city, was dimming its lights and closing, as councilman, I immediately sought out investors and developers to reignite interest to bring back to life a tired and aged hotel called the Hilton Hotel. And about a year and a half later, it was restored with nearly $9 million in upgrades and remodeling efforts to raise the beautiful corporate flag Double Tree Hotel flag. The financial benefit for our city from my efforts was approximately $3 million annually in TOT or transit occupancy tax receipts. And then as I transitioned from the city council in 2018 to become the mayor in 2018, our annual TOT income exceeded and ballooned to over $5.5 million in annual TOT tax receipts directly attributed to my focus on adding new hotels to the hospitality lane corridor. Additionally, due to my interaction with business franchise owners and corporate brands, I restructured and revised the city's municipal development code to provide the flexibility for drive through restaurants, including the brand new Panera Bread and Starbucks at the corner of Tippecanoe and Briar, along our fast and growing hospitality lane corridor. 
These improvements created more convenience for residents and brought more revenues and jobs to our cities. As a councilman, I worked with Inland Center Mall to bring back JCPenney's back to our city and attract new retail stores like Forever 21. I was the one that attracted Aldi Grocery Store to our city and it so happened to be anchored in Hospitality Lane, which reignited the failing shopping plaza on Hospitality Lane. And I also brought the famous Raising Canes and Golden Corral to the corner of Waterman and Hospitality Lane. As chair of the CDBG committee, I secured long overdue funding for public investments, which were tangible benefits for third ward residents, including significant improvements at both Colony Park and Lytle Creek Park. With nearly $200,000 in additional and added funding for Lytle Creek Park, this 14 acre park now enjoys a quarter mile concrete walking path, outdoor exercise equipment, and a new park, be new park benches, new trees, and a refurbished water play pad, and two new outdoor playground equipment. In addition, I worked to support the unique needs of our mobile home residents and clearly advocated for their tenancy rights and their quality of life. And this strong record of accomplishment propelled my election as mayor of San Bernardino in the 2018 election. During my first year in the mayor's office, I balanced the city budget without employee layoffs and began the process of restoring city services, which had been cut to the bone by my predecessor. Public safety has always been my top priority, and as mayor, I successfully advocated for an increase to our police department's budget and added more office to our patrol streets. I also implemented the Department of Justice sanctioned model called community policing and opened a new police substation here in our city, improved the police response time, and trimmed the layers of bureaucracy so that our PD could better serve our residents and businesses. As your mayor and a strong fiscal conservative, I built the reserves in four years to well over $60 million in planned and sustained savings for city taxpayers. And with the additional federal ARPA funds, our city now has reserves um, well over $100 million, money which is being used to better upgrade our city parks and streets. Two of the greatest challenges that I faced as mayor were responding to the 2020 COVID pandemic and to the post-George Floyd riots. I worked with our police chief then to secure service and mutual aid response from surrounding law enforcement agencies with well over 400 police officers on our city streets through the riots of May 31, 2020. In fact, I was out there for 15 and a half hours myself to protect our local neighborhoods and businesses. Through my advocacy and leadership at the San Bernardino International Airport, our airport and land development deals are at a record level. As president of the airport, our city welcomed the first West Coast hub for Amazon Prime Logistics with 7,000 jobs and 25 flights daily, and we cut the ribbon in April of 2021. Throughout the pandemic, I led negotiations and brokered multiple deals which has brought added jobs to our, uh, to our city and soon will approve the historic San Bernardino International Gateway specific plan. I also was the first mayor to attract commercial passenger air service to our airport with daily nonstop flights from our San Bernardino International Airport to San Francisco International Airport. And just recently, about a month ago, we announced flights from our city, San Bernardino, to Las Vegas International Airport. And I can look back and say it was worth it all. Just recently, the landing at San Manuel, a 1.2 million square foot campus, will welcome a major corporate client. I'm happy to announce tonight that Shopify Shopify will come to San Bernardino and bring several hundreds of jobs and related businesses to our San Bernardino city uh, and our San Bernardino International Airport. So as I conclude as your service to this city as your mayor, I want to express my deep appreciation to the people and taxpayers and the residents of this great city. And I also want to say thank you very much to the residents of the Third Ward. Uh, I also want to say thank you to my family, uh, my beautiful and patient wife, Bethany, my son, Andrew, and my daughter, Abigail. You family are my rock, and I love you very much. Um, special thanks also to our uh, San Bernardino Police Firefighters and our uh, San Bernardino Police Department. Councilman Sanchez. All right, so these are my uh, public comments. Uh, tomorrow night is the last night 
of the San Bernardino Fort, Four Night Ho Ho Parade, which is a part car show, part holiday celebration, and 100% San Bernardino. The parade will start at 6 p.m. at the Santa Fe train depot in the first ward and work its way through Ward 2 and Ward 7, ending at Paris Hill Park. You can go to hohoparade.com for the exact route, so you can come out onto the street and, and wave at everyone and, uh, and enjoy the lights. Uh, congratulations to the Parks and Rec Department for Miracle on Court Street. Uh, in addition to the update from the city manager from the, light, the tree lighting ceremony, I have also been informed that over 700 letters were written to Santa and delivered to their little, uh, what'd you call that, the little uh, letter booth, the, the, the North Pole mailbox. Uh -huh. um, finally, I want to, with a heavy heart, uh, mention that I ran in a foot race on Thanksgiving uh, our very own San Bernardino uh, turkey trot, and I raced our uh, assistant police chief. I'm going to ask him to stand up right now. Uh, he ran, he ran, uh, so we got a little more miles for our money, and he ran, uh, he ended up running a 5K, which ended up being four miles. Great, more, again, more miles for our money. He ran the first two miles in seven minutes um, trying to get away from me, and he did. And he ended up beating me, uh, fair and square. And, uh, and so I, it, I mean, I'm, I'm impressed by the fact that he can, he can pull that off. Uh, uh, I mean, it's a very fast pace. And I think out of 450 people who showed up to race that day, I think he placed in the top 10. So he's a very athletic. And that, he, he's an example of, uh, of our police department. He, most of our officers are in great shape. They're ready to serve the community, um, and they, they make the uniform proud, and uh, I'm proud to have such a professional and, and very fit police department. So I'll end it with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Ibarra. Thank you, Mayor. On Wednesday, November 16th, I was actually at a conference, the National League Conference in Kansas City, and basically at that conference, this is taxpayer dollars that we have under discretionary funds to travel for trainings. Just know that as I was in that conference, my heart was for San Bernardino. Um, it was an interesting meeting um, conference because we had several mayors and elected officials from all over the, the United States of America. And I was glad to know that the problems that we face here as a local municipality is not only what we're facing here, but cities like Georgia, in Atlanta, we have uh, we had mayor uh, from Arizona also, so from everywhere, they're all facing the same struggles we're facing, including the inflation. So just know that when we go to these conferences, um, we are actively trying to find solutions for our city to move us forward. Uh, as throughout the the week, I was there all the way until Friday. I was constantly communicating with our city staff to look into several of the. Uh, um, speakers that we had at those conference meetings that we had, and even the, the exhibitors that we had. Something innovative, that's what we're trying to do here in our city of San Bernardino. So I was out there representing the city in Kansas City. Um, after I was there at the Community Ho Ho Parade too. I don't usually run. Um, I've been helping at the Community Ho Ho Parade since it started eight years ago. Um, I usually start off with directing traffic first thing in the morning, and then afterwards when the volunteers, or the, when, when the runners arrive, I start going out to the course and cheering them on and directing them to where they're supposed to go. So that's what I do for the turkey trot. I saw most of my colleagues there, including some of our staff members. Um, I'll mention uh, Ms. Eddie here, our assistant city manager was there running as well. Councilman Figueroa, Sanchez, Fresh Red was there showing support as well. Mr. Damon Alexander and Ms. Felicia Alexander, great job on the, on the turkey trot. And that was on Thanksgiving morning. I'm trying to look at, it's been a while since I was out here, you guys. And uh, that's all I have on this phone. I have my other phone with my meetings scheduled and I didn't bring it, but just know that every time we're out and about in the community that we are, we are putting San Marino first. Thank you. Thank you for everybody who came to the uh, 
Miracle on Court Street also. It was a beautiful turnout. The community ho ho parade still going on. And this Saturday, we're having the YMCA um, Children's Parade as well. So please make sure to come out from 10 to 12 at the YMCA off of 20th Street. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, great report. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Figueroa? Okay. Uh, Councilman Charette, sir? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll just do my, my normal thing and remind everybody of the uh, problem that we're having with fentanyl. I've committed to say that each meeting that we're here just to keep reminding people that it's a, a real um, epidemic, it's a real problem. It's, it's not a, those are not overdoses, those are murders in my view. And fentanyl uh, is, is just uh, killing our people. And um, it, we just can't um, stress enough that we just need to be uh, aware of that and, and be fighting it at, at every turn. And certainly don't take anything that you don't get from a legitimate pharmacy or a, pharmacy or a pharmacist or a doctor. Um, I uh, watched uh, Chief Hernandez, uh, Assistant Chief Hernandez beat uh, Councilman uh, <laughs> Councilman uh, Sanchez, and uh, I, it was fun to be standing at the uh, at the end watching that. And so I did. I didn't participate, but I certainly applauded the chief um, as we, as he crossed the finish line. And um, Theodore made a real a valiant attempt, but uh, failed. Um, I want to congratulate staff on the uh, miracle on. Uh, on Court Street, I was there for the Christmas tree lighting. It was great, a great turnout, a lot of people, and, and I think it's just uh, exciting what the Parks Department is doing, and I get, Liddy, you get, uh, I think, most, if not all, of the credit. Of course, staff helps, but you're, you're doing a marvelous job leading and coming up with some ideas and, th and things. Um, and then, of course, I want to recognize Pearl Harbor Day and all the veterans and all those that fought in World War II. Pearl Harbor Day is a, a, a real special day for a lot of reasons. Um, that, of course, happened in 1941. And uh, a, a few years later, in 1947, on uh, December 7th, Pearl Harbor, my brother Tom was born. And so I want to wish him a happy birthday today. Uh, Tom Charette, uh, his birthday has always been celebrated on uh, Pearl Harbor Day. So um, I'm I, I want to wish him a happy birthday. Um, and then it's with uh, regret and, and sadness that I want to report uh, the death, uh, the passing of a very dear friend of mine, consultant of mine that worked, was in politics here locally. He ran for mayor one year, a number of years ago. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't win. I think that was the year that uh, Evelyn Wilcox actually won that, won that year. His name is John Lightburn. He worked for the county of San Bernardino for many, many years and was uh, very active in local politics. Uh, he and I went to Davidson Elementary School, not together, but at the, about the same time. Uh, grew up in the same neighborhood and later in life became very, very close friends. Um, he was a dear friend of mine and a, and a real uh, consultant to me from the political standpoint uh, from the time that I ran in 2009 until his passing just uh, this past uh, month or so. So I want to just recognize John Lightburn for his uh, um, service to this community and just recognize him and remember him tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Kelvin. Good evening, San Bernardino. We got a packed house tonight. We appreciate you all taking your time to come on down here and voice your opinions on the business at hand. Uh, and so I just want to say that we are happy to have you here and happy holidays to you all. Um, I want to start out, though, by um, giving some condolences to some families, uh, including my own, that I lost my grandmother the uh, night before Thanksgiving. So the Johnson family, in case you guys are listening, that uh, I love you all. But this week, Demetrius Mayo and Kawana Richardson, two folks that have given a lot to the community of San Bernardino, and uh, we are gonna miss them greatly. And so my condolences do go out to their family for all the work that they've done for others here in the city of San Bernardino. 
I want to let you all know that on December 12th, Northwest PAC and myself and Amanda Hernandez here with our Economic Development Department will be putting on a um, community workshop um, at 1505 West Highland Avenue at the New Life Family Center, um, talking, discussing the housing element for the city of San Bernardino. So this is information that we all need to know about where we are with our numbers as far as how many shelters that we need, shelter beds that we need, and what that looks like. So it's good information. Please come out December 12th. I want to say um, congratulations again to the family of Sherry Adams. She was our first black female officer for the city of San Bernardino. They honored her uh, a couple weeks back and uh, put her inside of the museum there at the um, police station downtown. Stop by to take a look at that. Um, the annual tree lighting was just beyond what we could all imagine. Miss Director Liddy Gutfield, you and P Public Works and everybody on the Park and Rec team outdid yourself. 700 letters means 700 kids were there to celebrate, and it was definitely a winter wonderland, and, and, and it still is. So make sure that you come on out. Matter of fact, December 13th, Acoma Unity Center, the Powell Center, Woodward Academy, and 2020 Vision will be hosting um, our night. And if there's any other nonprofits in the community and you would like to host a night at uh, the um, Miracle on Court Street and come down and bring your family and friends for ice skating, you can c contact Director Gutfield for that information. Um, I attended the IE Choice Awards, which is a community uh, first time award show for the community members in our uh, community who have done great things. The 70th year jubilee for Santa Claus Inc. was also remarkable. Uh, Councilman Alexander and I went and Santa Claus Inc. does wonderful work throughout the community as well by giving uh, toys to a lot of nonprofits to hand out in the community and we appreciate their 70th year being here in our city doing that great work. I attended um, ICIJ Coalition's holiday dinner and that was uh, good to be in the house with friends as well. We attended the White House Economic Summit. Really happy to, um, to be there and participate with all that um, that brought. Secretary of Education Cardona was there to speak to us about how important it is at this time and this moment for San Bernardino to move forward. And um, before I end, I would just like to thank every single organization that has come together this year in trying to help all others and people that are in need. You do not know how much we appreciate you, and we could not do this work without all of your organizations, and we are so very grateful. But um, Director Gutfield has brought these organizations also together in a mighty way, and I appreciate that because we cannot do this work without your nonprofit. So thank you guys so very much, and happy holidays. Thank you. Councilman Alexander. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening, San Bernardino. Good evening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you guys don't have to see, this is the Christmas spirit right here. Christmas spirit. That's where I live. I live in this. So Merry Christmas to all. Oh, thank you. Uh, as uh, my fellow council members said on November 17th, we had the opportunity to have a White House summit. I don't think you guys get the, the importance of having a White House summit here in San Bernardino. This is uh, quite amazing. It's quite important that, uh, that the White House is looking at San Bernardino and the importance of our city, the 102nd largest city in America, was here. And we have the opportunity, uh, uh, our city manager, uh, our, our council member, uh, Calvin was on a panel. I gave the welcome. Uh, Council Member Charette and who else was there? Council Member Sanchez and they were and uh, Council Member Charette. We were all there supporting and representing you in the city at the summit. We made lots of connections that's going to bring and because I, I know this is not sexy, but it's like relationships help bring economics to the city. And, and that's what we're doing up here. We're building those relationships, which we haven't had in a long time. So that's what we're doing. So that's why we go to these things, and that's why it was important to have this economic summit here in the city of San Bernardino. I also went to um, the League of California Cities, which, which, which again, this is not sexy. This is just the work of the council. And I went there to Monterey, where the California League of Cities, where we set policy, where that organization sets policy to the, to the policies makers, legislators in Sacramento. So you wonder why we have to follow certain policies because the, the League of California Cities 
comes up with an agenda. So I had the opportunity to help set that agenda when I went up there. When, you, when your lawmakers, your policymakers get an opportunity to set an agenda of how it's going to go forth in Sacramento, it's important. And one thing that is important that I found out up there is that they're going to try, to, uh, another organization is going to try to do what they call the Tax uh, Protection Act. And the Tax Protection Act is an act that is deceivious in name only because it's going to try to repeal any sales tax that any city has done within the last couple of years. Let me say that again. It's going to try to repeal any sales tax that a city has done in the last couple of years. So anything that we've passed may be repealed. So all the, all the road paving and street and the additional police and everything we got could be repealed, the Measure S. And we wouldn't have known that if I didn't go up there. So I'm bringing it back. We also had, we also talked about housing, affordable housing. I had to put my two cents in since I'm a graduate now. I had to put my two cents in about affordable housing. It also talked about public safety and the unsheltered. All that that I got a chance to put my, my two cents in is about my city that goes forth to, to Sacramento. So it's important. It's not just going up there for lunches or whatever you guys think we do up there. It's not. But anyway, moving on, because that's not the sexy part. Uh, sexy part is going to NAC meetings, neighborhood association meetings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I went to neighborhood association meeting on December 3rd. Also went to Santa Claus Inc. with Council Member Calvin. We gave them uh, a beautiful certificate, and we haven't been there. They said we haven't been there in like 40 years, so uh, we're, we're glad that we came out there and showed our support. Uh, the San Bernardino Turkey Trot, uh, Council Member, where, where did he go? Is he there? Council Member Sanchez? Yeah, he ran, he ran more than he was supposed to, so he owes us some money. <laughs> Thank you very much, but uh, we appreciate them coming out. ACM Evelyn was out there with her son. Yes, I'm putting you on blast there, Eddie. She was out there with her son, and I appreciate your support. Council Member, where's with Council Member Figueroa? There, are you there? there? Yes. See, now, I got a story about all these guys. <laughs> See, Council Member and him and Jody like to be number one and number two. This race has been going on for eight years, and they always want to be number one and number two every, every year, no matter what. They're always the first to register. So we always give them number one and number two. Council Member Ibarra, she doesn't run the race, but she volunteers. And I appreciate you this year because you stayed till the very end and helped out and cleaned up and done what you, I, I appreciate you too. Council Member Charette came on out there and handed out medals and yes, he was watching. I said, he's like, what can I do? I'm not running. <laughs> well, can you hand out medals? Yeah, he said, yeah, so. <laughs> Because he because he was going to beat the assistant chief Hernandez, but you know what can I say about that? So he handed out medals. I appreciate it. Uh, I I got told that uh, like I said, Council Member Calvin, her grandmother died, so she gets a pass. And I, my condolences go out to your family. We'll see you next year. But uh, a special shout out to my wife uh, Felicia, if you're watching, honey. Uh, thank you for putting on this race because we give out the 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 funds to various organizations in the city. We do, we have Primitive Church, their unsheltered program. So thank you, honey, for doing this race. We had a north of 700 runners, north of 700. Next year we're shooting for 1,000, so everybody in this room, I'm, gonna, I'm, remember, I'm memorizing all your faces. So I'll see you on Thanksgiving morning next year. Thank you very much and, God, and Merry Christmas. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move on to our presentation portion of tonight's calendar. Uh, I'm going to call for uh, Miss Joy Anderson. Miss Anderson, are you here tonight? Oh, wonderful, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Joy Anderson will be receiving the Citizen of the Month Award. This is Ward 5 Award. However, uh, Councilman Alexander in, uh, will be presenting the award. Councilman? Uh, how are you doing, Joy? I'm doing awesome. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. On behalf of uh, Councilman, oh, hi. hi. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of Councilman Reynoso, he gave me a little speech to uh, present, so I'm going to you know, dub, dub some names in here. Uh, Joy Anderson is a force not only for her neighborhood, but for the Hudson neighborhood community. 
uh, as a San, and to San Bernardino as a whole. I, Councilman Reynoso, not me, met Joy right before being elected, and we have, and since then we have been hooked at the sides. We restarted the Hudson Neighborhood Association. Joy has been through some hard times recently in her life, but recently she has come through like a champion for herself and the people. Joy never backs down when she knows there is an injustice playing out, and she definitely keeps God first in all that she does. Amen. Especially when it comes to keeping her councilman, Councilman Reynoso, <laughs> accountable for the work that he started. I look forward to canvassing with, with my baby in the new year. Joy is a woman of God, principle, and full of love. Thank you, Joy, for all that you do. Ladies and gentlemen, our citizen of the month for the fifth war, Ms. Joy Anderson. Christmas and be welcome if you have the mic. I was not sure if I was going to have the mic, but good evening, everyone. I normally watch on Channel 3. Before I begin, Mayor, I would like to say, good, do I have your attention? Hello, Mayor. You're still Mayor for tonight. I'm Mayor, I would like Ms. to- Ms. Anderson, I'm listening. I hear you. I, I'm just kidding. You have to know me. I, this is me. But Mayor, I'd like to say thank you. I heard all that you've done for the city of San Bernardino, and we appreciate any growth that happened in our city. And so with that, I would like to say thank you. And I'd also like to live, wish you well in your future endeavor, and thank you for serving San Bernardino. And I believe as citizens, we are gracious enough regardless of how we feel, to always say our appreciations for someone who have worked for us. So thank you. I'm gonna make this quick. I know I don't know what I'm supposed to say, but I do want to say um, our new police chief, hello, how are you? My niece, my little, well, my cousin is on your, Brianna. Sinclair is my little cousin, so watch her well, please. Thank you. <laughs> I have spent the last, as you can see, I have no problem speaking, but I've worked for the county for 30 years before retiring as a manager, so I'm well adapted. I've spent the last 14 months, and the one thing I would like to share with the citizens of San Bernardino is in the last 14 months, I have been to two states in the uh, United States. I've been in the jungles of South America on vacation. I mean, up in the canopies and in the savannas of Guyana, uh, floating down the, um, the river to get our Jeep because it was a very deep drive to the, Brazi to the borders of Brazil. I spent, um, I visited two deserts Egypt and Jordan, I just returned, and I've been to the island of Grand Cayman. I'm saying this because with all the travels, and I'm quite a traveler, and this is in 14 months. Until my knees are done, I plan to hit the road again. But I say this to San Bernardino, no matter where I go in the world, the one thing I always think of is our beautiful mountains. And returning back to San Bernardino, we're not where we want to be, but we are definitely on the road to getting there. And everybody in this room can play a part in getting there. And I thank God for being in a city that I could see the potential, I see the hope, and I believe that all of our leadership will get us there with our support. And with that, I would like to say thank you. There are more people who are more deserving of this, but I do feel very honored. I thank you, and I thank God for each and every one of you. God bless you all. Thank you.
Okay, good evening. I'm gonna uh, present this proclamation to our parks director and I'm gonna ask Rob Field to join me, please. Rob, would you come join me? Uh, this is a proclamation of the Mayor and City Council recognizing, honoring, and observing December 1, 2022 as a San Bernardino miracle on Court Street Day. Um, my family was out there, I don't know how many show of hands was, was uh, joined us on, on that great night. Um, I'll tell you just, I'm not reading the script, I'm just going to talk from my heart. Um, there was a lot of booths out there and I hadn't seen that place lit up in a long time. And I want to just say thank you. My wife and the kids were impressed. We have ice skating rinks, all kinds of good stuff downtown and I just want to say thank you very much. Rob, thank you. Uh, it's been a it's been a great opportunity to collaborate with you, Rob, and our city. And we've we've done some good things in our community. And I want to read this proclamation. Whereas the residents of the city of San Bernardino value the celebration of holiday events through community partnerships, art, and entertainment, and opportunities for families to see the potential of a revitalized downtown area. Whereas the city of San Bernardino recognizes the city's many unique culture and historical traditions and is creating gathering spaces for its population to share. And whereas the community partners, local businesses and volunteers have engaged in a uniform and a unified effort to create positive and a supportive action to bring people together. And whereas the city of San Bernardino continues to strive for improved quality of life in a more unified community, and whereas December 1st celebrated the first annual San Bernardino Miracle on Court Street. Now therefore, the city of San Bernardino Mayor and Council do hereby proclaim December 1, 2022 as San Bernardino Miracle on Court Street Day. Congratulations <laughs> to our Parks Department and our Director of Park Services. Thank you very much, Liddy. You've been a great blessing to our community. And Rob, you have helped us get that, get us to where we're at. So I want to recognize you too. And for all of our city parks workers, I think that's all the Santa elves that were out there making it happen, <laughs> public works team. I, it was a lot of, a lot of work. I know a lot of people took days to set it up and I, I want to say thank you very much. So Liddy, congratulations. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, at this time we uh, will go into public comments for tonight. We have over 50 individuals. Uh, and I'm, I, uh, I want to clearly set up the, the, the rules of engagement for tonight. You have 60 seconds. We're bringing it down from three minutes to 60 seconds because we have so many. We will do one hour of public comment and then we're gonna get into business tonight. So we're gonna call you up by name we're going to use both podiums tonight, and we are going to um, proceed with our public comments tonight. Our first speaker, when I call your name, if you could please help us expedite this, we'll get you on the, uh, uh, on the, on the walls. First speaker is Richard Miller, Luis Ojeda, Roy McDowell, and AJ. AJ, are you here? Okay, sir. We'll get you. We'll get you on the wall, Mr. Miller. Is that you, Mr. Miller? Okay, Mr. Miller, hit the button and we'll start your time, sir. Uh, so it, it's Richard Miller, Luis Ojeda, Roy McDowell, and AJ. Okay, sir, you're recognized for. My name is Richard Miller. Sixty seconds. Good evening, uh, Council, Mr. Mayor, and community. My name is Richard Miller. I might, me and my business partner are the owners of Resource Environmental, the recommended demolition and abatement contractor of the Carousel Mall. Resource has done extensive testing and environmental sampling throughout the mall. This is to ensure that our 
design build proposal was accurate and, and concise. Our resource management team from top to bottom put endless hours reviewing, reviewing every part of the RFP, value engineering, and design the, designing, the, designing the build proposal. Sorry, the time's so short than what I thought. There, we took the time and effort to value our engineer proposal and we'll do our best to make it all happen. We just wanted to let you know that uh, we are the best partner for your project. I wish I had the three minutes. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Our next speaker, Luis Ojeda. Mr. Ojeda. Mr. Ojeda, followed by Roy. Roy, are you there? Sir, you're, you're after Mr. Ojeda. Go ahead, sir. Hi. How are you, everyone? Well, I'm here to speak in um, favor of the logistic industry. It seems uh, some council members, I don't know if it's out of uh, malice or ignorance, keep uh, bringing this thing up. And it makes no sense when the city is thriving because of logistics. So it's, uh, you know, um, plain view that some people is biased towards the industry. And so you guys know, um, today we're here, like over 20 of us, uh, we represent the Logistic Business Association. And we're gonna be trying to reach out to everyone. We want to work with the community. And yes, there's some bad elements, the park in residential areas or where this, it shouldn't be. Uh, we're not in favor of that, but we want to tell everyone and the dais to vote no on the moratorium. Thank you. Thank you. Roy McDowell, sir. You. Welcome. How you doing? First of all, I want to apologize if my words don't come out right, because there's not no speech. But I live on 3404 uh, 4th Street, out here. There's about maybe 50 people left. And there's no help or nothing, no housing or anything, and we got a court order. And I just want to challenge anybody that's sit here, right here, come live where I live at for five days. Just for five days, and y'all probably do something right now. Okay, thank you. AJ? Yeah. Thank you, sir. One uh, minute. Hi, uh, my name is AJ Paul Singh. I'm a business uh, owner for uh, logistics. I have uh, more than 100 employees. We just want to be logistics. One be easy for the permits, like in industrial areas, and we just want, we are not doing anything illegal or nothing like that. We just want to be a permits to be with the logistics stay there. You know, we are bringing a lot of jobs, we are bringing a lot of employments. So we just need a help from the city side too. We move from all other cities, we prefer a San Bernardino city. And we just want to be like the logistics, it be, should be there. We aren't doing anything illegal. We are just to want be in the industrial zoning. We just want to be stay in the industrial zoning. We don't want to be the trucks have a problem, the parking, Yes, we have that problem right now in the parking. We don't have to be spaced because the warehouses are already been there. And we have the trucking people have to be stay in the industrial zoning. So that's all we, uh, you know, one came for. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Shelby, Colvere Bing, Devana Robertson. Devana, are you here? Shelby? Okay, Shelby and Colvere. Colvere, okay, very good. Welcome, sir. Shelby, go ahead. I work for AJ's company and uh, I handle our parking sites. We have about 180 parkings all over the San Bernardino. We have our two yards and I really feel the pain that anything's, anything is there. It always comes up to truckers that truckers have done that, but we don't like it. And the other part is this is not a taboo, you know, it should be that these these companies that how we provide them parkings it should be more affordable and for that we need your help we need that all the damages we are doing we the truckers are not doing anything and uh, to elaborate that more i would like to ask that our focus is not on these issues but we really want to help all our people over there all our truckers. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Colvere, Colvere being followed by Devana Robertson. Miss Robertson, is that you? Okay, just a moment. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm with the individuals before me. I'm also talking about topic number 45 on the list about the moratorium of trucking. Um, it is seeming every county, every city seems to be really um, going a little bit heavy onto the trucking, and we're just trying to understand 
what is the plan? Because if you all know, San Bernardino is the heart and soul of all these warehouses, to name it, not just Amazon, but there's Stater Bros, there's Walmart, all these warehouses, which all their products are pushed by our trucks. And if our trucks aren't being parked anywhere, they're gonna be cluttering your streets. They're gonna be cluttering your freeways. They're gonna be cluttering other places, which is not only unsafe for the individual, but also the trucker. So we're asking for you to reconsider and give giving us the permits that we need to be able to park these trucks that help not just every individual, but the, they're the backbone of America. So thank you. Thank you. Devana Robertson. Ms. Robertson, go ahead. Good evening. My name is Devana Robertson, and I am a proud resident of the city of San Bernardino, as well as a parent organizer with COPE, Congregations Organized for Prophetic Engagement. And I really quick just want to speak to the agenda item number five and say we want to assure you that this is just the first step in the right direction, but we will continue to stay engaged and make sure we hold you all accountable to not just listening, but doing in capital letters. What, what is best for our community. Again, just want to celebrate you all in advance for making a courageous step and allotting that 20 plus million dollars to agenda item number five. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby Nasser. Bobby Nasser followed by Dwayne Pat, uh, Alberto Hernandez, Jeanette McKaig, Brenda Flanagan. If I've called your name, please stand on the wall and let's go. Mr. Nasser, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Bobby Nasir speaking in opposition of the potential truck terminal moratorium. I just want to be clear that truck terminals are not warehouses. The city of San Bernardino has got a significant warehouse base that exists and serves the community. These truck terminals actually work to alleviate some of the parking effects in the city that, that already exist in the city. So I think it's important for the city council to realize that and help promote responsible development in the city of San Bernardino. Work with responsible developers to build a, the right product that includes landscaping, security, lighting, and promotes development in the city that will also promote and help the existing trucking companies and businesses that are here thrive in the proper way on proper terminals. So once again, here to help uh, oppos oppose the uh, potential moratorium. Thank you, sir. Dwayne. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council City staff. My name is Dwayne Pate. I'm the president and owner of Force Demolition. I've been in the demolition business for over 30 years. We are a union demolition contracted company. We also are a local small business in this uh, San Bernardino County. We teamed up with the Griffith Company and we're one of the proposals that submitted a bid on the Carousel Mall demolition. First off, the, the RFP pre-qualification invite for this, the city put out for this project was for a design build entity prime contractor. Within this uh, pre-qualification, it was very clear that the experience needed to qualify for this project was one that you were a design build entity and had a resume of projects where you performed the design build entity for these projects to qualify to bid. Part four, part four A, design build entity experience was very clear that you had to have a list of three million in projects over five years that you were the prime design build entity for the projects. Due to the fact that we're only down to a, a minute, um, we did a comprehensive report too. We put a survey together a very detailed one where the only uh, submitter that listed our pre our, uh, our uh, abatement survey in the docs. Thank you, sir. Alberto, Mr. Hernandez. Mr. Hernandez, followed by Ms. McCaig. Go ahead, sir. Welcome. Oh, I'm sorry. Push the button. Push. Oh. I'm sorry. All right, I just come to talk to Victor and uh, tell, uh, I live in Fort Street, and uh, I know you guys bring the airport, maybe it's uh, help to San Bernardino, but right now I hear they wanna tear down our community, and uh, we worry about it, uh, where we wanna go to live. And uh, what is the, help you to us. We live for so many years and now they want to turn down. Actually, they turned down the two third parts 
from there. So I just want to know if you can help to see what's going on, where we want to live, or how we want to live. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. McKeg. Good evening. Um, imagine finding out that the downtown project that residents of the city stood solidly behind, spoke in support of at the council meetings, attended workshops, and gave feedback was being sabotaged from the start. The Riverwalk project that was going to put San Bernardino on the map was being sabotaged by a couple of folks on the dais and a civil servant. These folks were interested in self-service rather than public service. Putting their self-interest above the city and its residents is a dereliction of duty. And this kind of nonsense is only going to cost our city more in lawsuits. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brenda Flanagan. Brenda, are you here? Yes. Brenda, followed by Gabriela Mendoza. Ms. Mendoza, are you here? Gabriela? Okay, well, translation service is required. And Lucretia Doughty and Jocelyn Sanders. Yes, ma'am. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. My name is Brenda Flanagan, and I'm a resident at 340 West 4th Street. Um, I just want to say a little about hope and trust and faith. I am hoping that we'll get the help that was promised to us. I'm hoping that you guys care that we are in a building that is falling apart with no hot water and we don't know where to turn or where to go for the next help. We're hanging in there and, and we have trust. We have trust that the city of San Bernardino cares enough about us to help us out of this predicament. We are victims. We didn't go into that situation knowing what was about to happen to us and that's that there was never a permit for us to be, be there in the first place. And we're all trying to get out of the situation, but it's very difficult. We're hoping that the money that's been allocated will, will touch us so that we can get the help that we need. And faith, I have faith in you that you're not going to just leave us. I believe that I count as a person and that we count as a people. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mendoza, welcome. Uh, good evening. My name is Gabriela Mendoza. I am a homeowner in the city of San Bernardino. I live between Del Rosa and Tipicanoo. I'm here because of the airport gateway plan. I am being pressured uh, to sell my home. How can I sell my home when there is a many houses uh, being built? <laughs> my concern is that I cannot move. One, there is not enough housing, and two, they're not affordable. So what is the city doing to address the housing crisis? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Dowdy, Ms. Dowdy, followed by Jocelyn Sanders, Jose, I'm sorry, I can't read your writing. I'm going to try my best. Jose Guadalupe, are you here, sir? Thank you. Can't read your writing. And then uh, Steve Mitchell. Ms. Dowdy, welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. And um, it's an honor to be here to speak before you. My name is Lou Dowdy. I am the president for the Southern California Black Chamber of Commerce, the Inland Cities East chapter. And I am here to announce to say is back um, the Southern California, um, the, um, the MLK parade. Um, and I just want to say to um, the mayor, thank you for all that you have done. And you were extremely instrumental and for us to be able to pull on that first one. So kudos to you for definitely rocking with us. Um, so we want to um, announce that it's going to be held on the west side of San Bernardino in the sixth ward over there. So we're excited about that, Councilman Kevin's area. And we're just looking for um, individuals to get involved. Our theme is living a dream, you know, and that was what Dr. Martin Luther King was about. It's about us coming together in diversity and just um, celebrating one another. We're looking for um, parade entries, all kind of different things, um, um, also performers. I do want to announce really fast before I go that we solidify JJ Fad as our um, as our performer for the extravaganza. So the icon group JJ Fad, so yeah, supersonic, okay. yes. Thank you. So, ah, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Right. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you, Miss Dowdy. And thank you for the shirt. Is that you? Thank you. Yes. We appreciate it. Okay, Miss uh, Sanders, Jose, Steve, Treasurer Tees, Karen Suarez. Welcome. Well, once again, I stand here with Uinters United in solidarity for the door jail apartments. I have called the city attorney the city manager, code enforcement, and left messages 
Code enforcement wants to bring the property management on inspections with us uh, into our apartments. Um, we feel that that's a violation. And not only that, they just um, told us that there's no longer up under HUD. We get, we're gonna get evicted for what? We have done nothing wrong. They promised us 10 years and the city attorney needs to find out why they're not standing on that. You know, it's just, it's just, it's just bad. We had a 50 years to be up under there and sub, um, sub rent and now it's gone. They just took it away, it's gonna be wiped away. And so now we're gonna get evicted. No, I don't think so. So who's standing in there for AB 1482? that we were promised by the state. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Jose. Good night, everyone. Uh, my name is Jose Cortez. I live in, in, in South San Bernardino, North San Bernardino for more than 35 years. Yes, I wanna say no close to a small, uh, a small areas for parking trucks. Uh, San Bernardino, they bring a lot of trucks and need a lot of mechanics. So the yards is very important. If you give it permits and collect taxes, it's a lot of lots of money in the area. So this is my opinion and think about it. Thank you. Uh, Steve Mitchell, Treasurer Tees, Karen Suarez, Christian Flores, Kimberly Noss. Sir, welcome. Thank you, uh, good morning, or good evening. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I did not know all the stuff you did for us, Mayor, and uh, of course I have my personal opinions, but I do thank you for what you did. And then uh, I also wanna thank uh, the code enforcement for cracking down on this uh, logistics. I'm a resident, I live in the valley. They're not just coming in, they're just throwing down gravel and doing what they wanna do, blocking our streets. If you're gonna do it right, do it like 758 Fosley Street. The gentleman spent $100,000 with permits and it looks great. But what you're allowing to happen, and it's, it is you guys, the trucker companies coming in here. I'm gonna be the thorn in your side. You guys have a blessed evening. Thank you so much. We need, hold on, we need gross weight vehicle signs up. You remember Theodore. You got a nice smile, just like how John had when you first got here. Thank you. Okay, uh, Treasurer, go ahead. Good evening, Council in San Bernardino. It's interesting that when the people show up, as you always ask, is the one time you wanna shut us down on public comments and not hear everything that people came here to say. That's the problem. Everything that this city has is because we have fought for it and we have exposed the corruption that has existed in this city. We fought for the downtown redevelopment only to hear that you guys are waiting for the deadline to expire in January and waste millions of dollars and hours that we put into this community to help here. That you want to demo a mall that the mayor has been taking political contributions from demolition teams for over a year that has no asbestos report and can cause cancer. That you want to allow people at 340 to believe that you haven't known that the slum ward who is giving the mayor money hasn't been operating for six years. We are here because we know what's happening. If we weren't, if we didn't know what was happening, John would still be the mayor sexually harassing his employees, having private parties our money, and funding your re-elections. We know what's going on. Okay. All right. Thank you. The campaign's over, Treasurer. Relax. All right. Christian Flores. Christian Flores, are you up? You're up. Christian Flores, Kimberly Noss. Meeting will come to order, please. Thank you. Mr. Flores, go ahead. You're recognized. Hi, Christian Flores, resident of extended downtown area of San Bernardino. Oh, also here to appreciate the $20,000 allocation to help with the 4th Street apartment emergency housing situation that we're dealing with and, and hope that, and urge that we can use more funding to be able to really um, keep, pre keep preventing it and, and making more strides towards addressing our housing issue across the city. Um, not only that, uh, we have folks that are here from the uh, Coalition for Immigrant Justice and, and vendors community, um, folks that, that are being hit by both uh, issues simultaneously with folks that are getting their uh, rent raised 50%, which they have no means of being able to adjust to afterwards. And we're gonna, be able to, we're gonna need to be able to address these housing issues, especially going into the uh, rezoning for the uh, airport uh, gateway project because 
those are 200,000 plus families who are now in danger of being evicted and dislocated. Thank you, sir. Karen. Good evening. I'm here to share my unwavering commitment to our families, children, and youth, and ask for your support for item number five. Kim Kanas and I have raised our hands to volunteer and support the development of a nerve center that will help coordinate all of the projects in the San Bernardino Investment Placebook that was announced at the White House Summit and catalyze excitement on the first iteration of this playbook. Thank you to, for everyone who was involved for the hundreds of hours to dream, vision, and create a playbook that includes projects in housing, infrastructure, innovation, entrepreneurship, and community. I invite all residents to look and visit the playbook online at sbinvestmentplaybook.com and look at all the projects. We deserve innovation, growth, and a place where our youth can grow roots. San Bernardino is a place where we can tr thrive. There is opportunity here, but we have to work together and our community deserves it. We must keep our community at the center. Our children will inherit what we leave them. Please support the Nerve Center and the $20 million investment in housing. Kimberly. Uh, Kimberly Nas, followed by Sonia Gray and uh, Angelina, I think. Angelina or Amelina Trammell? Okay, Ms. Nas. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council. I am here regarding agenda item number five. Um, I would like to first acknowledge and express my gratitude to you all because I have to sincerely give my appreciation because it is because of you guys that we are here. It was your step in choosing to invest in the City Action Learning Lab that brought a world-renowned urban policy expert, Bruce Katz, to the city of San Bernardino. And the magnitude of that cannot be lost. That San Bernardino investment playbook led the White House to choose the city of San Bernardino to be one of seven White House economic summits. It was in a tremendous event. And again, I wanna express my sincere appreciation because without you guys, that would not have happened. It is now incumbent upon you, the council, to make that next move, to usher in a new dawn for the city of San Bernardino and determine what are we gonna do with the playbook? Are we gonna allow it to sit on the shelf? Are we gonna turn this into an actual item and bring it to fruition, which I hope we do. Thank I you. thank you guys. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Ms. Trammell. Ms. Trammell followed by Ms. Uh, I'm sorry, Sonia Gray, Sonia. Sonia Gray, hi. That's you, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Ms. Trammell. I'm still a resident at 340. What I'm gonna allocate right now is why haven't we still got any help? But the people that's still there, it's like 50 or 60 of them there. We don't have nowhere to go. We need affordable housing. I would like to see if I can get affordable housing in, in 120 days for the rest of us that's there, because we're still there. We don't have hot water. It's no problem. We, we, we got to survive some kind of way. I'm not going back out on the streets. I'm not going to sleep in nobody's tent. I'm not going to sleep in the park. I want to be in the house. And if you can help me with that, because I am a working woman, you can help me and my husband and the rest of the tenants up in there with that, I'll be forever grateful. Thank you. Uh, Son Sonia? Hi. Welcome. Followed by Maria Barrera, Dolores Armstead, Levi Chin. Welcome. Hello. So I know we only got a short time. So first of all, I just want to give credit with credit due. I know she's not in the room, but Ms. Cassandra's surgery and her team for just being coming in and just advocating and putting in a plan. And so uh, with my time left, I want to be precise is to ask for rapid supportive housing to be built within 120 days. There have already been models that have been presented on October 27th. That was in part of the special meeting uh, where Ms. Cassandra actually provided allocated funds, how it, can, how it can be used, and also models. So what I'm asking, not just for the, the four street residents, because as I'm tracking, there's upward to about 600 folks who's being displaced due to slumlords coming into our region, buying up the property, displacing our residents. We need housing within 120 days. It can be done. Let's do it. Thank you. Ms. Pereira. Good evening, Correct. Mayor. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm here just to say, um, to speak about the project that has been uh, as a proposal for a parking uh, terminal, trucking terminal. I live just right by it, only the field. The field is behind my property. 
And I've, over the years, I've been there 30 years, and I've been having a lot of, it's been a lot of problems, a lot of issues with vandalism, robbery, robberies, uh, fire. And I just want, want to ask you to please allow them to, to build the parking, the parking lot that they want to build, because it will be something, it will be something good for the whole community right there. It's in the Ward 6. That's, that's all I want to ask you. Ms. Pereira, to qual uh, clarify, so you're supportive of truck terminals? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Armstead. Ms. Armstead, followed by Levi Chin, David Friedman. Okay, three um, a minute's not much. Um, downtown redevelopment, we haven't heard anything. Can you please give us a status? Looks like it's been sabotaged. Yep. We're not surprised. This is what this... Somebody on the council has done. We'd like to know as citizens what's going on, where is it going, want to get involved. We haven't been involved because you haven't had any updates in more than a year. Uh, Carousel Mall. I looked at the agenda. I looked at the documents. How can your contractor be less than 50% of the next person that raises a red flag? It looks fishy. I think we should go back and look at it. Doesn't look right for being that low. Uh, the truck route study, I looked at the study. Most of the truck routes are going through all the major streets in the city of San Bernardino. How is that? When that same study noted that all the major roads in San Bernardino are either poor or very poor. Now we're gonna put trucks on top of that in Thank all you. our major, in all our major roads. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Armstead. Thank you. Levi Chin, Mr. Chin, welcome. Thank you, Levi Chin, President San Bernardino Hawks, and also committee member with Lou Dowdy for the MLK upcoming parade. Uh, just want to ask the mayor, council members, uh, to throw in your support to make this day and this uh, parade very special. It can be a, a uniting force for the citizens of San Bernardino, um, and it, it looks like at this present time, something like that is needed to help heal the city of all its ills and council, you guys should play a big part in that and all the citizens come out and support. It's gonna be an excellent day, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, David Friedman, followed by Mardokeo Monroy, John Schollenberger, and Antonio Flores. Mr. Friedman. Hi, my name is David Friedman. I'm a property owner in downtown San Bernardino. Um, I am asking that you guys continue with the demolition of the Carousel Mall. Uh, as a developer, if you choose the cheapest company, just know you're gonna spend more. Something's gonna happen, but whatever, just move forward on it, please. It's, it's a hazard, it's a hazard to our health. It's, it's stopping the actual development from happening, and it's the next step. Whatever happens with our current developer, if it doesn't get demolished, we don't get to move to the next step. Let's get it done. Uh, the 4th Street Alley Grant, we hope the city get $720,000 to renovate this alley, like State Street and Redlands. Um, nothing has happened. It's been six months. You guys haven't chosen a contract or design builder. Uh, you guys need to get on it. This is a grant from Clean California. It's basically related to Caltrans. Uh, you know, their state of California building, their office is right across from this alley. That's probably a reason why they gave us the grant. They don't want to look at this shitty alley. Please get on it. We only have until 2024 to finish and use the money. Thank you. Mr. Monroy. Mr. Mondroy, uh, followed by John Schollenberger, Antonio Flores, Esmeralda Mondroy. Mr. Mondroy. Hello, este, muy buenas noches. Este, mi nombre es Mardoqueo Mondroy y soy vendedor ambulante de la ciudad de San Bernardino. Esta noche que venimos pidiéndole, por favor. Uh, good evening. Uh, he is uh, stating his name. This is the interpreter. Um, I own a, a uh, ambulante is a, a small business. Um, uh, for street vending here, and uh, I would like to speak about that. Venimos pidiéndole una moratoria de unos seis meses para poder nosotros seguir trabajando, ya que hemos sido impactados duramente con la confiscación de nuestro equipo de trabajo, como que son carritos, mesas, carpas. I am here tonight to request a six-month moratorium on what has affected the street vendors, the confiscation of our of our tables. Of our of our carts and our other items. 
pedimos a la ciudad que no solo nos quiten y nos confisquen nuestro equipo de trabajo, sino que aparte de eso nos puedan apoyar con darnos entrenamiento, talleres, para nosotros poder crecer y tener la capacitación adecuada para, para poder tramitar nuestros permisos. Uh, I asked the city, instead of confiscating um, our, our business items, that instead you would offer us training and workshops and allow us to become more empowered so that we can better do our business. Ganamos la ley estatal SB 972 y pedimos que la ciudad se una juntamente para poder tomar unas mejores decisiones y unas mejores regulaciones para nosotros los vendedores ambulantes y no solo en eso, sino que poder seguir capacitándonos cada día más. ¿Cómo es el nombre de la ley? Perdón. La ley SB 972. Uh, I, I'm here to speak regarding uh, the, the law SB 972 and to ask that the city continue to support us in not only the development of our business, but in, in further training and further uh, capacitation, and that we could further prosper. Muchas gracias. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, John Schollenberger. John Schollenberger, followed by Antonio Flores, Esmeralda Monroy, and Mr. or Ms. Sitalili Aguilar. Uh, good evening, I'm, I'm here to uh, support uh, item number five on the agenda, which is the allocating of $1 million of Measure S funds for further development of the investment playbook and the allocation of $20,150,000 for the American Rescue Plan Act funds for Housing Initiative and Navigation Center. This investment playbook is vital to a proper revitalization of our downtown. The revitalization of our downtown that is the spark that is going to get us going in the right direction, and it's going to bring positive and proper change to San Bernardino that they have waited way too long for this. And as far as knocking down this uh, Central City Mall, okay, I'm all for something like that, but what you have to do first is a proper environmental study first. Basine Richard and I even talked about that when she was on the council. She said, John, we can't just bulldoze this thing without having these studies done first. It's for public safety. Thank you. Okay, Antonio Flores, Mr. Flores. Yeah. Welcome, sir. Buenas noches a todos. Eh, mi nombre es Antonio Flores. Soy vendedor por cuatro años en la ciudad de San Bernardino. Uh, good evening. My name is Antonio Flores, and uh, I have been a, a vendor here in the city for four years. Les pido un espacio público para poder vender bajo acuerdos para poder llevar a cabo en un evento temporal. And I'm here to ask for space to be allowed to me to conduct my business with agreement um, so that we can uh, conduct an event. En uno o más puntos de la ciudad. Esto mientras puede estar en vigor una, minotor, una mina, miratoria. Una min, miratoria. Moratoria. Okay. And, and in, one, in either at one or more than one areas of the city, uh, this can be done and, and take effect uh, with a moratorium. La ley SB 972 entró en vigor en enero. Queremos saber qué van a hacer para que podamos obtener nuestros permisos. Uh, uh, the law SB 972 took effect in January. We want to know what are you going to do so that we can obtain our permits. We have family. Thank you. Mr. Flores. Mr. Flores, where do you live? Donde vive usted? En la ciudad de San Bernardino. In Great. San Bernardino City. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Uh, Monroy, are you here? Esmeralda? Yes, I'm Thank right you. Here. Welcome. Cool. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Esmeralda Monroy. I have been a street vendor for three years. And I ask for you guys to please extend a six-month moratorium. We street vendors want to... This is a living for the Latino families, and this is the only way where our parents can help us go into universities. I know many uh, parents have come from different countries to make a difference in their families, and I ask you guys to please um, help us extend a six-month moratorium or give us a place where we can uh, also have our permits, where we can um, have that freedom and also help other vendors have that freedom to have a place where they don't have to worry about the city confiscating their items or their food, throwing away the food. And I ask you guys to please help us extend this six month moratorium where we can help our families, also help others. I know there's many SB people here and I ask you guys to please support us and we thank you guys. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Aguilar, 
Sagalar followed by Jessica Alcacer, Victor Carrillo, Bernard, or Bernardo, I don't know, I'm sorry, Mr. De La Garza, and Esther Olmos. Ms. Aguilar, welcome. Good evening, council members. Um, I am a student at Claremont McKenna College and I'm speaking on behalf of the street vendors. I have been working with them and doing research with them for the past semester. Um, and I'm here to ask for a six month moratorium to put a stop to the confiscations and citations that have been taking place. Citations and confiscations are an act of violence when that is your only livelihood. Um, you cannot realistically confiscate materials and, and uh, have citations when you're not making a real effort to educate street vendors on their rights and educate um, street vendors on how they can get permits. So there's many barriers in place. As a college student, I was trying to see what the citation process was. I speak English, I have a college education and it took way too much effort to find that. So imagine if English is not your first language and you don't have technology skills. It should not be that difficult. We need a six month moratorium so we can educate people, not only them, but also government officials who seem to not be aware of their, their rights. Thank you. <laughs> Jessica. Welcome, Jessica. Uh, Victor Carrillo and Bernard. Welcome. Hello. Hi, my name is Jessica Alcocer. I am an economic justice organizer with the Inland Coalition for Immigrant Justice. Um, I'm here in support of the street vendors who have been speaking with their, uh, with the youth that they bring with them, youth that are um, in school and, st and, and you know, helping their parents uh, to maintain that livelihood that they so, uh, they work so hard for. Um, it is it's truly a shame that on your last day here you are um, sanctioning us to a 60, min, a 60 second uh, comment, but um, I'm not surprised at all. I'm here in support of a moratorium because you cannot enforce something that is not explained to the community as, uh, as our colleague Citlali was just mentioning. It is unfair, it is unjust. It is not possible to be enforcing something that the community is not aware of how to avoid. Um, I would like to also thank uh, the support that we have received from Kimberly Calvin and Ben Reynoso in supporting the community and the community's needs. <laughs> and I seek uh, the support for the rest of you. Okay, I know that you. you guys can do better. Our next thank speaker you. is Victor Carrillo. Mr. Carrillo. Hello, Council. Good night. Um, my name is Victor Manuel Carrillo Gutierrez. Um, my family brought me here illegally when I was um, a child. I am now a um, legal resident of the United States. And I found my first job um, about 10 years ago at a truck yard. Uh, that has given me an honest living and I've uh, made business in trucking and uh, now I see that we're being um, targeted, you know. So um, I'm here today to support the logistics and transportation because uh, I am, have now moved to a little bit of the management of the yards and we hire a lot of people here, young people that are in their path going to college like me and uh, I think that we are an asset, the yards are an asset for the um, city and we need to be protected, not targeted. And um, uh, we need to reject the moratorium and uh, support transportation and logistics. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and that was uh, Mr. Carrillo, right? Okay, thank you. Bernard. Uh, good evening, Council. Uh, Bernard De La Garza. I didn't think it was that hard, Mayor Valdivia. That's okay, though. I'm here to talk about San Bernardino uh, Airport Gateway. Uh, not only is the air quality in the city terrible because you could see the brown when you look up, uh, but I want to focus on jobs because that's really important to say. Yes, these industries bring jobs, but the quality of jobs is, is kind of what I want to discuss. I don't think any of them are providing a living wage or else we wouldn't have the housing crisis we're experiencing. I'm concerned that there's no advancements for our people, that they're working so hard to do these jobs and then the second they have to take time off for their kids, they get fired. That's happening and our people that are experiencing homelessness are working these full-time jobs that are getting paid $18 or less. So please consider the kind of jobs that this industry is bringing and ask for better for your residents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Olmos. Sí, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Esther Olmos. Yo vivo en la ciudad de San Bernardino por 30 años. Uh, Good evening. My name is Esther Olmos. I have lived in the city of San Bernardino for 30 years. Uh, atrás de mi casa están 
para hacer un proyecto, el, es el lote baldío y hay mucha gente que no nos dejan dormir, muchos hombres nos tiran basura y es, está muy feo por ahí. Uh, behind the house, my house, there is a project that is taking place um, that is uh, the baldío lot. Uh, it's a very bad situation and uh, it's, uh, it's very, very ugly. Um, uh, people are having, are having homelessness. It's very difficult there. Uh, y en la noche no nos dejan dormir porque pasan durante el día. Ha habido personas que andan desnudas. Yo tengo mis nietos allí y le llamo a la policía y la policía nomás dice, oh, ya miramos, pero nunca vienen. Uh, they don't allow us to sleep at night because of disturbances that are going on. Uh, we have seen people walking uh, naked outside, uh, and my, my grandchildren live with me. Uh, I've called the police about this, and they come out, and they say, oh, we already know about it, and uh, nothing is done. Y estoy apoyando para de acuerdo que haga, hagan el, lo que van a hacer ahí para tener una buena área y no nos estén tirando basura. Gracias. And so I am supportive of what uh, is being proposed to be done so that this become a good area uh, where trash is not thrown. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jose, um, I'm trying to, you live on Spruce Street. Jose, are you here? Thank you, sir. Come on down. Rocio Aguayo, Enrique Rodriguez, Desiree Sanchez, Miriam Nieto, Mr. Chia. 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 Okay, sir. Chia. Sounds like Chinese, Welcome. huh? <laughs> Welcome. Hi. Good evening. Uh, well, I live in the same street as Esther Almos. I've been living there for 18 years. And, uh, well, I'm supporting the project for the trucking, com trucking parking lot because uh, it's going to help my neighborhood. Uh, I heard that he's going to uh, provide lighting. Uh, and I'm tired of all the dirt that comes from the back lote into my house for so many years. So I'm supporting the project. Besides, it's gonna, uh, like she said, a lot of uh, uh, homeless walking around the house. And because I have a dog, they don't come into my house, but I've seen my neighbor, they jump into my neighbor's house. So I'm supporting the parking lot, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Rocio Aguayo. Is, is this on? Okay. I'm a resident of the first ward, and I want to show my support for item five. We really need the investment playbook, and the families on 4th Street really need the, that support. In addition, I want to talk about the housing element. The city really dropped the ball with that, and it's not a surprise to me when I drive around the city and there's so many people living in tents and so many people being displaced. It's really sad and unfortunate, and I don't want to see that happen with the airway gateway specific plan that is over by the airport. A lot of different families are going to be displaced if this is not an intentional project, and in addition, people's health are being impacted and we want to make sure that quality jobs are being prioritized in addition to other projects. It's, and it's very important that communities at the table when, when these things are being decided, the city could really use an outreach department because there's so many mandates with the state that require outreach. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have uh, Enrique uh, Rodriguez followed by Desiree Sanders followed by Miriam Nieto. Enrique. Okay, not here, moving on to Desiree. I believe the last name is Sanders. My apologies if it is not. Hi, it's oh. Desiree Sanchez, Sanchez with the American Civil Liberties Union of Southern California. We are here today in support of you council members in voting yes for item number five regarding item three, recommendation allocating $20 million of the American Rescue Plan Act funds for the Housing Initiative and Navigation Center. The American Civil Liberties Union Foundation of Southern California is glad to see that the city is finally including a housing first in its initiative. We support the measure in the initiative to increase the expand of affordable housing with supportive services, as well as the plans to look at how to expedite affordable housing development. The ACLU also recommends that the city council use funding for the navigation center on non-congregate shelter. 
Um, and then we finally want to say thank you again for all the work you have been doing. And we just want to make sure that this $20 million is finally allocated to our unhoused community. Thank, thank you. you. Next we have Miriam Nieto followed by John, is it Huck, Huckabee? Huck, I don't know, John, it looks like it starts with an H. Miriam. Um, hi, city. Hi, hi, council members. My name is Miriam Nieto. I am a resident of San Bernardino. My mom lives in Ward 6 uh, near Kim, and I now live in Ward 7, uh, Damon Alexander's uh, ward. So thank you for having this tonight. Don't, I'm a little nervous also, so just let you guys know. Um, I am here in support of item 5, and uh, definitely for... Uh, in support of the need to create rapid supportive housings within the 120 days. We definitely need more, more education around housing. What is the housing element, element? And I know that you guys have been putting out some information about that and we thank you for that. Um, but definitely please work with the communities and the nonprofit organizations that are already doing the work on that so that they can also have some of that education that you and resources that you guys, the city, um, should be providing us. Um, also, I want to make sure that I mention on the uh, airport communities, please create better quality jobs. We need that in order for Thank the housing crisis, crisis not to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have John, followed by Tyler Durden. Yes, my name is John Huckabee. I own a, a property on Spruce Street in San Bernardino. Um, we're talking about the moratorium on the truck, I'm in support of the terminal that they want to build there. Um, it's just a dirt field. The homeless come there, they try to pitch tents up against your fence, they jump over the fence into your property, they build fires up against your fence. We've been working with the developer. He's made lots of changes to help uh, the needs of the community there. I think it's a good thing rather than just having a vacant field for the homeless to live in. And the project manager, one that's the developer, he's willing to help the residents of the area. I think it's a good thing. I'm in support of it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Dearden, Tyler Dearden, you have one minute, sir. Okay, hi. Um, I like the energy in here tonight. Um, I just, I guess, I guess we got a minute tonight. Um, I didn't appreciate that earlier. <laughs> Smiles. So, I guess I need to speak to the victims and the survivors and the Annans tonight, I want to tell you I wish, I wish they sent a better fighter for you. I really do. Like somebody who's like uh, got a better temperament, better public speaker. But I will fight for you. I promise. I promise. I will fight for you. And I'm just getting warmed up. Okay, Mr. Dearden, thank you. Thank Don't you for your pu public again. comment tonight. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, Ms. Armstead, you had two cards for item number seven, no number nine. Where are you, Ms. Armstead? There you are. Uh, we'll wait to call you up on item seven and nine. Those are public hearing items, and you're entitled to speak, so thank you. All right, uh, Ms. City Clerk, do we have any public comments via Zoom or telephone? Yes, we do, but um, item seven and nine are discussion items. Uh, so, Ms. Armstead, uh, those are items number seven, seven, seven and nine are, are public discussion items. So, thank you for your comments earlier. We appreciate it. Okay, back to City Clerk. Do we have any uh, Zoom or telephone calls? Yes. Mr. Jaramillo, if you could please unmute your mic. You have um, 60 seconds to address the council. Good evening, Mayor and City Council and the general public. My name is Gabriel Adamir, a lifelong resident of San Bernardino, <clears throat> Ward 5. Today, I want to speak on the two turnouts on Kendall Hill Slope, now closed for three months again without notice and shutting out the public from the rights to enjoy life in San Bernardino. And 
A second design was asked for by Council Ben Reynoso, was never brought forward for the public to see. In fact, it never came back to any council meeting since the day the Kendall Hill Slope project was on the agenda last year. And yet again, we get an abrupt closure of the turnouts. We are preparing and will be prepared to having a peaceful protest in front of Councilman Ben Reynoso's home and in front of the city council man, I mean, the city manager's office for the abrupt closure of the historic turnouts. And we will be including the media. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Jaramillo. Your time is up. Our next speaker. Holly Rita Meeks, you have 60 seconds to address the council. Please unmute your mic. Holly Rita Meeks. I have nothing to say at this time. The speaker with the name UWE um, and the initial K, you have 60 seconds to address the council. UWE. Okay, moving on. Uh, Fanelli, if you can please unmute your mic and address the council, you have 60 seconds. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. My name is Vanelli Milan. I community organizer with the Pomona Economic Opportunity Center. We're part of the Inland Coalition for Immigrant Justice, also known as ICIJ. And I'm calling in strong support of San Bernardino Street vendors and the request for a six month moratorium. It seems like every weekend we get complaints of street vendors in distress who have been hit with numerous fines and confiscation of work materials. That is why it's crucial we get a six month moratorium on sidewalk vending. Uh, sidewalk vending provides immigrants and low income workers with an opportunity to build a business, support themselves and their families. We're still requesting a space for a worker center with a commercial kitchen to be used by the vendors to sell their goods and use as a resource and training center. Thank you. That concludes public comments. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you to our publics and public comments. We appreciate your comments tonight. We did that in record time, folks. Uh, one minute worked. It was about 45 minutes. And we did more than 50 people. So thank you for your cooperation tonight. We'll move on to the discussion portion of tonight's calendar. Uh, this is item number three, the election of Mayor Pro Tem. I'll open and entertain a motion for that nomination. I move that the mayor pro tem be postponed to the January meeting because of absence of uh, Councilman uh, Reynoso and, and the new mayor. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. Discussion or alternate motion? I'd like to make a, a substitute motion that we, uh, I, I would like to nominate Council Member Fred Charette. And I'd like to do that with a comment. We have a system in place not an ordinance, not a resolution, but for the last five or six years, we've been following an order. It started a couple years ago with, uh, it was council member Henry, former council member Henry Nickel, and it went five, six, we skipped seven because we know it was an election year for that council member, but then we went right back to one, two, three, next is four. I'll be more than happy a year from now to nominate council member uh, Ben Reynoso. And people say, well, let's go ahead and make an ordinance out of that. We need the flexibility to skip any council member who has just has, has demonstrated that he is not capable, he or she is capable of handling that. But right now, I mean, I have plenty of disagreements with my colleagues, but all of us are capable of being a leader for the council when it uh, is our turn. And right now, it is council member um, Fred Charette's term. So I will nominate him. Very good. Thank you, sir. Your time. motion. Uh, is there a support on a second? Substitute oh, motion. I'll second it. Okay. There's second. Yes. Mrs. Kelvin. Um, thank you, council member Sanchez. Uh, as you stated, there is no ordinance, nothing in the municipal code. This is something that was created by, I'm not sure who I know that when we came on the dais that you were the first that I heard to have stated it. Um, yes, we were in a, an election, uh, election year, which meant then when councilman, uh, Alexander came onto the dais, it was, should have been ward seven's turn. So as you instituted, um, when we came onto the dais that you were going to take doing this order, then you 
also instituted that uh, any council member, uh, if they were going through re-election, could not also be the council uh, mayor pro tem. So it seems to me that you created these rules. These were not voted upon for the council. And so I believe that the council, um, the mayor pro tem, should be decided on merit. It should be decided upon a council member that is in that is active in the community, that is being provided, uh, educating themselves on what mayor pro tem should be, the roles of mayor pro tem, the roles of a council member, actually. I think that this should be something that um, if you want to go in an order, we need to vote on that. It needs to be instituted. It is not, uh, it, that it was not done. Second of all, this would not provide any equity or inclusion because as when Council Member Reynoso and myself and Alexander came on, it automatically excluded us from any opportunity in being Mayor Pro Tem, and that provides no equity for our wards. It provides no inclusion for the rest of us at all, and I uh, totally oppose it. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Chair will recognize the member from the 1st District with the support for Councilman Charette, there's a second by Figaro. Uh, members, cast your votes on that, please. And we don't even have Mayor Reynoso. I mean, uh, Council Member Reynoso's not here, and sorry, our new Ms. mayor. Sorry, Ms. Kelvin, thank you. Members, cast your votes on the substitute motion by Sanchez. Election of uh, Mayor Pro Tem Fred Charette. Councilman Charette, cast your votes. Motion passes four to two with council members um, Reynoso and Calvin voting in opposition. Okay. Uh, council member Alexander. The motion has passed and I want to congratulate uh, the councilman from the fourth district uh, who is now the 2023 mayor pro tem Fred Charette. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay. <laughs> this time we'll move on to item number four and my good friend and our local expert, the presentation on the local and regional econ uh, economic uh, report by Dr. Christopher Thornburg, PhD, Director of the University of California at Riverside, School of Business Center for Economic Forecasting and Development. Dr. Thornburg, give us your radio vo voice. Push the button. There I got you the, are. I, after hearing push the button about 30 times. Would have thought I got that by now. Anyway, uh, good evening, uh, council members. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, it's always uh, a pleasure to be out here working with you. Um, as you know, Rob Fields and I uh, have always had a long relationship. He asked me to come out and talk today a little bit about the state of the economy, nationally, locally, and what I'm going to try to do here in a relatively brief period is try to give you a, a bit of, a, of that vision, as the case may be. Um, and to be clear, my, my comments here, I think, are largely about both short run and long planning when it comes to the city of San Bernardino, what needs to happen. Let's just start with the short run, of course. Um, every time you turn around, you've been hearing a lot of scary news about the economy, whether it's inflation or a collapsing housing market. And of course, uh, <clears throat> far too many of my colleagues in the industry have uh, been calling for almost a third a recession next year. Um, to be clear, uh, things aren't quite as negative as the headlines would, would seem to tell you. Um, yes, things are a little uh, odd in our world today, but what we're experiencing at the national level is what I would call the hangover from the excessive amount of stimulus to government throughout our economy uh, during the course of the pandemic. Um, the good news here is the while everything's starting to settle down, there's no reason that what we see as settling down is going to turn into uh, what you would consider to be a recession. Uh, the only real chance of recession is if the Fed, Fed continues to pursue policies that candidly uh, really aren't having any effective uh, a hit on the economy at this particular point in time. More importantly, when you take a look closely what's happening here in the Inland Empire, what you see is an economy which, uh, candidly at a top line level, has never been healthier than it is right now. Uh, the statistics on what's been going on here at many different levels suggest that the Inland Empire is uh, truly uh, at a crossroads. It has uh, uh, it turned into one of the strongest economies in the nation, and there's plenty of statistics that show this. Uh, what's interesting is how the state, in many ways, doesn't seem to be able to appreciate just how good of an economy this is. As for the city of San Bernardino itself, I do have some modest data in here. We only have um, a limited amount of city data, although 
uh, part of my presentation will be a call to action on that particular front because this is a city that needs more economic statistics and the center would like to work with the city on making those unavailable on a regular basis. But yet again, what it shows is a city that has truly bounced back from the difficult times it went through in the wake of the Great Recession. There's a lot of good things happening out here. And, and while the city is doing so well, here's what's most important of everything I have to say tonight. The city could do that much better. Um, you know, as good as things are out in the Inland Empire, there are some basic holes out here. And one of the biggest holes, as I'm going to get to near the end of the presentation, is a lack of a dense urban area. San Bernardino has the backbone, the history, the infrastructure to be that new center that could really take the Inland Empire from the incredible economy it is to something truly global and world class. And I just want you to consider that as you're making decisions about what to do with this downtown area. That's the big picture. Let's just jump right into it. I realize it's been a bit of a kooky year. We've had zero economic growth. Uh, consumer sentiment, of course, has, has fallen dramatically. Again, as noted, a lot of negative headlines about this recession we're about to have. I uh, respectfully disagree, and I would point out that for all those negative headlines and some of those scary things out here, this is not an economy in a recession. The unemployment rate as of November in the U.S. was 3.7 percent. In the last 50 years, it has only been below 4 percent for about four of those years. This is an extraordinarily tight labor market. Industrial production in the U.S. is at an all-time high level. Uh, there's, uh, you just look at the logistics industry and how it continues to keep, try and struggle to keep up with demand rather than having anything resembling what I would call excess capacity in our economy. Yes, I appreciate inflation is up, um, but there's an old expression in economics that inflation is the consequence of too much money chasing too few goods. We have to understand inflation is a consequence of an excessive amount of demand. It's not a, shall we say, detriment to demand, but rather it's being caused by an excessive amount of demand. And while there's no doubt there are certain elements of our economy, of our demographic base, that is hurt by inflation, overall reflects, again, an excessive amount of consumer spending. We do have to keep in mind we're talking about one-year inflation after four years of relatively low inflation. Overall, the debt burden in America is, is one of the lowest it's ever been. Again, it is not the crisis you're hearing at the national level. Here's the big key for looking at the economy moving ahead. Consumer spending is going to remain strong, largely because consumers are sitting on piles of cash right now. Uh, basic on the right-hand side here, uh, take a, this is U.S. household cash balances. This is just cash on hand. Prior to the pandemic, all American households had about a trillion dollars cash on hand. Right now, it's four and a half trillion dollars. Uh, this is going to continue to push consumer spending, and that will continue to drive this economy forward. What's most important about this is this cycle, unlike the last two big asset cycles we had, was not an asset cycle that was primarily benefiting the top 5 percent. Actually, what we've seen over the last couple of years has been an incredible increase in, in really wealth at every level of society, including at the bottom 50 percent, is hitting 100 percent increase in wealth. The cash on hand number is up 200 percent for folks at the bottom. Again, this is a world in which there's a tremendous amount of pent-up demand. Don't look any farther than the local auto dealer, who still has about 15 cars on the lot, to have some sense of just what's going on out there, as the case may be. And, of course, Black Friday looks good. Now, what does this all mean? for the Inland Empire. We'll take a look at, for example, one basic statistic, taxable sales in the city of San Bernardino, which grew tremendously at the back end, of course, of that pandemic sort of period. What happened, of course, was really twofold. One has been the enormous bounce back in consumer spending, particularly consumer spending on goods, and the fact that a lot of that stuff has been going through warehouses that are out here in the Inland Empire. This is one of the reasons for the giant surge in revenues that most of the cities in the Inland Empire have been experiencing. Indeed, it's a very interesting world. I'll give you a, one of my little examples of this. Uh, in the last three years, you've watched Stockton have more higher taxable sales uh, than San Francisco. That's the world we're in right now because the difference, the changing system of, of delivery of goods to people's households, and it obviously has created some phenomenal uh, revenue flows out in the region, which is really helpful for this area to continue to invest in itself. Uh, overall, industrial vacancy rates continue to be at incredibly low levels, lots of demand to move product around. There's little doubt that this is an industry that has helped the Inland Empire move forward substantially, and it hasn't slowed down. Business earnings are strong. Orders for IT equipment are up. This is an economy doing great. Now, the real problem most businesses have, and that's true 
and everywhere in the United States, whether you're in Peoria, Illinois, or, or in Tampa, Florida, or here in San Bernardino City, well, businesses will tell you they're not suffering from a lack of demand, they're suffering from a lack of workers. Workforce shortages, the fact that we still have an, one of the highest job openings rate ever in California or, or, or the uh, uh, U.S. overall, tells us what the real issue businesses are facing right now. By the way, the, con the cause of this is really twofold. It has a lot to do with the fact, from a demographic standpoint, a population pyramid is turned into a population column. Boomers came out of large families, all had one kid each, and now every time a baby boomer is retiring, you get one Gen Z coming into the labor force, and what that means is that labor supply is going to be tight for quite a while. And what's intriguing is, you know, now we're in the back end of the pandemic, and you immediately get to the point where newspapers start doing that, you know, uh, the rank ordering, who's great and who's not so good. And wow, Washington has a lot more jobs now than it did five years ago, where California has just got back where it was. But, you know, those numbers don't really mean anything right now, because unemployment is incredibly low everywhere, and job openings rates are high everywhere. From here on out, economic development is a completely different kind of conversation. It's a conversation about labor force growth. Yet again, come back to the city of San Bernardino, thinking about the future. A lot of folks here have talked about housing. I couldn't agree more. Building housing in the, in the, in the city of San Bernardino is not only going to be an enormous key to helping people within this community have more affordable housing, because the key to affordability is supply. You build more supply, it's going to help affordability on that particular front. But the bigger part is this. You build more and more housing, potentially dense ho housing, that operates within this kind of urban framework that already exists here, it's going to bring a whole horde of new workers into this area, which is going to help the entire economy continue to grow at the pace it has. Again, it's really interesting in California, because while the entire country is suffering from labor shortages, it's California that can actually say out loud, build it, and they will come. People want to live in Southern California. The quality of life, these mountains you were talking about at the bidding of this meeting, People want to be here, build it, and they will come. Enormous opportunities out there. California's story, very simply, is a story of not building enough housing. You want to know why Texas is growing faster than California? Just take a look on the left-hand side. Housing permits in Texas versus California. We stopped building, they didn't. It's as simple as that. Nothing terribly complicated. So we have an opportunity, and the answer is building more, building up. Density is the key to this particular issue. And when you think about California, how we've come out of the pandemic, take a look where the Inland Empire is right now. You know, most of the Western economies, those along the coast, have fewer jobs today than they did pre-pandemic. Not so much because their economies are suffering that much, but because they had older populations that retired. A lot of folks moved out here to the Inland Empire. They wanted space. They wanted to get away from density. They found it was pretty nice, and they stayed even after the pandemic ended. The result of that is you have increased labor force out here, the economy has been growing, there's a heck of a lot more jobs out there now than it was before the pandemic. Again, incredible success story, and it's not just here. You see it in Stockton, Sacramento, Fresno. It's the center parts of the state that have been the economic growth engine, and something everybody should continue to celebrate. Again, the biggest problem in the Inland Empire is that while it has been a source of a lot of new housing, over the last housing cycle, it failed to do that. <clears throat> Take a look at San Bernardino County residential permits. And look how big they were in the run-up to the Great Recession and how flat they were ever since then. You think about the lack of housing affordability, it's from a lack of housing supply. Build more and there'll be more availability. But again, in our world, we can no longer afford to have vast swaths of single-family homes. These have to be high-density units, and again, San Bernardino is a place that is all ready to take on this particular situation. It is the step forward. And again, the place needs it. Take a look at the unemployment rate in San Bernardino County. The most recent number shows San Bernardino County's unemployment is below 4 percent. The only time it was below 4 percent was 2019. So this is a place that needs more workers to continue to grow the way it is. Now, you take a look where we are right now, I hear a lot about housing and I hear two things. A, it's too affordable, and B, it's a train wreck and prices are going down. Realistically, we have one of the lowest vacancy rates in California we've ever had. That is our fundamental problem. It's not really a function of affordability. Do you know why rents are going up? Because renter incomes are going up. 
And I know that's an odd thing to say, but one of the upsides, if you will, of labor shortages is the fact that earnings growth is the highest it's ever been for American workers. And by the way, earnings growth is particularly high for people in the bottom half of earnings. In fact, over the last three years, you've seen low income earners see their incomes grow substantially faster than the high income earners. We should all celebrate this, but it puts a lot of pressure on housing and causes rents to go up. Again, the way to deal with this is to get more supply out there to meet this growing demand. And you can see the growth in working age in some prime industries out here. You can see how they're going up. Just build more. That is the way to do it. Now, for all this good news in the Inland Empire, it's not something you hear out of Sacramento very often. For the most part, they look at the inland parts of the state as somehow are being economically backward, between the coastal regions. This is something at UC Riverside that I have been fighting against ever since I started that center almost a decade ago. It's not true. It's a different kind of economy than the coastal economies, but in no way, shape, or form is it an inferior economy. It's an economy that has a different kind of industrial structure, a different kind of workforce. But candidly, when you sit down and you look at earnings, you look at the cost of housing, what it provides is one of the highest quality of lives in the overall California area. Uh, very, and here's some national numbers. Here's probably something you've never seen before. On the left-hand side is median household income, and I'm showing San Bernardino compared to the United States. San Bernardino is considered to be backwards in California, yet the median household income here has been tracking U.S. median household income for the last 15 years. This is a place that's doing wonderful. Income inequality in San Bernardino is substantially lower than it is in Los Angeles. Again, this is an economy that's doing great. The real problem here is it shouldn't just be doing great, it should be doing spectacular, because it isn't the median economy in the U.S., it's the 13th largest labor force in the world, in the country, excuse me. And so again, this question arises, why is it more of a blue-collar working class economy when it is four and a half million people? The answer is no density. One of the interesting things about the Inland Empire is for as big as it is, it does not have dense job zones. It doesn't have Irvine. It doesn't have downtown LA. It doesn't have downtown Pasadena. Why is that important? Because when you think about the highest income jobs out there in finance, in information, in management, professional services, these Jobs primarily exist in dense job zones. They are in office towers in these dense areas. The Inland Empire doesn't have them. It doesn't have dense job zones anymore. And a lot of cases, it's because people have actively pushed back against density. But density is the key to an economy this side to grow up. Now, for a lot of places, that's difficult. But again, not San Bernardino. This is a, it, at an old city. And there was a point in time where this was the urban center in the Inland Empire. And it, yet you look, just look, just walk down these streets and look at the, the backbone of this city and understand the potential if you can just see it and take it and run with it. Turn it back into what it could be, what it has been, which is this urban dense zone, bring in those new jobs, those new workers, and this city is going to do great. And people worry about gentrification, but again, the key to avoiding gentrification is making sure that for every new job, you have a new house, you have a new apartment, you have a new condo. You could do it, but again, the, it means going up. You could do it, the choice is in your hand. By the way, some of the numbers here, we pulled out some of the statistics. We don't get great statistics when you do a zip code poll, but again, you can see how jobs have bounced back and it was down to 55,000. It's now up to 70,000 jobs. Number of establishments are starting to grow. Even some of all the household statistics, unfortunately, these numbers are way too small, but a big increase in household income in San Bernardino, a decrease in the share of low income households. Things are getting better, keep it going. And that means big plans to reinvigorate this place by densifying the downtown region. Um, we've talked about this. We've sent in some reports. They're on our website at UC Riverside. Uh, anybody who wants to see what we're talking about, please take a look at some of those reports. Um, but again, what I'm here to tell you, if I just had to wrap it up, is this. Um, we oftentimes sit around talking about how tragic and broken everything is. I'm looking at the numbers. There are phenomenal trends in the United States and even more powerful trends here in the Inland Empire. It isn't broken. Things are fantastic. And yes, there are people who need help. Continue to help them. But one of the best ways anybody in this community can be helped is continue to grow the economy and provide opportunities now more than ever. So 
Uh, my one closing word here, very simple, is this is a fantastic moment for the city, and I want you all to grasp it and run with it. Um, the potential is there for San Bernardino to turn into something really special. Dr. That, Thornburg, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. I think I'll allude to the gentrification issue. I think many times our community, somehow there's some myth or fable that we are, <coughs> should be exclusive or excluded from us. I think in your presentation, the converse is true, that we should embrace it and run to it. Yeah, well, let's just say, you know, one of, the, one of the problems that a lot of cities do is they do what I would call the commercial development without the housing development. And when you do commercial without housing, that's going to gentrify. But when you do commercial with the housing and any kind of, I mean, any kind of uh, basic redo of the plans for downtown, it should be mixed use, mixed use, mixed use, mixed use. Every single building you're thinking about should be three, four, fours of commercial and three, four, fours of apartments. It's the way to do it, but you have to make a commitment to making sure, again, you're bringing in the housing as fast as you're bringing in the office buildings. You also suggest that we should go vertical. Break that down, I understand it, but the importance of density, you gotta go high. You gotta go high for any number of reasons. Look, first of all, we don't, <laughs> this is no longer the empty, buildable paradise it once was. And we all know that now more than ever, we have to conserve our, our what remaining natural resources we have. That means growth can occur, but it could, has to grow in dense sort of ways. But density also has other advantages. You know what, you know, what's interesting is people often think that density causes traffic. No, a lack of density causes traffic. It's the exact opposite. By building up and making walkable neighborhoods, you can invite a whole generation of people who don't even need cars. And especially here in San Bernardino, because you're on the train line, you have the trains, you have access to the airport. You know, this is one of the places that you could make a place that you don't need a car, which is, again is an enormous step forward. So you can go through all the elements of that, but again, it means going up. Well, and the value add for the developer on the pro forma side behind the curtain is that the developer now, when he goes vertical on either hotel or retail, now his pencil, sh his pro forma pencils, and that's attractive to an investor. Tell it, us. Absolutely, it can. But you know, sometimes yes and sometimes no. You know, I would actually argue this. There are, are in some cases where you find that they'd rather build, say, three, three story apartment buildings because you can stay in wood, keeps it cheaper. And actually, that's what you want to avoid. I would, you know, a lot of times what you see in communities, they go three stories and then they go 10 stories. It has to have too much density in three to get them to go 10. You don't want three. You want to go straight to the 10, and that means putting the right kind of incentives in place. Okay, council members, any reaction? Quick questions? Council member Ibarra? Sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna break the ice here. I'm gonna be I'm gonna play devil's advocate for you. Please do. Okay, and and the reason I'm doing this is because this is happening to a lot of people in our city, especially to me. Okay. You cannot say there's no inflation when a dozen of eggs is I didn't $10. say, I, first of all, I never said there was no inflation. Well, it says right here, the big picture, beware of the narrative. And, and that's... Yeah, well, I didn't say, I didn't say there was any, no inflation. Okay. What I said was why we are having inflation. You see, the story is that inflation is hurting consumers. But Correct. inflation is actually being driven by too much consumer demand. And there's too much consumer demand because of the massive quantity of stimulus they put into the economy. What they did was they created a bubble which, which overheated consumer demand. Uh, and just autos is my favorite example of this. Let's, let's help uh, break it down then for our viewing audience then at home, how, how we can understand this because I, I'm barely understanding it on my end. Even I was a UCLA graduate myself. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to see the big picture as well. I, I okay. In 2008, so, I almost bought a house at half a million, but I had to do the math. I was like, how much do I have in debt? How much can I really afford for that home? Okay. And I'm seeing that happen right now with a no, lot of the separate, housing. Wait, hang on, that's a separate question. It's two different questions. Okay. Stick with one question. I'm We're just, talking about inflation. <laughs> what about the housing market? Those are two separate things completely. So look, inflation again is is an increase in prices, and we have had one year bad inflation, right? And it, how do, I, how do I define this as being a consumer-driven phenomenon? Let's talk about gasoline. Mm -hmm. We all got upset. Gasoline got really expensive, right? But see, as an economist, we think about supply and demand. If, if it was really just a supply effect, you know, because Putin invaded Ukraine, there wasn't enough oil, 
then what would happen is price would go up and the quantity of gas people was consuming would go down. Well, here's the crazy thing about it. Price of gas went from $3.50 a gallon to over $5 a gallon nationally. Do you know how much gasoline consumption went down? Not nationally. It no. didn't go down. <laughs> it didn't go down. It, I mean, it, I have a up. job, I, ha I need a gas. So well, but it's, gas. no, it's not it. No, that's, I'm sorry, a lot of driving out there, particularly when people are driving F-350 pickup trucks, you know, all over the place. If, you know, I just came back from Europe not too long ago. You know what they drive in Europe? Not F-350 pickup trucks. Not when gas is regularly $7 a gallon. Is it a little bubble? So, you know, it, again, we, we, we pretend, I mean, no one likes paying $100 to fill up your truck. Well, why do you have a truck? Now, for the people working construction, sure, but come on, look at all the pickup trucks out there. Are there that many people in construction? Really? Why, why would gas prices go up that much and consumption wouldn't go down? Again, it's a demand effect. Now, one of the problems with inflation is it is an inequality exaggerating situation. I'm saying in the aggregate, consumer demand is pushing prices. We know that there are people out there who are on fixed incomes are getting hurt by that. There's no doubt they are. We have to pay attention to those folks. There is winners and losers in this particular situation. But in the aggregate, this situation we're seeing around the ice is being caused by excessive consumer demand, clearly. Okay, well, yeah. Dr. Thornburg, uh, our city does appreciate your presentation tonight. We thank you very much. And uh, Councilman Figueroa, sorry. Thank you. It'll, it'll just, uh, one is just a facetious question, I guess, really. It's just, are you telling me that uh, in order to make home uh, housing more affordable, we should build more housing? Is that, I mean, <laughs> shocking, right? Yeah, I, well, I, if you want gas prices to go down, more oil helps, <laughs> and you know. Um, but you did, uh, you did mention uh, Texas. You compare Texas and California. What, what is it that California is just doing that it's just so different that it's, uh, uh, it's so well, much more difficult to build housing in California? It's our, so much more expensive. Our zoning is very restrictive. Um, we have permit fees are fairly high. Um, did I mention zoning? Zoning is really restrictive. Uh, but then, of course, we have a, a lot of uh, we have a lot of building codes and things like this on, on our construction here. Labor is more expensive here because of the housing shortage. But and of course, the permitting process takes forever and it's convoluted, and you can go through. You know, there's no one thing. And that's one, of, that's one of the things that's so strong about this. Everyone wants to find the magic bullet. Right. How do I solve this in one way? The answer is you can't. There's a lot of different ways to go about doing it. But here's what I know. I know when a city is committed to this mission, they can get it done. And I know that because I've seen it happen. I'm seeing it happen right now in Santa Rosa, post-fire. Uh, the city of Santa Rosa put an aggressive develop, redevelopment plan in. They have a lot of new housing in their downtown area. And I saw it in the city of Oakland when Jerry Brown came in. And he just, he said, look, we want housing. And when Jerry Brown was at the city of Oakland, in eight years they had 10,000 housing units. So cities can do it when they're committed. But you have to be committed. And you know, that's, that's where the rubber hits the road. So, so even regardless of the challenges that come from Sacramento, we as a city can still make a, a difference, an impact in, in some of these challenges you know, that come from Sacramento. The, the, the challenges are not coming from Sacramento. Where Most are these the challenges, challenges from? In, in building housing are local, locally driven, not Sacramento. Quite the opposite, Sacramento is trying to force the issue through the arena standards and everything else. I don't like how Sacramento is going about doing it because Sacramento wants to use the whip to, to train, you know, to train the cities. Oh, we're going to beat you into doing what you want. It's not how you do it. I've always said that the state should be providing positive incentives for cities who have aggressive development strategies. How about just giving them more of the state tax revenue? How about paying for the infrastructure investments that are needed? There's a lot of ways that they could go about doing what they do in ways that will create more housing without being so controversial. Thank you, sir. I would love to have you come back again because we, we certainly need this information, this education. Not, not only us up here as uh, policymakers, but the public certainly uh, should, should hear this as well. Uh, I appreciate it. Because that. I'm very interested in knowing what it is that we can do as a city to change so that we can start moving forward and, and making a big difference, especially with, you know, with jobs and housing. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Thurnberg. We appreciate you, thank you. Let's move on. Uh, we'll move on to item number five. This is fiscal year 2022-2023 first quarter report, and I will hand it over to our city manager. 
And I will promptly uh, hand it over to our <coughs> direct agency director for administrative services, Barbara Whitehorn. Barbara, the floor is yours. Good evening, Mayor and members of council. Oh, thank you. Oh, fantastic. Um, tonight, I will go over our first quarter report. Um, and I am Barbara Whitehorn, Agency Director of Administrative Services. And backing me up tonight is Zuiva Ruiz, our uh, Budget Division Manager, um, Corey Hodges with the City Manager's Office, and Cassandra Searcy with uh, Community Economic Development. Um, so, let's see. The overview, I'll go into financial performance, where we are ending the year for fiscal year 22. These are unaudited numbers and then our first quarter performance. Then we'll talk about meeting the needs of the community, customers, and the departments. Um, then strategic initiatives. So section one, financial performance. This is our unaudited fiscal year 22. Um, total general fund revenue, approximately 205 million, which is significantly higher than the initial budget and mid-year projections. So on the next slide, we're, we're exceeding the adopted budget by about 17% last year. Um, measure S was significantly higher than projected, about 18%. We anticipated about 42 million, and the actual receipts were 49.4 million. So that was very impressive for Measure S. Um, expenditures, I do want to point out that we were quite strategic, I believe, as a city, that we increased spending as we saw that revenues were increasing because we have been working to increase our customer service, improve services throughout the city, make investments throughout the city in capital projects, in tree trimming, in um, graffiti and all kinds of services, as you're aware, um, sidewalk cleaning, all these things. So we have revenues and expenditures. And when we say 204 million, that includes other funds, not just general fund. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke on that first slide. So revenue and expenditure in the general fund alone, not including internal service funds and the Measure S fund. Our revenue, 155.5 million, expenditures, 148 million. So we added approximately 7.5 million to fund balance. And this is a fund balance breakdown. Um, we estimate at the end of the fiscal year about 104.3 million in our uh, general fund balance. Of that non-spendable, which is like property, plant, and equipment, you know, things that you can't turn into cash, basically, of about 39.5 million, Committed 32.7, um, assigned 2.2 million, unassigned 22.3 million. Restricted is just a few thousand. So, first quarter revenue, and I apologize that this is um, difficult to see. Revenues through the first quarter are only about 11.32%, but that is to be expected. Even though we're at 25% through the fiscal year, we anticipate revenues being only, you know, 10 to 12% because of the way, in particular, that sales and use taxes and transaction and use tax, which is Measure S, are collected. We get those receipts two months after they're actually paid. Like if you pay that sales tax in July, we don't receive that until September. So we only have one month in these numbers of sales and use tax and measure S tax, which make up more than 50% of general fund revenue. So when we look at this and say we only have 11.32% of revenues, that's what we expect. We also don't receive most of our franchise taxes until later in the year, and a lot of our other taxes we just don't receive at this point. So when we're looking at this and we say, you know, these taxes come in two months, you know, in arrears, as it, as it were, these, I give these the green light, and I kind of use, like, cute little graphics so that we can say, you know, these are on track. These are absolutely on track with budget at this point, um, so we think we're fine. 
we have very few revenues that I would say like yellow light. Um, that's like parking citations are a little behind, so we're watching those. Um, other revenues that we just keep an eye on are franchise taxes, property taxes in lieu of vehicle license fees, but those are received later in the year. So it isn't that we anticipate those not coming in on budget. We do. We just don't receive those until later in the year. And then with the limited information that we have available at this point, um, we do believe most revenue streams appear to be on, on track. So first quarter expenditures, now these are high. They're almost 36%, 35.4. Um, that is because the city pays its annual CalPERS for our um, unfunded liability to um, the retirement system for our pension plan, we pay that upfront every July rather than paying it out over the year. And that saves us about a million and a half dollars to pay it in July. But what that does is it skews the expenditures and makes it look like we're spending a whole ton of money in the first part of the year. And the reality is that we're not. Um, but it does make it appear that way. So it looks like we have hardly any revenue and a whole bunch of expenditures, but the reality is that's not actually the case. And these are the general fund departments. And then the second, the next slide are the, the departments that are in other funds, which are information technology and fleet services, which are internal service funds, and then animal services, which has its own fund. And then department budget performance. The police department appears to be over budget, but it is totally not. It is actually on budget. Uh, I know I do little animations. <laughs> um, so they show at 45% of budget, but that's because their liability from CalPERS is 100% paid out of their budget. And the miscellaneous plan, which is kind of everybody except public safety, is spread across all of those budgets. Like it's, it's in finance, it's in public works, it's in all of those other departments. So you see all of public safety hit police in July. So they have this massive hit, whereas the other departments have like much smaller pieces to hit their budget in July. So police has this big hit and it looks like their budget is terrible. It's not, they're in good shape. So on track are almost every other department. Oh well, almost all the departments are on track anyway. So moving on, and this is where we're gonna talk about the department needs, um, where we think we need to invest this first quarter. And these, making these recommendations, these came from multiple meetings with departments and the and the budget group and really discussing where we had the most critical needs and where we could make the biggest impact um, with investments. So with each department and division that we're gonna talk about, we'll talk a little about recent accomplishments and then where we think we need to invest. So in, in uh, building and safety, in community housing and economic development, they issued a record of 1,953 building permits with a construction valuation of 61.3 million as compared to 1,161 with a construction valuation of 44.8 million for the same period last fiscal year. And that's an increase of 68% year over year, which is really kind of crazy. And also recently, they established partnerships for two state-funded home key projects um, with Lutheran Social Services and San Bernardino Valley College. Um, so CED has really been working hard and accomplishing quite a bit. Um, now, what we're recommending for investments in their department, in code enforcement, they are lacking some essential equipment, including um, handheld radios, the field radios that they need. Um, and those are horrendously expensive, unfortunately. And we need about $80,000, which is a one-time investment for those. And then about $20,000 for overtime, which is for the increased demand for their call-outs after hours. Um, we're using a lot 
more code enforcement for them to come and you know deal with things after hours and address issues after hours. We don't know that that overtime would be ongoing. That would be something we would address quarterly and really evaluate, you know, is this something that's, that's going to be an ongoing need. In the planning division, they have a significantly increased workload due to the permit applications, plan review requests, and development applications. Um, they are having difficulty recruiting and they have limited staff. We are recommending an additional planner, a senior planner, and one assistant planner. The cost for the remainder of this fiscal year is about 125,000. And we're uh, uh, also recommending consultant services to assist the division to catch up with their plan review and allow staff to focus on time sensitive projects and give them some time to recruit because recruiting, as you know, you know, can take um, two to three months. And that um, is a one-time cost for the consultant of 95,000 in this year. The real property division um, is asking for software to help track um, property assets and leases and some training and credentialing. Um, the property and leasing software would be covered half by the general fund and half by CDBG funds, um, $9,000 each. And the training is $2,620. And they're also asking for architectural services um, for, that would be funded with CDBG, and that's to do with the housing project that we'll talk about a little later in strategic initiatives. Economic development. Um, additional staff are also needed to, to help there. Um, they're looking for an economic development specialist and they would like to contract with a marketing firm. Um, both of these are ongoing costs. This fiscal year, 56,000, 56.7 for the economic development specialist and the marketing, 45,000. And that's it for CED. Moving on to animal services. Um, they have really done a lot in the, in the first quarter. 1,400 animals, adopted 638 into homes. I mean, I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you, but they have been doing a lot of work. They still have a save rate um, of over 90%. Um, they are looking for the same kind of radios that code enforcement also uses, so everybody's using the same radios and can all talk. And they need, as you know, they took over all their dispatch, their own dispatch from the police department. And they need a console and the field radios, which is a one-time cost of $100,000. So moving on to the city clerk's office. Um, they recently, they have processed over um, 370, I guess 370 public records requests. And they've begun a citywide records management project. Um, they are looking for additional staff training and to reclass a part-time customer service position to full-time so they can expand the hours of the passport office, hopefully starting in February. Um, the reclass would be covered this year with salary savings um, and the training um, and the, the annual conference is $1,950. Um, finance, um, we received both the budget and uh, annual comprehensive financial report awards and our grants administration manual is under, uh, in draft form and under review. Um, and we also recently received notice with IT that um, we were awarded a technical assistant grant, assistance grant, I know y'all got that news. Um, and what we are requesting is only to extend a grants contract that we have with the, the Rennie, I don't, actually don't know how to pronounce the name, but anyway, our PPG group, um, and that's a one-time cost of 46000 They have been helping us really get the, the grants um, manual and everything sort of off the ground and, and work with the grants team in finance. Information technology, um, they've worked on DocuSign, they installed new firewall, and they transitioned the police department from one gigabyte to 10 gigabytes internet speed capacity, woo. 
Um, they're requesting um, 250,000 to complete the upgrade of all workstations and um, they wanna upgrade the police crime view system data tool. Um, these are one-time costs of a total of $280,000. And then library, they have also done amazing work. They had 1,132 participants in the summer reading program. Uh, they have I mean, they've done a tremendous amount, and I don't wanna like read everything to you because I know that tonight's gonna be a long night. But what they are requesting at a cost for this year of 35,000 is an additional library technician. Parks and Recreation, you know what they're doing. We, we, we've seen this, we know all the amazing things that have been happening under Liddy. Um, all they are requesting right now, um, we'll be bringing things back at mid-year, but is additional um, printer equipment for the military banner program at $7,000, and I have no doubt that that will be ongoing because that program is um, really taking off. The police department, um, they have recently been awarded and accepted over a million dollars in grant and contract awards. They've hired six police officers, seven professional staff, including 10 law enforcement trainees. Um, they are requesting an automated evidence inventory database for a one-time cost of 130,000. And they're requesting um, several positions that are support positions, civilian support positions, that would enable the police department to take patrol um, sworn officers out of doing support work and put them back on the street and really in positions that we need them. And these support positions are four community service officers, one accounting technician, three records technicians, one senior office assistant, one crime analyst, and one police dispatcher. And the cost for the remainder of this fiscal year would be approximately $395,000. Public Works Operations and Maintenance. Um, they have really been working hard. As you know, they've responded to quite a few um, storm-related customer service requests. The storm made huge messes. Um, they removed 1,666 cubic yards of debris. Um, 183 storm response related requests. Um, they have, uh, I mean, removed 96 dead or decaying trees. That's like a lot of, a lot of stuff. And I think the, the workload is pretty tremendous. They are requesting a deputy director of operations. And I know I went into more detail on this in the staff report itself, but the majority of public works staff, I think over 70% is in the operations and maintenance division um, and the the city engineers over engineering and that's the one deputy director they have and then there isn't anyone at that level over operations and maintenance which is the majority of the staff and so there's kind of an imbalance of the workload there and that's why they're requesting that position um, they're also asking for an internal process auditors to help them plan for improvements to enhance workflows, efficiency, and customer service. Um, the tree rental, I mean, obviously we did that. Um, additional positions for cleanup maintenance team, four additional maintenance workers, one lead maintenance worker, and one maintenance supervisor. Um, these are all positions I think that are fairly critical for service to the community. Um, the deputy director to sort of coordinate all of the work that happens in operations and maintenance. The cleanup and maintenance team is really necessary to continue critical services. Um, and all of those amounts are covered there. So in total, the, the quarter one budget amendments that have for the departments uh, that have been brought to you are um, $2,088,110 in this fiscal year. Of that, equipment and services, which are one time, $1,080,570, and personnel is $1,007,540. And next we'll talk the strategic initiatives. 
First is the investment playbook, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Corey. Let me turn this off. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, over the last year, the city's been working with New Localism Associates and the Aspen Institute to develop an investment playbook for the city. Um, think about the investment playbook as a tool designed to help the city prioritize transformative investments in the community and then match them to local, federal, state, private, philanthropic opportunities. There's been a recent influx in federal funding from all of the bills that have been passed in Congress and it's created opportunities for cities to draw down these funds and spend them on these transformative investments. But the thing about it is it's very complex, it's competitive, there's lots of deadlines, reporting requirements, it comes in block grants, tax incentives, formula grants, competitive grants, which brings us to the need to have a centralized location and center to coordinate all the activities. Um, the, uh, the Nerve Center would serve as kind of a, a a project management team focused on the playbook, focused on delivering on the projects, taking projects from inception all the way to it starting to be in construction. Um, we think that the, the, the nerve center would align all of the efforts of all the nonprofits, the city, the county, the state, private investors, developers, and a lot of the community organizations and individuals who brought projects to the playbook. They would also help raise funds from grants, from philanthropy, from donations. They would coordinate between all the teams on the various projects and help them deliver. Um, they would help with monitoring, with reporting, with bringing everything together to help some of these projects come to fruition. Um, we have the playbook on a website. I think it's sbinvestmentplaybook.com for all of the community members and stakeholders to go and look at it and give us feedback. Um, we think it's a roadmap to a really transformative downtown corridor area and larger San Bernardino. There's a lot of exciting projects in there. Um, and a lot of them we think would be wonderful for the community. But I think the main thing is investing in the nerve center. That's really the engine of this playbook, is to have people that are waking up every day, focused on the playbook, focused on the project. What is the next step to get it done? What grants are dropping from the federal st or state government? Where are the philanthropic opportunities? Piecing it all together, working with the people that came up with the projects, and then delivering it. And I'm happy to take some questions on that. So for the investment playbook and nerve center, staff is recommending dedicating Measure S funds, um, $1 million annually. Um, obviously this is the first year and the amendment this year is just a million dollars. Um, potentially a million dollars annually for three years. Um, and as the playbook is completed and the nerve center becomes self-sustaining, less funding would be required. The next strategic initiative is the homeless initiative and the navigation center. And for this one, I'm going to turn it over to Cassandra Searcy. Thank you, Mayor and Honorable Council Members. So I'm sure you're aware our city has approximately 40% of our county's homeless right here in the city of San Bernardino. And as a result, we have established a plan to move forward to not only help our homeless community, but in a sense to also restore a sense of balance to our city. And that will include partnership with two local entities on home key projects, the first being Lutheran Social Services. Uh, the city and Lutheran Social Services will develop a total of 170 shelter bed units which will provide on-site support services and in a sense act as a navigational center. The city is looking to contribute $5 million for this cause. This campus in a sense will have not only interim housing that is non-congregate, low barrier, um, again on-site support services for mental health, for substance abuse, workforce training development, but will also have an on-site medical clinic that is an FQHC, which means a federally qualified healthcare center. The second home key project will be with San Bernardino Valley College, in which we're looking to utilize at a minimum 60 non-congregate student dormitories, which will again provide on-site support services. And the students that will be targeted for this um, particular housing will include those that are a part of the Tay community, meaning those that have graduated from, um, or who have been um, 
advanced out of an adoptive care system and also those that uh, have either some type of mental or physical health disability. Uh, primarily all will be low income and the main uh, crux to this is that they're all homeless and coming into these dormitories they would be stabilized and no longer homeless. And then when the city is also looking to develop a navigation center, um, this will comprise of 200 uh, non-congregate low barrier shelter beds in total. Um, it will also have on-site support services and it will serve the demographics of both homeless men, women, and families. On-site support services will include workforce training development. It will include mental health services, substance abuse counseling, and when I say low barrier, it will definitely remove a lot of um, um, impediments that would normally keep a person from coming into a facility. So therefore, in individuals who have animals, they're welcomed, families can stay together, and most importantly, it provides a safe place where people will have dignity and then have connections to services to help them stabilize. Uh, the city is also looking to establish its own homeless engagement team. At this point, the city has excellent uh, service providers, but all are either at or near full capacity. And so if an individual did want to come in from the streets into a shelter, there's no place for them. Um, we need a dedicated team that can go out to various locations, homeless encampments, who can provide one-on-one -on -one services and assessments, connect people to the homeless um, to the uh, homeless management information system, which is now called Clarity. This is a must in order to access county services, funding, housing, programs. And uh, the city can do this by issuing an RFP uh, with ARPA funds so that we can look for not only a lead operator, a developer for the three programs that I just mentioned, but also provide that homeless engagement that we desperately need, which would also include um, the expansion of mobile showers. And then finally, the city is looking to assist occupants and tenants uh, located at 340 West 4th Street with funding to assist with their relocation so that they can exit out of an unstable, unhealthy living situation and use the funds to um, relocate to housing of their choice. And in total, this uh, uh, in total, this amount altogether comes to approximately $20,150,000 in ARPA funds to assist our city and to assist our residents. And I'm available if you have questions. I do. <laughs> Council Member Ibarra. Ms. Cassandra, I love the work you're doing so far. But I do want to ask further information. For the Project Home Key, um, what exactly is that Project Home Key? You mentioned that there may, um, like Lutheran Social Services is having 175 units built, or? So um, there will be a total of 175 uh, non-congregate living units. And uh, if you're talking about the capacity of these units, um, they're pretty much set up so that they, they serve as an efficiency unit, where you have your bed, you have your um, desk, your storage, um, your Shower. own personal space. No, the showers are, are communal, as well as the dining areas being communal. Because what you don't want is to put yourself in a situation where maybe someone can start a fire or cause right. a flood, things of that nature. And also you want individuals to not go into uh, their own unit and become a hermit, but they need to engage and get connected with the social services that are on site. Okay, so on, on this though, the individuals who will be serviced, they'll be there throughout the whole period, they're not going to be, my, my concern is just people who, you know, don't follow rules and get, like I've mentioned in several emails to you, um, that we have those programs that come help the, the unhoused, and the moment that um, they break a rule from their rehab center, they send them out to the streets. Is that going to, that's not going to happen with here? So um, with Home Key, they, you must comply with housing first. And so with the understanding of housing first, um, the lead operator is not going to place any type of barrier restriction on individuals who may fail to comply with all the rules and regulations. Yes, there are rules and procedures that must be followed, but in the same sense, Housing First grants a lot of grace to individuals who may make a mistake from time to time, 
But the bottom line is as long as there's a willingness because everyone who participates, they have to, they have to volunteer, they have to want to be there. And so no, no one is quick to be ejected from the program as long as that person wants to be there and participate in their own individualized, um, it's a client-centered approach. So that person has to agree to participate in their own particular service plan. Okay, and are we also partnering with Mary's Mercy by any chance? We're providing funding to Mary's Mercy but not for home key projects. Okay, thank you. Thank you, so next. So in all, we have the various departmental needs that we discussed for about two million this fiscal year. Um, CDBG requests of 59,000. The 50,000, I believe, is for the Navigation Center architect. Is that correct? Okay, making sure. Um, and then the investment playbook and nerve center with measure S for a million dollars and the homeless initiatives with ARPA funding for 20 million 150,000. Um, and I wanted to be clear that there's 23 positions which carries an ongoing cost of about $2 million to the general fund. Um, and those are detailed there. So that ends the presentation and discussion. If you okay, have thank you. Uh, Ms. Whitehorn, can you um, roll back to the last um, slide, please? Um, I want to commend staff for their great work. Um, that slide. I, I want to react to a couple of these items here. Um, I can support the two point uh, million dollars for general fund money, money for departmental needs. I'll get into some of my, my concerns. Um, I see the housing and real estate, I get that. Um, and the homeless initiatives I fully support. I think uh, the 21, the 20.1 million dollars, we're gonna need the 12 million for the navigation for sure. Uh, and I think at the homeless workshop, we have already kind of uh, punted towards that. My apprehension is, uh, is there's not enough information on the investment playbook, Nerve Center. I'd like, I'm not saying I'm, I'm agnostic right now. The 1 million dollars is a large number for um, so maybe Corey, um, I, can you come back up and, and explain and help us understand who's the money going to, is there a selected person here or a nonprofit that you're working with? Tell us about the expenditure request. For sure. Um, the expenditure request for the investment playbook, it's $300,000 for consultants, um, mainly New Localism who helped us develop the playbook and then the Aspen Institute and then $700,000 for staffing for operations, office space. Um, we, we think that we're gonna need maybe four to seven individuals to staff the nerve center, um, including a director, somebody that has the ability to convene people regionally on projects, help remove roadblocks, things like that. Um, and then we're gonna be working with a fiscal agent. We're, we think that the fiscal agent might be a local community foundation, the Inland Empire Community Foundation, we haven't identified a nerve center operator or someone that would lead the, the nerve center. We're going to go through the proper procurement process. Has there been, uh, so, so there's no selected individual, correct? No, no individuals have been selected for either, um, for, for the fiscal agent or for the nerve center operators. Both of those would have to go through a process with the city. Is, is there a better budget? Because I know it was a one pager and I know it's, we're going down the, the deep dive here, but the $1 million breakdown, is there a more specific there, plan? There isn't. This is just allocating budget to say, here's the budget that we could potentially use. And then what we would do is do a request for proposal for those services um, for the 700,000. The 300,000 is for Aspen Institute and New Localism. So we already have those. Where's New Localism those based out of? Place. They're out of Philadelphia, yes? Yeah, Drexel, which is in Philadelphia. Yeah, um, and so they are already in place. They're they've they're working on the investment playbook. That's that's Bruce Katz, the yeah. guy who was really the moving force behind the entire uh, investment playbook development. Okay, all right. Now let's go back into the various departmental needs. 
Um, I want to advocate and say thank you. I, every department is important, so don't take this personal city staff, city employees. But I want to highlight my good friends at the Public Works Department because I just think we need more boots on the ground. So let's pick it apart here. Um, the second bullet point, the contract for internal process, blah, 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 is what I'm going to say. It's my last meeting, so I can say that. Um, it's efficiency and customer service. Okay, I get that, but that's a one-time cost of $250,000. What I'd like to suggest is that we add more maintenance workers um, and bump that up. We have a significant need in our community I think the council has identified multiple priorities to roll out services on the streets, and those are our boots on the street. So I'd like to recommend that we bump it up to eight maintenance workers instead of the four. That'll be an additional cost of $44,000 roughly. If you use the budget that you've um, suggested, Ms. Whitehorn, is 177000 for four. Uh, you want to scroll up a little bit? Scroll, like, towards me. Yeah. Down. Keep going, keep going, keep going. It's the spreadsheet that you, you've, yeah, sorry. So the spreadsheet suggests on the line item for maintenance operations, it's $177,000. If you do the math, keep going, uh, there it is. Maintenance workers, 177. You do that roughly divided by four, it's about $44,000 a worker. Right, for the rest of the fiscal year. Correct. Yep. And so it's if we add two more, it's about eighty. Eight thousand. If we had four more, it's about another one hundred seventy-seven. Right. My position has been the two hundred fifty thousand dollars that we're using for some contract consultant to tell us that we have inefficiencies. Okay, that's probably because there's lack of operation. So I either need clarity on two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Who is that consultant? Maybe Mr. Hernandez could come to the podium and ask and answer that question. Who is this two hundred fifty thousand dollars going to for a one-time consultant? Why do we need that? And why can't we not? use that 250 to buttress up our boots on the street. Uh, yes, good evening. So there is no identified consultant. Uh, once we actually get the money allocated, we would re re release our, a request for proposal. So there's just a lot of uh, processes that we have due to staff turnover, um, a lack of um, institutional knowledge that no, no longer exists in the city. We have quite a few processes that are broken. And one in particular, which is a big project that we're pushing, is the one-stop shop. So we, the count, thank you to the council for allocating funds for the design. But in speaking to the, our, my fellow director uh, Nathan Freeman, we're, we're talking about we really need to evaluate that process because co-locating us into one room and being able to provide those services, we need to communicate in terms of relative to our processes. So uh, with the current staffing level, there's really no one. Um, dedicator that can actually do that analysis because of the fact that they're doing other work. So our goal is we're going to release a, an RFP for these services to look at where we can improve. Um, just similar to the um, community and economic development, we're seeing record numbers as well in terms of the amount of permits that we, we process as well. So, so Mr. Hernandez, the bottom line, the $250,000 is more for the process in front of the curtain for the one-stop shop. That, that's one element, but there's also multiple uh, in terms of just our permit process over, overall, in terms of our encroachment permits. Uh, that's just one element of it. Okay. All right. So the 250, back to the 250, that's not helping inefficiencies behind the curtain to identify where more potholes need to be filled or where more street signs need to be replaced. This is fo solely focused on the uh, engineering side of the house. Say again? This is uh, solely focused on the engineering side of the house. Engineering side yes. of the house, the $250,000. Mm -hmm. And while it's needed, I support that. I want to see if this council is ready to hire some more maintenance workers. These maintenance workers, maintenance, maintenance workers, that's what I want to see out on the streets. We need to support them, employ more, get them out. Now, in HR labor kind of conversations, the identity is that we identify more positions it doesn't mean we have to fill them it just means we have the budget up too and that um the director of public works has that authority to hire up to those eight or six or whatever the council decides 
Yes. If I may, it, since it's specific to this, we, we have recently tasked Public Works with cleaning up encampments. Would it be these positions that are tasked with that? Is it the cleanup maintenance team? Is that what? So then I would definitely support oh, yeah. that because we need, you know, when I submit a uh, go request uh, for, for a cleanup, it, there's, there's some time that goes by before it actually, they're actually able to get out there and clean it up. So I would fully support having more uh, maintenance cleanup crews out there. So, so yeah. this, this will be in direct support of that. Okay. This direct support of it. If we add these four maintenance workers, that, that will support and augment the homeless encampment patrols. That is, that is correct. And if we add more, it'll be quicker and faster. Councilmember Calvin on this item. Thank you, um, Mr. Hernandez, appreciate you. So Mr. Hernandez, I wanted to go back to the consultant that we're talking about. So are you saying that the department on the engineering side that you just need to revamp? Is that what you're saying? It sounds like that to me. Yeah, there's uh, obviously some processes that are uh, a little uh, uh, antiquated. We have a lot of older systems. Um, we, there's definitely opportunity to, uh, to grow and to improve our processes. Uh, so and, and thank you for that. I believe in updating our processes. But $250,000 appears to be, that's a lot of money. What is it that then, um, uh, as, as director, right, that you are providing or operating? How are you, what are you contributing to um, revamping the department? So we are looking at our, um, so as a, as a whole, I mean, we, we look at performance management. We look at uh, our budget management. We look at our staff report management. We have special projects. So my role as a director, I, I don't necessarily get involved in the, the nitty gritty of each detail. That's why we have our, our professional staff who does those evaluations. But um, with my team of the management analysts, we're actually looking at our success rate in terms of our staff reports, um, our, our budgets. So we, um, we're focusing our efforts in being able to perform at a higher level. Because on, on, the reality is our department has gone through uh, a, a lot of turnover, and as a result, you know, we have less experienced staff that require a lot more um, dedicated uh, time from some of our senior level staff. So I think these opportunities just help us focus our efforts into improving these processes. So couldn't that 250000 uh, be used for just internal training for our for the department uh, that's that's possible to reallocate those funding so that that number um, obviously it's it's not to an exceed amount uh, once we release our, our RFP we'll look at what the actual cost of these um, evaluations will be um, we also um, we also in, uh, at the last council meeting approved 24 engineering firms uh, to provide additional services so part of the staff augmentation in terms of the, helping with that process of evaluating these, uh, um, these processes will, will, will assist in that. Okay, thank you. Ms. Calvin, thank you for that. I'm, I'm gonna finish my line and then we'll go to Councilman here. Um, Mr. Hernandez, I think we're close. I mean, I think it's just semantics here. Um, we have identified one of the priorities was the one-stop shop. Back to the one-stop shop, I'm fully supportive of one-stop shop. I get the concept. Mr. Murray, you've been instrumental in Riverside's one-stop shop. That's why I think you're here. As one of the elements of your hire is to create a robust economic engine in our permitting. So my question is, it is community development, but it's all working in tandem together, right? Because we're gonna have multiple kiosks there all at our nerve center to get more permits out the door. That's correct. So is this $250, just yes or no, is it $250 a consultant or is it a consultant to push through that one-stop shop and help you? Because tell us that you need the help. And that's okay. Raise your hand. That's what you're doing. If that's the case, then we want to support the one-stop shop. So that's one element of it. There's multiple process. So engineer pro engineering processes, uh, multiple permits across multiple disciplines. Right, whether it be in land development, right, right. whether it be on the right of way. So we process, so the one-stop shop is just one element of it. So it's not one, one contract or one firm that we're after. We're, we're, we're seeking to improve multiple processes. Okay, fair enough. I'm gonna, I, I, I trust question. that you're, you're um, yeah, I got a you'll manage too. that. I have a follow-up question. Uh, follow hold on, up. just a moment, I, I'm, I'm hearing you. Um, let me. Go back to those maintenance workers. We need to add some more. I'm gonna propose that we add four more maintenance workers to help our operations and safety. 
this is a, a community issue, so that's my request. Ms. Whitehorn, you had a question or, or comment? I just wanted to say, and I, I think Daniel would agree with this, if you add four more maintenance workers, you need to add a lead maintenance worker and a maintenance supervisor, um, because that's the whole team. Am I correct in that, Daniel? Yeah. So the yeah. Uh, positions that were shown for the cleanup crew, that will be basically one unit. Got it. And you need one manager and a lieutenant. Right, yeah, it's like the, the, okay. the three listed at the bottom, the maintenance workers, a lead, and a supervisor. Great, That's let's like do unit. it. I mean, we, yeah. need, we need this. These are boots on the street for our Yeah, I'm not suggesting operations. we shouldn't. I'm just saying let's look I at understand. it as a, as a unit. As a unit, very good. Thank you for that mm -hmm. clarification. Um, we will never get anywhere, folks, if we don't have operations boots on the street. Okay, uh, Councilman Alexander, sir. Thank you. So. I just want to make sure this is six people for this maintenance cleanup team, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm just want to make sure. So your number of eight doesn't work. So, uh, so then we need to add six more, not eight. Okay, six would okay. be my request. All right. Um, and back to you. I'm sorry I can't see you, uh, Director, but that's okay. You, you can hear my voice. I'm, I'm yes, still I having issues with this two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. It's it's not sitting well with me because we. You're the director, and all the directors are directors. And if you have any issues with planning, development, enhancing workflow efficiency, that should come from your office and not, the, not some outside consultant. And so in that, and that's where I'm having a, a, a little problem. I understand about the one-stop shop and getting a little uh, um, a consultant to assist you with that, but all other issues should come from your office because you're the number one person in charge of that office. I, I don't, I don't see that, and you're gonna need to help me out with that one time, uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So, citywide consultants are used because of just different specialties of focus. I mean, we have a consultant for our new ERP system. Right. Uh, we just talked about consultants throughout. So I, I can assure you that I'm. From a, as a director position, I'm really engaged with my department. I so, meet with my I meet with my department regularly. So I, unfortunately, just the volume of work. We are a large organization. We have over a hundred plus employees. So for a, an expectation for a de director to be solely focused on one operation, it's just unrealistic. You have a deputy director of engineering sitting in front of me, right? That's, that's correct. Okay, and is there a such title as a Deputy Director of Administration? In what, in what department? Your department. Uh, no, there isn't. I've, I've heard of this title before, this agency, this, this City of San Bernardino had one before, Deputy Director of Administration. So look into that, that might uh, help you out in the future of a, a person that handles your administration side of the house. But, um, if you have a deputy director of engineering, why would you need to go outside to hire a consultant when you have a deputy director of engineering? And again, it also becomes down to the workload. I have our deputy director of engineering serving as a project manager because it's just the volume of work. There's, we have $50 million plus of capital improvement. Okay. So uh, it's, I just, I, I want to make it clear to the council, staff is working very diligently. And so, and that, that includes myself and our deputy director. So I don't want to lose sight of the fact that since we're trying to bring resources or additional support to the, the staff, it's that we're not doing anything. We are, we're, we're doing quite a bit. Did you guys ever hire those two, uh, the council gave you directives to hire two additional graffiti workers. Did that ever occur? So we've had um, pluses and minuses. We have quite a, few tur quite a bit of turnover. And the other challenge that we're having is the lack of vehicles. Uh, so we're having to double up. Um, so. Uh, adding the resources are great, but also in terms of just being able to put them in, in units, uh, the equipment, there's, it's just not as simple as adding the bodies, which I can really appreciate. So thank you very much. I, for I thinking, appreciate for that, and, but the question was, did you guys ever hire those two which the council said you can do because you changed the council's order from getting a, a vendor to hiring employees? So did you guys ever hire those two employees? So I don't, I can't answer that uh, that question definitively, but there is no vacancies uh, in the, uh, currently that are being recruited for the graffiti uh, staff members. So I cannot tell you definitively if we hired those two, but there is no open vacancy for a, a graffiti maintenance worker. Thank you. 
I can. Go ahead. Oh, you want to go first? I wanted to ask first. Um, so I, I, I hear what my colleagues are saying about the 250,000, but my other question for you, Mr. Hernandez, is the um, Deputy Director of Operations. What is, the, what is the role for that director, and then how does that compare to the consultants you want to hire at 250,000? So those are two completely separate, uh, completely two separate items. Like I mentioned, the 250 is focused on engineering. So currently, uh, in the way we're um, lined, and we'll just take the engineering because we do have a deputy director. We have four managers who report to the deputy director. And in operations, we have two managers who report to the director, right? So by adding that additional labor, layer, layer or level, it provides a lot more support directed just at an administrative level for the, those two divisions that really do need additional support because at, at our level, we're splitting that, those responsibilities. Okay, and, and earlier you did mention um, that, that we do need, the, we obviously need more staffing. Um, I'm, I'm on board with getting um, the four additional maintenance workers, the lead maintenance worker and maintenance supervisor. Um, you're very aware of all my emails that I send with all the com uh, concerns that from our residents of how our city looks and how they don't feel safe um, with the um, activity going on outside their homes. And unfortunately, that's falling under your purview now um, with the encampments, for example. Um, I, I would like to see a, a faster turnaround with helping our city stay clean and safe for everybody who lives and works here. Because um, right now, um, it's going really slow. And if you, if you hire people from, from the top layer, they're not actually boots on the ground. They're not out there in the community. The same I've, I've uh, mentioned to Cassandra, for example, uh, for her outreach team, it'd be nice for them to pair up with Public Works when they go to the encampments and try to offer those services to, to, the, to our unhoused population. Um, I don't know if that's in the works already, um, but it'd be nice that both of you work together when, when the Public Works team goes out to the encampments that we also take the outreach um, staff member or staff members that Ms. Cassandra has in her department. So we can address both issues at the same time, clean up the area and at the same time provide services to the individuals we make contact with on a daily basis. Um, so I, I'm, I've always been an advocate for more boots on the ground versus top heavy in our city. But Okay, we're, I sense that we're getting a thumbs up All on right. six new operations managers. Councilman Sanchez. Yes, uh, we'll be here forever if we don't start to break this down and start taking votes. Um, so this council has gotten really good at having to take on a staff report that really is obligating us to make a decision on 20 different things. So if it is okay with the council, I would like to start breaking these things down and starting to vote on them individually going down. So the first, the first one I will tackle is the six additional um, public works staffers. So we keep on talking about the boots on the ground, boots on the ground. Well, that's a military reference. And in the United States military, there are 45 support staff for every infantry, uh, infantry soldier that is out there on the front lines. So that requires some sort of support system. We can go ahead and send our people out there. They're going to go and drink a beer and sit in their trucks. We need those supervisors. Um, so I, I very much support that we have those supervisors and that support staff in place to make sure that the, the boots on the ground, our infantry soldiers, are, are, are working at efficient levels. Okay, um, great. Next so thing, is that your motion? I, I beg to differ. I have to, I have to step in on that one. Well, he was an infantry soldier Because I well. was in the infantry in Vietnam, and I know that there were 11 people in the rear area supporting me but they weren't all supervisors. They were cooks, there were clerks, there were truck drivers, there were those. So I don't know where you got your numbers of the 45. Those are, those are now. They may be Those new, were Vietnam. Oh, they're, those, yeah, they're, now they're 45. They're, um, then there's, again, I, I, I'm having a real hard time with this coming from the private sector because I've got my private sector running, uh, uh, if I was running a company of 100 employees or if I was running a, a, a company of 50 employees or a company of 500 employees. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I had to on that case. And, and I'm, I will hire people to come in and work for me and, and I'm gonna be the CEO running the thing and, and meeting with 
I'll be meeting with consultants perhaps or but I'm I'm going to be talking about the efficiencies of my operation and if I get more sales I'm going to get more people um, we tend to get more managers and we get more uh, uh, more, more top heavy every time I uh, I'm I'd probably be chastised for saying it but government is top heavy we are and we need and that's just a, a boots on the ground is something we need people out there painting out graffiti and it doesn't it, you don't need to be a genius in um, efficiencies to know that you put two people in a truck and they come in at eight o'clock in the morning and they don't come back until five o'clock in the afternoon and they've stopped for a half an hour for lunch and a 10 minute break in the morning and 10 minute break in the afternoon and they paint graffiti all day. That's efficiency. And if they're, and, and they've got a, uh, uh, they, they, they need to, uh, there's a, uh, obviously they can only do so much in a day and one wall is going to take more today than it took yesterday because there's not as much. I mean, this efficiency stuff, we hire people to that should be able to direct the efficiencies and should be able to direct and build plans and teams to get the job done. That, those are my comments. So okay. I, I have some problems with a lot of Shall things I? that's been said. Hold on, Let, uh, Mr. Charette, yeah. let's, let's go with, uh, there's a motion to add six new maintenance let's operations Let's tackle that workers. one. I think that's everywhere we're uh, on all board. Are, is there any objections from council members on that direction? Okay, Boom, that's seeing done. none, Next hearing one. none, move on. Uh, on the consultants, um, there are a tremendous amount of intricacies that are involved in public works. And we have an individual here who has, has attended some of the best universities in the country studying this type of management, has now spent at least 10 months working in the public, uh, public works department as a director, eight to 10 hours a day. And we're being told by, he's being told by people who kind of have a very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A very, um, a very shallow understanding of the operation. He's asking for this because he, he can almost see the inefficiencies, but the answers are not clear enough. Just like we're gonna be hiring a nerve center or we're gonna be, we're gonna be implementing a, a playbook, we're gonna be spending $800,000 on consultants to tell us how to better run the city and how to better develop it. I think that our director in public works sees the need and the opportunity to create more efficiency, create a better product through, through the services they'd render through the department, and he's asking for this money. I am willing, and I am a little suspicious, but I am willing to give it the effort to allow him to spend that money. I do want follow-up. I do want him to come back and say, hey, look, this has been proved, this has been proved. This, I come from the construction industry, the, the earth moving industry, and they now include software in every single machine that shows every last metric from teeth on a bucket on an excavator to the way the operator runs the machine and at the end of a month, at the end of a project, of a project owners uh, or these, these developers save tens of thousands of dollars in fuel, um, salaries and everything. So there are intricacies in this and I wanna give them the opportunity to find the, um, the deficiencies and resolve those through a consultant. So I would make a motion that we approve the 250 for the consultant. That would be my motion. Okay. Um, is there any objections to that? I think we're okay with that. I do. I, do. I, do. I object. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and it's... Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, Director Hernandez, what it, is that, what it is that I'm looking for is that, so the $250,000 for this consultant, how long is the consultant going to be... Report here in the city and what is the what I'm, I'm just looking for more outcomes and I'm, I would like to see what I would really like to see is that this two hundred and fifty thousand dollars was going towards training the people that you have to be efficient to be what you exactly what you need because what I'm afraid of is that then the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the consultant is it's going to come back and give us a report where we're going to still end up having to pay for additional training or um, software or uh, whatever it is that we need to update to revamp the department, which um, I want to do that part, right, to in, improve and streamline our processes, 
but does that, but does it, what does the $250,000 actually uh, give us? <laughs> So for, we'll take the one-stop shop because I think that's a little more concrete because we've been working on it. We already have a proposal for the, de uh, for the design. Uh, we're, we're working uh, to select that, that firm. As part of the process of, of the process improvement, we're estimating anywhere from two to three months for that specific task. So of, of course, once it's, once it's awarded. And so the, once we have the design, does the design then, are we, are we, we still then have to design the project, complete the project, right? So the one stop. That, the, that, there still needs to be improvements that are going to go along with the design that is furnished to us with the $250,000. So the, the, the design is part of the, what was budgeted by the council previously. The design and the construction is what's For a million dollars, yes. right. Over a million dollars. So this two fifty dollars is for the consultant to, to do the evaluation of our current uh, workflow process, our current, uh, for us to be able, because the, the, the truth is that we're disjointed with, with the volume of, uh, of permits that we have and the antiquated softwares, there's just a lack of communication and a lack of, uh, a process that we can improve on. And that's really what we're after. Did if you can, okay, then why well, don't you, then why don't you invest? Mr. Mr. Hernandez, that's vulnerable and we thank you for that. And the council needs to hear that. So. Uh, Mr. Alexander, then, then I'm, I'm again. I'm always investing in people. That's where I came right. from. We always invest in our people. So why don't you take half of this and do your request for a proposal, and take the other half and invest in our people, train our people to be better and more efficient? Well, why can't that be an outcome? If we want to have a compromise, let's compromise there. Is that not like an option? If the, if that's the council's desire, then. No, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a question to you, not so much council desire. Is that not an option to train and invest in our, in our staff? So we do have bu budget uh, set aside for training, conferences, different things. Our staff does attend training. So it's not like there is a lack of training. So when I talk about s some of this is practical real world experience where our principal civil engineer or our, our traffic engineer works with the less experienced staff to actually review plans or do stuff. That's just, we have a, a, a couple of staff members who are uh, not as experienced as our other staff members that they actually spend the time working with them. It's called on the, on the job training. And that's uh, something different than obviously the, uh, the formal training in a, in a classroom. So we do a lot of on the job training just as well. Okay, council, uh, we don't wanna beat up Mr. Hernandez. Mm -hmm. Sir, and I opened the door here, I didn't intend that it was just gonna be a session here. I think we all get it. I think we understand that you need the work flow. You, um, I, I think we should move on and um, we can, if you wanna not approve that, council members, you can say that in the microphone, but let's give our, our team the, the tools that they need. You've identified some real resources. I'm hearing that you need it, so let's, let's continue on. I, uh, I think we should. We're going to vote on it just so we can kind of put this behind right. us, run through that program. Okay. I would vote. make the motion that we approve that amount. Okay. $250,000 for, uh, is there a second? I'll make a substitute motion um, to what Mr. Alexander said. Half of it go towards that consultant and the other half towards more staffing and their tra proper training. Okay. Is there support? A second? Second. Okay. Get your votes on that. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? No. Councilmember Charette? No. Councilmember Calvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Motion passes 4 to 2 with Councilmembers um, Figueroa and Charette voting in opposition. So the result is that the $250,000 $250, will be split. Uh, as mentioned by the motion. Thank you. All right, let's move on to other items in today's playbook here. Um, back out to the council for any other further questions and follow up on the um, item. Wait, which one again? This is the general. Oh, on the, the general. Whole item. The whole item. There's multiple requests yeah, here by saying. council. We, should, we need to break these off because there's. there's okay, well, there's go ahead and, and, and speak into the microphone, sir, okay. if you have anything. Uh, yes, so Mayor, the next one is yes, the. Yes, ma'am. Mayor, if I may, there was not a uh, vote taken for the maintenance workers unit. 
uh, I, I called it out and if I say if there's any objections, it was by consensus. Do you want and us to vote on it? I seconded that, the motion. I'll second it. Okay, so. Um, okay, to add the six maintenance workers. Um, do you need a vote? No, that's fine. Okay, all right, unanimous and consensus. All right, so the recommendation is there before you folks. Uh, we have fourfold uh, recommendations. Um, we've already amended a little bit of uh, the item number four. Um, I think what we need to do is p potentially um, pick apart item number three. So that's my suggestion, but it's really the council's determination yeah. on what we do here. So uh, should we go ahead and tackle the, the big enchilada, the uh, the 20 million for the... Uh, approval. Yes, I would, I, would like to, I would like to make an amendment to that. Um, so I am, I am fully in favor and I'm excited that this is moving forward. We had set aside 70 some, or the, we received 70 some million dollars in American rescue money. And I said, we've always been using the excuse that we don't have the money to tackle the biggest quality of life issue in the city, which is homelessness. Um, we don't have the money, we don't have the money. And then we have the $74 million and we spent half of that already on little 500,000 here, a million there, a million there. And we're starting to dwindle that amount very quickly. And so I'm very glad that we're moving towards this. But this is almost not enough. Um, the, the example I always use is the, uh, the hospital we have in Loma Linda. So that hospital cost, I think, hundreds of millions of dollars. And we were told by someone, an administrator at the hospital, that we will spend a third of that, of what it costs to build the hospital every year or every year and a half, running and maintaining that hospital. So we haven't quite secured the money to run the center. And the last thing I want to do is spend $20 million to $20 million to build a center. And then we don't open the doors because uh, we don't have the money to run it. So I want to set uh, aside, um, because this money, this, America, this ARPA money has a, a sunset period. So we have to spend it by 2026. So if you were to just cut up, you know, maybe what a reasonable budget would be for running that shelter, I would like to set aside um, $1.5 million a year from 20, what would that be, from 2023 to 2026? So what is that? Do the math, add that on top of the $20 million for the, the construction and, the, and, and putting together Mr. this. Mr. Sanchez, let me clarify, the $1.5 million that you're suggesting, alluding to, are those ongoing operational costs that you're suggesting, like custodial maintenance, uh, repairs, or is this construction cost towards the $12 million? No, no, so I, my understanding is that the $20 million essentially gets it built. No, the 12.4 no. is committed dollars towards the navigation. $12 million? There's a subset, look at the, look at the PowerPoint. The 12.4, the 12.4 is committed dollars for the navigation center. Okay. So your 1.5 that you allude to, where, where, where are you suggesting that we apply so that, that money is, towards? That is for the operation of the, of the, Thank you. Okay. Of the navigation center. Okay. So, so if, if we're able to get commitments from the county, the state, the feds to help us run this program, of course, just like we have with almost all the ARPA money expenditures we've had, we can pull back some of the ARPA expenditures. But this is a safety net. If that funding doesn't come through, we have the money available to run the program. And I'll tell you, once this program is up and running and we see how it's helping, you'll get commitments from the county and the state and the feds. But there, there'll, there's, I would doubt that there is hesitation about committing to this right now. So we gotta get it up and running. So that's what I would want. The $20 million set aside, and then we would set aside, what is it, $6 million? I think it would be four and a half because you wouldn't have it built immediately, so you You're would right. only have. Can we do four and a half then? Mm -hmm. Four and a half. Is that is that fine with the? That would be my motion. Wait, clarify, Councilman. So the twelve point five, you're fine with that, but an additional four million dollars. Yes. To operate it. Three years, so so it's about 1.5, is that what you're saying, per yeah. year? Well, that in fiscal it, year? In the three years of operation, there's no um, operational funds included in this 12 million? 
No, so no operational funds are listed inside of the, why didn't we include that? Why did we add some operational funding there? We didn't add operational funding because we were looking at other sources. And then also my information was that we needed some of the ARPA funds to spread across different departments. Now, with that said, I definitely could use that funding and to have an additional four million for operations would be outstanding. But our goal was to get the thing built and then we were going to partner with certain entities like IEHP, Dignity Health, C County of San Bernardino and other um, agencies to provide ongoing subsidies as well as continue to apply for various state funding as was, as was mentioned during the homeless workshop on October 27th. Do you have a yearly operational fund amount? Yeah, it's gonna, um, annual, um, an annual operating fund will be roughly 2.5 to $3 million. So, so we need, three years we need nine. <laughs> Question. If the city was gonna do it on its own, yes, but this is gonna be a heavy lift and the city was never expected to do this completely on its own. Sandra, council member. Yes, real quick. Um, did uh, Lutheran Services provide you reports of who they were serving? Uh, they provide now monthly reports. That wasn't always the case, but now they do. They provide the Housing Department monthly reports. Okay, that'd be good to keep a track of. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Okay, uh, let's go back to the motion maker, uh, Councilman Sanchez. So you're at uh, $4 million in operations costs. Yes, okay. for the Navigation Center. Okay. Oh, what, what, you, what was that? Wasn't it 4.5? 4.5. 4 4 okay. 4.5, I'm sorry. Okay, let's vote on that to add 4.5 to the $12.4 million. Um, and that would balloon the cost from 20.15 million to? 24,550. Okay, that's the motion. I'll second that. There's a second by Figueroa. Members cast your votes. Council Member Sanchez? Yes. Council Member Ibarra? Yes. Council Member Figueroa? Yes. Council Member Sherat? Yes. Council Member Kelvin? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, all right. So let's talk about the $1 million of Measure S funds for further development of the investment playbook. Um, you got to give me better, Mr. Hodges. Come to the podium here and tell me uh, the one million dollars. I mean, sell it to me because this is a million bucks of Measure S dollars. Um, the premise of Measure S funds were we sold it to the public, right, to raise their own taxes. Um, so how is that consistent with the premise of of the Measure S funds? I think the Measure S funds were to respond to community-driven needs, and I think this investment playbook does exactly that. Um, there are a lot of projects that were developed by the community and community organizations that speak to some economic development priorities of the council and the community, and it'll be a really big opportunity for, for the city to use the once-in-a-generation flow of federal funds. And it's really a timeline. The cities that get to these funds are the quickest that understand how to use the various programs to build a capital stack will get the money. And I think that's what's important about funding, um, not only an organization or a firm that can think about the playbook and all the projects and new projects that come along, get them costed, get, them, get narratives, find grants to uh, deploy the funds. That's a really important piece of implementing the playbook is to have a team that is dedicated and focused and has the experience to deliver and also has the credibility in the community and regionally to convene the type of people that we might need to convene to remove some roadblocks and get these projects together. Um, as far as the consultants, Bruce Katz, he's one of the foremost urban planners in the country. He was the, the chief, um, chief of staff to the Secretary of HUD. Aspen Institute, they've been with us from the beginning. They have a tremendous amount of resources around the, around the country including all of the other cities that are participating in this Aspen Lab that we're participating, we're able to gather them together quickly and say, what do you think about this project? What are some comparable projects in your community, in your city that we can use as a resource or as a, a foundation for something that we're doing? Um, and Bruce Katz, he really knows all of these various programs, these competitive grants, 
There's only two other cities that are trying to do something like this, Buffalo, New York, Erie, Pennsylvania. Buffalo, they got their playbook together quickly. They established it almost exactly how we're doing it with a nerve center, with a fiscal agent, um, with, with the entire playbook that they could go to their state capital and present, and they were able to get $100 million funded for their playbook. So we're trying to do something similar, and we're at a race against the clock. It's spread out over three years, but you know, I think that the proof will be in the pudding, and I think that if we invest in the nerve center, we should see some results. Um, there are a lot of projects, there are a few projects in the nerve center that are already moving along pretty quickly. The resource center is one of them. Um, we just got a grant for our Wait, fiber. Time project. out. Okay, sorry. Mr. Hodges, you said that it's a million dollars a year, so it's over three years. It's spread out over three years. The million is a drawdown, or is it a million dollars a year for three years? A million dollars a year for three years. My That's apologies. the commitment that yes. you're asking yes. for. Yes. That's P bold. Potentially. And, and that's I to get, get these projects going, right? Correct. Okay, it might not, we might not need that, the entire amount of money, but at least for this first fiscal year and possibly for the foreseeable future, we might need that entire money to, to keep the staff on hand, to keep the expert consultants on hand to deliver on the projects. So the million dollars per year, per fiscal year, is your request? Correct. Can I clarify that a little bit? It's yeah. up to a million dollars a year, subject to reappropriation every year. Um, the first year request is for a million dollars. The expectation that will be leveled upon the people who are running the program is that they make it self-sustaining. So, so that, that the number will go down, and you'll, but you'll get to revisit it every year. Who does? Every, the council. Okay. Because it will be brought back as a budget item every year. But the expectation has already been made clear that it will ultimately be self-sustaining. That's the whole point of the investment playbook in the will first Will these place. ultimately be city yeah. employees? Uh, don't yeah, know. Pro possibly. Maybe. Maybe not. They could be, because we're looking at some of, the, some of the folks, like Bruce Katz is never going to be a, a right. city employee. But, um, so some will be consultants and some will be, um, could be city employees or they could be nonprofit employees. There's, as a matter of fact, that's one of the models is that a lot of the folks who end up, you know, sort of managing these investment playbook components are employed by nonprofits as opposed to being actual city employees because you need to be flexible. You need the program needs to be able to morph over time in response because it's all based on opportunity. It's all about an opportunity play. So you change your approach year over year as you complete various components of the playbook, you move on to something else. Maybe the same person can do that or maybe it's something that requires a different skill set. So, so it's, it's an designed initial, to be flexible. It's an initial copay of a million bucks. Correct. There's no guarantee, there's no, I mean, I, we shell out a million bucks, and if it doesn't pan out over the next two years, we're out the first million bucks. Yeah, you're not, you're, well, it, it's, it's an investment. And I so I don't say, I wouldn't say out anything. I mean, I think you're making an investment with an intention of a return on that investment, to use uh, Councilmember Sherratt's sort of private sector analogy. So if it, so if it's not working out, that's part of the was part of is incumbent upon the operators of the folks who are doing the nerve center who are running the playbook, is to demonstrate that it is in fact being effective. That there is a return on what the city council invested in the first place. We'll have partners in this. The city will have partners in this effort. So the intention is certainly to make it ultimately self-sustaining to make Field, it pay for itself. I I I, I want to say okay, fine, a million dollars, but here's the caveat. Would you support then uh, two workshops annually to the council in workshop mode and bi-monthly reports to the council? We want reports. I mean, if we're going to spend a million bucks, come back with us every other month with a full report to the council. I'd say quarterly instead of every two months, but yeah, I think that's a reasonable expectation. Certainly. So quarterly reports, a full presentation of accomplishments and... Yeah, and then two and yeah. two annual workshops. We want two annual workshops because just specific to the nerve center because that's a million bucks. It's a lot of money. Are you okay to that? Are you agreeable to that? <coughs> I think it's a reasonable expectation. Uh, Council Member Cowley, yeah. and I would even ask that we have a workshop, you know, as soon as as soon as possible, um, to further educate the council and this, and the community on exactly what the. Um, playbook is all about. Yeah. I think that that would be in the best interest and so that will um, also allow us to be, you know, um, fiscally transparent with what it is that we're doing and we're not just blindly And asking. it keeps the nerve center accountable because I, you've got consultants galore and 
don't get me started on the carousel mall, but the bottom line is I want the community needs to see action. And if we just roll out checkbooks here for a million bucks and they don't come back to us, that's that's my my request is quarterly reports written and then two two annual two two semi-annual workshops. I think it's reasonable, keeps everybody on their toes and the council's informed in the public. But an, but an immediate workshop, a workshop as soon as that Absolutely. can be, as soon as That's possible, fine. that can well, be. To, to explain the, the workings of the nerve center. Correct. Yes. Playbook. Yes. In detail. And all of that, all of those RFPs and the contracts are going to be come to come to council anyway. Right. The, 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 this, all this does is allocate money yeah, to I it. Get it. Then there's the follow on is to pick a fiscal agent and to pick a nerve now, center. Now, does anyone, uh, the those. council, want to argue with the million dollars? I'm okay with no. the million dollars I, if we have those caveats. I have motion to approve. Mr. Uh, Just Mr. Charette, then Mr. Quick question. Alexander, I think. I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to use a little different term. This could potentially just be a million dollars of seed money Correct. that would we're investing in it, and then and then we may never, we'll be engaged with it, but we may never have to spend another dime on it. And that, and that is the, the intent, yeah. that's the hope that's and the, the hope. intention. That's the goal. That's, that's, the, yes. that's what we're trying to achieve. So yeah, I'm so willing always to invest. Okay. Uh, motion to approve. Uh, Mr. Alexander. Well, I, I'm just, I'll second your motion, uh, council member. But I just want to say this is, once again, this is an investment in the city. Right. So many, so many times you hear San Bernardino can't get out its own way. Okay. And now that we have an opportunity, Mr. Mayor, let's invest in our city. Let's invest in this playbook. Let's, let's give capture this. Let's capture this. Ms. Kelvin, would you agree on the two annual workshops and the quarterly reports? Right, he, she did. Is that part of your motion? She did, and I second it. Okay. Ms. City Clerk, you got that as part of the motion. Okay, that way we keep people accountable. Okay, yes, Ms. Barra. Okay, two things. I want to make sure that the reports are sent out to us as agreed upon because that didn't happen with the Carousel Mall. We did request it and that hasn't happened. Second of all, and, and, and I like how you use the term seed money. This is seed money because what I'm seeing here is that um, whoever we get for these, uh, for the playbook, they're going to go out there and seek the funds to make this happen, especially renovating City Hall and the Carousel Mall. So I, I am all on board with this, but I wanna make sure that staff will provide us with those reports timely and not and not drop and not uh, not send us anything and leave us in the dark of what's going on. That's all I request. We're doing things all backwards. We're doing all things. You know what this is? This is very similar to let's say the police department saying, "Hey, I need seventy million dollars to uh, to run crime fighting." Um, I, I'm not going to tell you yet how we're going to do it. I'm not going to come to you yet for approval. But go ahead and send me over a million dollars. And then at some point in the future, you guys will prove how we want to spend the money, um, and then we'll go ahead and expend that money. So this right here is nothing more. We're not approving the projects. We're not approving the program. All we're doing is doing a budgetary move to set the money aside. And we're doing that before the public out there has had a chance to vet this as a staff report, before we've had a chance to opine, make some amendments. I'm seeing things already. I see here in the staff report uh, should council approve the appropriation of these funds, the next step will be to identify a fiscal agent for the funds dedication for the investment playbook. So what that means is we're going to go ahead and grab a million dollars of city money. We're going to give it to someone that will then give it to someone else, and that third party will then answer potentially to that middleman. We can go ahead and pound on the door and say, what the hell, you guys aren't delivering. Oh, no, 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 we don't answer to you. We answer to the fiscal agent. They're the ones who handed down the money. There's all sorts of details in here that have already been decided that the public doesn't know about and that we haven't decided on. I am very excited about this because I've had a little conversations. In fact, I, breast, I read Bruce Katz's book. There's, some, there's a lot of consulting in there and we're gonna pay a lot of money for consulting, something we didn't wanna do for public works. So I am excited about this, but before we start asking about progress reports on how this program is running, Let's first go ahead and approve the project and all the iterations and the details because we haven't even done that. We're already setting, we're already setting aside the money and we haven't even approved the investment playbook or a nerve center or how it's gonna run or who's gonna staff it. So 
I, is the motion already there to approve them, yes. to set the money aside? But can I add something to that? How soon can staff have a staff report ready for us to approve exactly how this playbook is gonna work, who's gonna run it, and if, in fact, we are even going to have a fiscal agent. That's why we're gonna have the workshop, Councilman. We haven't even approved that program, so that needs to be done. So can we add that to the motion? What, what time, how much time do you guys need? How much time do you guys need to, to bring something before us for us to mold and approve? Because this is nothing more right now than a budget action. We haven't approved this program. Correct, and you haven't spent any money on it either. So that's that's part of the. And, and we do. We're committing we, we, a million we, we, dollars to it. What? Not well. You're allocating, but you're not spending it. You've not contracted it out. So it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg argument, perhaps here. If you don't do this, then there's no program. So there needs to be that that money needs to be set aside. Usually, usually we approve the program and set the money aside in Correct. one action. This, That's this, not what we're doing here. Right. We're setting this the money a, aside this a, before we take this it. This is a different approach, absolutely, because we're building this airplane as we're flying it. So it's going to be important it's, you, you, if we don't take this action. So then we're going to I'm, potentially I'm fine we're going to lose that. I want the public to know and I want us to know how soon is this coming back for us to approve this? How long do you guys need? Corey, help us out. You need two months? Three months? Well, I say the other thing about this document is it's a living document, right? We, we have projects that are on there. There could be new projects that pop up. So it's what we have on the website and what it is is kind of our eight months of work, vetting, going through the stakeholders. Um, I think probably January we could come back with something. Approving a, an iteration of this? Yeah, I mean, I think and the, a great the, example, actual, again, the actual document. The fiscal agent. We the, haven't approved a fiscal agent. We haven't approved a fiscal agent yet, correct. Council member, you do realize that you just approved the $4 million without us knowing a full plan, too, of how the navigation center is going to be, who it's going to be run by. And we just gave, we just allocated those funds for operational funds without knowing who's going to be doing that. So it's, it, we you need to be a little bit consistent here. Uh-huh. No, and that's, that's, that's what this is about here. So, so what, you don't, you don't want us to approve this? No, 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 not saying that exactly. I'm just trying to give you the comparison, just showing you that you need to be consistent in what you just went from one project where you allocated an additional four, 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 four point five million dollars. You know, we actually did. And approve. We're at, uh, no, we, we, we did. It no. was in the special workshop we had you, uh, you where we dedicated additional. an entire special meeting to how this navigation center is going to work, and we approved it. You just and we added operational without any understanding of how that or who that, who was going to be in charge. We know where that money's going to get operation, spent. We don't know Operating that navigation, navigation center, which what I'm saying is I'm just showing you a comparison where we just need to be consistent. Yeah, and, and we again, this council had a special meeting and we approved a navigation center and exactly as it was described by our director of, of homeless services. We already did that. Have we done that for this yet? We have not. Okay. So it's coming back in, in January. I trust probably, Corey January is probably a little too soon. I think probably first meeting in February, just to give it two months. Okay. All that right, that works. Just just to be. Can we add that? You don't to want the to promise on that kind of stuff. So. Can we add that to the motion, uh, Councilmember Kelvin? Most definitely. We already agreed to that. Okay, great. Cast your votes. Well, no. Two two yes. annual report. Two workshops. Uh, quarterly reports in writing, and an immediate workshop. And is that a third workshop? No, no, it's part, part of it. One of the two. Yeah. It's kickoff. Okay. No. Cash votes. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Councilmember Charette? Yes. Councilmember Kelvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, folks, I think we're done here. Item number five, we did one, two, three, four, five, well, one, two, three, four. Uh, we accepted item number one, thank you. Um, um, also the 59,000 for CDBG. Yes. I think we skipped that one. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's do it. Who for approval on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 59,000. Is there a motion for that effect? That was in the 20 million. That was in the 20. Okay. You need $59,000, that's a request from CDBG. Is there a motion? Motion. Second? I'll second. Great, cash votes. Council Member Sanchez? Yes. Council Member Ibarra? Yes. Council Member Figueroa? 
Council Member Shirat? Yes. Council Member Calvin? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Aye. Motion passed unanimously. Okay, uh, let's take a five minute break. How's that? Let's take a five minute and uh, we'll come back in a five minutes and hear item number six. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members, if uh, you'll report back to the desk and we're going to conduct business tonight. We're back from a five minute recess. Um, this is item number six, receive and file on the former American Sports University student dorm dormitory located at 340 West 4th Street. Mr. City Manager. Yes, yeah, so yeah, the presentation on this is going to be kicked off by Nathan Freeman. I believe Cassandra Searcy will be joining in on the presentation, but uh, we'll start with Nathan, so take it away. Good evening, Mayor, uh, distinguished members of the City Council. Waiting for the presentation to load. It's not going to happen, guys. Okay, I uh, wanted to give the Council a very quick update. Uh, just for the sake of time, I don't want to relitigate all of the very public information relative to the American Sports University, specifically the former student dorm. Uh, I would like to share some what I consider to be pretty exciting news. Uh, if the council recalls, uh, recall your previous direction to myself was to work with our city attorney's office to uh, aggressively uh, obtain an emergency receivership for the property. I'm happy to report that tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, uh, the city attorney's office and myself will be at the San Bernardino courts petitioning a judge to file an emergency receivership for the subject property. And I'd very quickly like to uh, articulate, should the judge approve the emergency receivership, which based on the facts, we feel very comfortable and confident that they will, that emergency receiver would in essence, sorry guys, uh, would in essence fulfill the obligations of the property owner relative to the temporary restraining order that was filed in September. So, in a nutshell, the, an emergency receiver would have the power to, at the very beginning, in the short term and the long term, convect, conduct a very thorough investigation and uh, of the subject property. They would also be responsible for conducting an inventory, a thorough inventory, similar to what staff has been doing on who is in the property right now, what is their status. They would also be responsible financially for securing the property. If you recall, up to date, the city has been responsible. We have been paying for fire watch at the property 24 seven for almost two and a half months now. Uh, and most recently, our contractor went in and secured all of the vacated uh, called dorm rooms in the facility. Uh, the receiver would also be responsible for removing all of the individuals from the property in accordance with the temporary restraining order. And if you recall, their temporary restraining order was very articulate in how the property owner was to do that. They were to pay for the relocation of those individuals that were still on site. More long term, the receiver has the ability to secure funding to potentially rehabilitate the property potentially turning it back into a, a dorm room of some kind or something of the sort. Or conversely, if the, if the uh, retain, excuse me, the, <clears throat> uh, if the individual determines that the building cannot be saved, that it's too far gone, again, they have the ability to leverage funding to do the demolition of that site. And not only potentially sell that property, again, very potentially, but the entire campus uh, that constitutes the, the former American Sports University. So very quickly, tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, myself and our attorney will be in front of the courts petitioning for a much needed emergency receivership for this property. Uh, and I would say specifically for the individuals who are still in the property uh, that staff has been engaging with on a daily basis uh, at your direction. Again, we feel that it will be beneficial for the long term of the site, for those who are in the property, because the owner has failed to live up to what was directed to them through the temporary restraining order. So that is my very quick update. For the sake of time, I won't go through the whole presentation. Okay, Happy Councilman to answer any Charette. questions. Just a real, did I understand you to say something, I, I think I didn't hear it clearly, that that building alone can have an impact 
on the entire campus, the other buildings that are part of American Sports University? That is correct. So the so there and there's about three or four, aren't there? I mean, uh, there's multiple. The old, the old Sun Company building and the old Dean Witter. A lot of people don't know who Dean Witter is, but Dean Witter building across the street. Uh, that so, was also so you are, part of that. You are correct. There are multiple buildings that constitute the former American Sports University. And that would they would all come under receivership. So right now we're, we're taking a very broad approach. Right now we're focused on the student dormitory, but we're taking a broad enough approach that whoever the future receiver is, if they make the determination that the entire property needs to be sold in order to, in essence, pay the lien against the property, they will have that power. I understand, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. This is a receiving file, we appreciate it. And uh, we thank you, all right. There's no further questions. We'll move on to item number seven. This is an update on the citywide truck route study. Mr. City Manager. Yes. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, this presentation is going to be made by Dave Murray, who is our planning director. Um, he's been working this in, in conjunction with the uh, with the general plan development. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dave. It's all yours. Uh, thank you, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, Dave Murray, your City Planner. Um, the item before you is just a receive and file item to discuss the uh, truck route study that's still in progress. Um, this was per direction from the City Council back in May of 2021, um, where there was a discussion uh, about the growing demand for warehousing and logistics uses throughout the city. Uh, the mayor and city council uh, directed staff to come back with a professional services agreement with PlaceWorks, who was our consultant on the overall general plan um, project. And subsequently, in March of 2022, city council approved that, that amendment to, to the uh, contract with PlaceWorks to subconsult with KOA um, to prepare the truck route study. Uh, since uh, March of this year, KOA has been diligent in doing the, the work to prepare um, for the truck route study, doing some background work. Uh, this evening, we have a very brief um, presentation uh, by Brian Mach Marchetti from KOA, and he can discuss what's been done so far and, and what the next steps are. And just a matter of information, uh, we received the draft truck route study uh, just in time to publish the agenda. So staff has uh, basically set, had the same amount of time as, as you have to review the document. There was a a comment about uh, some concerns about the location of the truck routes. That's something staff, uh, our team, our partners in public works and police are actively reviewing the truck route study. And um, you know, the, the, what you'll hear from uh, Mr. Marchetti uh, here in a moment uh, is uh, essentially the, the process in how they determine those truck route studies by looking at the current usage uh, of, of the roadways and where the trips are going. Um, but I do want to, you know, preface that, that staff still is reviewing. This is only a receiving file, the work in progress. That was something that was asked for by the council. Um, and we will come back at a later date with a, a refined um, document for your review that's been fully vetted by staff. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mr. Marchetti. Thank you, David. So I'm going to go through um, our process, uh, the goals of the study, uh, what went into um, our analysis, the initial recommended routes, and I'll we'll talk about next steps and, and uh, implementation as we move this forward. Where are we? Okay. And uh, as, as David said, this has been part of the general plan effort. We're working on the general plan and the specific plan for, for downtown the general plan for the whole city. Uh, so this is being incorporated directly into the general plan process, this, this truck route, um, the truck route study and the, and the eventual regulatory map. So the, the goals of the study, um, as I said, it's related to the to larger general plan. Um, determine the existing pattern of, of trucks. These are, these are the larger trucks. We're looking at the, the tractor trailer type trucks, the California legal trucks, uh, sometimes called heavy duty trucks and some of the slightly smaller trucks, but we're really looking at these larger trucks that have the most impact on circulation, roadways, uh, et cetera. 
So we're looking at the reasons behind these truck patterns, where are they going, where did they come from, what are their destinations. Uh, looking at the likely future shifts in, in uh, truck demand based on land use changes over time. Uh, looking at potential conflicts, uh, routing patterns, and, and our local communities in the city. Uh, we, we're constantly aware of, of where these routes are going and if they're affecting residential neighborhoods and if they don't need to. Uh, we, we've looked for, for, other, for other routes, but the, the goal is to connect industrial properties that require major truck access, commercial centers that require truck access, and any, any parking uh, type facilities in the, in the city. Uh, we've also developed an understanding of, of the bordering cities, how the, how the land uses in, in the neighboring cities and their truck routes um, interface uh, with San Bernardino. And then we've looked at a truck route system, uh, balancing the need for access uh, through movement through the city and community preferences um, where, where, where people live and do not want to get the effects and the impacts of, of truck traffic. Uh, so the, the Truck route study defines the basis of compliance with, with federal law, uh, but mostly California Vehicle Code, um, how the California Vehicle Code regulates and allows cities to implement their own truck routes. Otherwise, there are default assumptions made uh, from state routes on where trucks can go. Um, so we've integrated ex a lot of existing data into the analysis, and I'll show you some of that. Uh, the study supports the diversion of trucks away from residential areas and away from the downtown area. As it, as it grows and changes, we don't want truck routes going, going through the downtown area. So that was a big part of the specific plan effort. Um, this defines the regulatory routes. Uh, truck travel and parking kind of overlap on these routes. Um, but we'll also be looking into a framework on how parking can also be handled uh, separately from the truck routes. There are um, existing weight restrictions, as was referenced before, on certain neighborhood roadways throughout the city, and we've, we've mapped those. Uh, some of those parking restrictions can stay if the city desires, um, just as a way to enforce the truck routes, but they're not necessarily uh, needed after the truck routes are established. Uh, the study recommends municipal code changes because this has to be a regulatory uh, change in your uh, references to vehicle travel throughout the city. Um, and we provide a framework for regulatory truck route sign placement so that it's, it's logical for truck drivers and they can follow routes uh, via the signage. And that was that slide. Um, just to show you a few slides on what we've incorporated into the study, we looked at the um, roadway classifications in the city, the major roadways, the arterials, uh, collectors uh, coming down in, in, in importance in those roadways to, to see um, how, to, how to use that network uh, for, for the truck routes. And then uh, we looked at um, existing truck volumes and we're, we're adding to this map, we just had some additional counts done as well. Um, but we looked at existing truck volumes and it's, some of it's pretty obvious, it's right at the freeway, access points to the city, Palm, uh, Baseline, Fifth Street, uh, coming off the freeway and then trucks dispersing out to their destinations then around the airport and, and the rail yards and then some other areas as well. Uh, we also got uh, GPS data um, this is this is fleet uh, GPS data. We looked at four different seasons um, post pandemic um, or outside of the pandemic, at least. Uh, this is a map of one of the one of the the largest seasons, which was August of 2021. So we used that to look at at uh, concentrations of truck travel throughout the city. Started to define routes in that manner, but we really wanted to see where trucks are going now as an obvious first choice but also kind of look at that and see where trucks should not be going and if there's better alternate routes to their destinations. One other thing, um, the next step we did in that was to take this down to truck density, kind of boil that data down, all those points that we had and kind of look at, at really what are, the, what are the major locations. Uh, so we used both of those um, sets of data. Uh, we looked at land use throughout the city this is the existing uh, land use map of the city as compiled uh, for the general plan effort. 
Uh, the, the darker gray areas are the industrial, the red is the uh, commercial areas. So we, we focused on these, making sure that any major commercial parcel or any significant industrial parcel uh, was included in the truck route uh, network. We also looked at uh, pavement conditions, which was also referenced earlier in the meeting. Um, this is a, a map of what we call the, the PCI. Um, this is the pavement condition index for the city. So we've mapped all of the pavement conditions from the city pavement management system and put them uh, into our analysis. And we have, a, we have a summary table in the report that, that shows, lists every segment. Obviously the map is you know, one page. Um, so it lists every segment. It lists the pavement condition. It lists a lot of other characteristics um, of each segment. And that's, that's in, the, in the full report. What it, what it all boils down to is this recommended truck route map. And this, this is being um, worked on, revised. Uh, we, have our, we have our city team uh, that we've been meeting with, with planning, uh, public works and the police department to look at this and, and validate the routes. We're looking at it, individual parcels that are being uh, developed now for industrial to, to make sure we're covering uh, those locations. Um, but th this is the entire uh, recommended route network now, and we are, we are making some adjustments to this um, as we go forward. This map also shows the adjoining uh, city truck routes that need to kind of come in and form a network. So the route network's based on the city, surrounding city truck network, uh, the land use, uh, the destinations in the city, and the major arterials that serve uh, commercial uh, parcels as well. So all, all that went into um, this map. And I have one more slide and I'll wrap this up. Uh, so the project report that you've been provided is the draft report uh, for you to review and uh, provide, provide comments tonight. And uh, as we move forward, uh, we're not adopting anything tonight. We're not presenting um, any city ordinances or anything for your uh, consideration tonight. This is this is the draft report. So, what the draft report does, it details that regulatory framework that I talked about, provides the analysis details, uh, summarizes the characteristics of each truck route segment. Like I said, uh, it also um, it also looks at potential bikeway projects, since the city adopted the uh, active transportation plan. We wanted to know areas where you could have bike lanes, and then you have truck routes. You need to make sure that lanes are uh, adequate. Uh, for both of those to occur where they might overlap. So that's in there as well. And then we have an implementation framework and some recommended uh, code revisions um, to be considered as the move toward implementation. So that's the summary of the truck study. We can take any questions that you have. Okay, Council Member Calvin. Um, yes, sir, thank you for the presentation. I appreciate that. Um, I noticed that you're pretty liberal with the um, numbers as far as, bless you, bless you. with the numbers as far as for the um, P, awarding 100, per, 100 for the PCIs. Did you guys oh, okay. actually drive those streets or did we use Google? No, yeah, you're right. That, that's an excellent question because sometimes you do do a, just a basic overview when you're looking at pavement conditions. But these are all, um, I believe, field visual measurements by the city for the pavement management system. Uh, he's shaking his head, yes. Um, so these are all visual inspections in the field um, of pavement conditions uh, so over, over a few years time. Over, uh, uh, how long? Over a few years time, I believe. A few years time, that could be quite outdated then, that information. Yeah, I'll look at that. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's a few years, but um, it's, it's over time. It's not like a single month or something like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your report. Appreciate it. Um, I have a about a road segment between um, on Fifth Street between Mount Vernon and Waterman. It looks like your recommended truck routes. Mm -hmm. It's right down. It's it's right downtown. It's on right fifth, where we're on, doing the Fifth, uh, on fifth Street fifth Gateway. Street. It's, right. it's, it's, that's right in the smack of new development that's uh, yeah. most, mostly co uh, commercial cars, roadway, and you have that as a route. 
Could you delete uh, that segment? We can look at that. One of the things we're, we're trying to balance is getting the trucks from the freeway to the industrial areas around the airport and if we're trying to revitalize the downtown area, um, you know, our options are Rialto second or fifth. We're trying to right. analyze what, which of those roadways makes the most sense given our future vision for the downtown area. Right, but one problem with heavy rigs is it beats up our street. We just repaved that street, right? Yeah, yep, absolutely. Yep, we just did, we just repaved it and now you're gonna put it on a truck route which is gonna beat it up, huh? Understood. So are you writing that down? Because I don't, I don't think you're writing that down. Okay, my next one is uh, Rialto, same way. Between Mount Vernon and Waterman is another. It's, it's right downtown. It's where we're trying to redevelop, and you're going to send heavy rigs right, right downtown. And thank you for writing that down, and ho hopefully you'll see a change. One question. How long have you, you, you've been working on this analysis, sir, for how long? Um, the second half of this year. And when do you plan to bring us back before council with, uh, with implementation or for our vote? Yeah, yeah and, and I can answer that. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> okay. uh, as I mentioned, staff is going to be reviewing this over the next right. uh, month or two and refining it. And so we hope to be back to city council and first next year. What, I, what, what date? Because we've been working on this a long time. We're, so We're looking at February. We're looking at, thank you. See, now watch me write that down. <laughs> February. And, uh, and Council Member Alexander, I just wanted to reinforce that, that the, the goal of this is to kind of enforce already what's kind of happening and keep them on those major routes. So there are trucks using Fifth Street, but there could be a potential for the increase, um, I think is, is, is what you're talking about. So we'll look at that again, but there was a conscious decision to keep truck routes off of second, fourth, et cetera. But Rialto's right on the right on the south side, Fifth Street's right on the north side. Yeah, but so we also said we that we're going to have bike routes, and I know Fifth Street is a part of that new bike route Correct. Uh, area, so that's yeah. a, that, that was an issue for me. So I saw that. So bring it to your attention. Yeah, we'll look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your report. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Mr. Murray, I have a problem with the north-south corridor of Mount Vernon from Highland all the way to the city border. That's identified on the recommended truck routes. I have a problem with that. I, I can't support um, such a huge corridor. Um, now I understand around 5th and Mount Vernon, understand Rialto and Mount Vernon because there's the BNSF rail lines. But in, in essence, um, the north-south from Highland Avenue all the way down to the city of Colton's on Mount Vernon. I don't know if that's, can we explore an opportunity to see if there's an alternate route, especially from Highland Avenue to Mount Vernon. I don't know if I want to see big heavy rigs using that north-south Understood, corridor. yeah. Made it just note. seems, yeah, they, they, I would think so. They would use probably the two, 215 and get off at baseline. Well. I'd like to see them get off at Fifth Street and just come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll take a look at that. And, you know, we're also, one thing I should mention too is, you know, a lot of this was based on existing uses and, and zoning. We'll also be truthing it with our um, proposed uses that we're going through with our general plan update as well. And so that, that, that's not reflected here. Either, well, and so. don't forget, I think on one of the pages you, you suggest enforcement. Um, also signage, right? You gotta have some, some money for signage and yes. all that other good stuff and enforcement is key. Signage, Public Works probably needs a budget on this for signs and so don't forget to include that. And, and Mayor, I, I think that we uh, did flag a segment of Mount Vernon based on the residential uses in that area and like you said, to divert to other routes to avoid that area. So I, I believe we flagged that, but we'll look at that again. PD, right? I mean, if we need to hire two more, I think we already have a commercial vehicle enforcement team. So uh, appropriation for that and figuring out how many more motorcycle officers or another team, uh, that's going to be a funding opportunity for the council. Okay. Anybody else? Councilman Figueroa? Uh, thank you. Uh, you. You did mention 
of course, this is just the recommended truck route. You did mention that you're, you're looking at making some adjustments based on, on so what, what type of adjustments or what triggered having to make adjustments? What, what are you looking at? Yeah, it's it's um, council member. It's it's been a some fine tuning that we've looked at in our in our team meetings uh, with, with city staff and 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 it, police department has been included in that as well based on their experience. So some of it's been okay. We need to include this one street because there's an industrial parcel there that's going to require access, um, or we we don't need this area because of because of residential. So it, this was kind of a initial take on it and then we kind of got down to the finer grain um, of the city parcels and local roadways and kind of looked at it again so it's okay as you can imagine it's a complicated process so I, 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 we'll I'm certain it is on a fourth or fifth version coming up so how does this also affect um, for example like large uh, grocery stores that aren't necessarily they, they, they have to like let's say stater but there's I, I think there's one on Kendall there's one on 40th but those, right. I mean, they, they would still be allowed to deliver their goods to, to the supermarket, right? Or is this? Yeah, there's, there's, there's allowances to, to reach destinations that aren't necessarily terminals where there's activity happening um, on a constant basis. Uh, deliveries and things that are slightly off the routes without having to put a truck route down a small uh, roadway potentially just to get to a supermarket. Uh, we're, we're looking into some of those issues. Um, but for the most part, we're, we are trying to cover the commercial land uses with truck routes um, just for that reason. Um, but there are obviously some major supermarkets off these routes, and we're looking into how to private, provide access to those without encouraging through traffic. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you. Yes, ma'am. The signage that we're going to put out throughout the city, it won't just be on the truck routes, right? I know that we've mentioned um, signage being needed inside of residential areas, um, um, stating that there's no parking there for uh, big rigs, because we still see a lot of that in community. So that will be part of the signage as well? Yeah, that's, that's to be considered. There are five or six major areas in the city as we, we mapped in the report that have those uh, no commercial parking or no trucks over a certain weight um, in the areas now. Um, the, the truck routes basically allow for the permitted truck routes and then prohibit trucks from going on other routes unless they're reaching a destination. So the truck routes could basically render those unneeded, but the parking signs that are there now could enforce the routes. And, and continue to state no parking in these areas. And those could continue to be used, um, but that's something we're discussing with the city, what the best tool is to implement that. Would that be like Caltrans, like anything north of the 210? You know, like, because that's 90% you know, residential parking, and I have a, in my ward, I have a lot of problems with heavy rigs parking yeah, in a residential area. there now. Could that be like a Caltrans collaboration? When you get off, the, when they get with off the, the with the state route, right, going north. Just at just just food right. for thought. That's yeah. all. Just they're, food for thought. You ain't got an answer because this is a receiving file. Just food for thought. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Understood. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, sir. We're gonna move on. Thank you, Very council, good. council members. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's. Uh, this is item number eight. Uh, notice of intent to conduct a public hearing on December 7, twenty twenty-two to consider adjusting the maximum permitted service rates. I'm sorry, let me go back to something. Um, I think more of a housekeeping issue. Let's go back to item number... Do, 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 do. Item five. Yes, item number five. Item number five, council members. Uh, go to item number three on your master executive summary packet there. Uh, we did not get the approving the first quarter general fund budget amendments totaling $2.88 million. It approval, hold on. But it should read. It's going to be more, right? Yeah, it's like $2.394 million. So is that your motion? Whatever the it's what the operations, on, yes. correct. So it's the six additional operations. Right. I'll second that. I don't know what that number is. I have a, I have a number have correct, um, Director Bidenhorn? 2.394 million. It's like 2.395. Correct. 
That's my motion. Okay, that's your motion. Yes, there's a, a second by Figueroa. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's no need to complicate. We approve the the um, let's approve this, right? Because we already approved the additional. Great. The, okay. Great. Yeah. So Great. yes. I have a, still have a question. Okay. Oh, yeah, we uh, you had twenty thousand dollars for code enforcement for overtime. We this council, uh, in fact, Councilman Sanchez said let's hire eight more, and then I said nights and weekends was the hiring authority. And everyone said yes. So if we have them on a schedule of nights and weekends, why do we need twenty thousand dollars in overtime? That's a great question, Councilman. I'll give you an example. So recently, the Pep Boys building burned down on East Street. That was an emergency call out overtime. Staff was there till from almost 10 o'clock till five in the morning. Those are the situations in which we would need overtime. So, okay, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I totally get it, great. At, at your earliest convenience, can you just send me the schedule of Code of Forest, their, their nights and weekend schedule? I'd be happy to, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, there's a motion by Charette, second by uh, Figueroa to approve the 2.088 million dollars in the request plus the additional six operations support staff there for a total of 2.394949 million dollars um, cash votes councilmember sanchez yes councilmember ibarra yes councilmember figueroa yes councilmember Sherat. yes councilmember calvin yes councilmember alexander aye motion passes unanimously all right, now let's go back to item number eight. This is the notice of intent to conduct a public hearing. I have some verbiage here. Um, there is an option. No, I actually don't. Yay. Um, there's an option, um, three options before you, council members. If you studied your packet, the packet page number three, your staff report clearly gives you the options. Um, is there a motion for an option? Yeah, um, I would like uh, to go with option two. Um, it's kind of the best between both worlds for now. Okay, perfect. Um, is there a support for that? Yeah, motion. I'm, not, I'm not done with that quite yet. Um, second part is uh, I think there needs to be consideration. I know, uh, I think Vertec does this for other agencies. Um, the city of San Bernardino, when we had trash in-house, also offered a discounted rate for smaller bins. Um, I would like something like that presented. I would also like them uh, to possibly consider um, if they were to subsidize um, with an additional five-year program. So they've committed to investing in our community in the long term. There's facilities that they've built here that's cost them millions of dollars. I would not, I'm not necessarily sold on it, but I would like to see the numbers of what it would cost if they were to subsidize over a 10-year period. So we're we're allowed through the contract for a five-year extension. What if we were to allow for a 10-year extension and they would subsidize so that the rates don't increase at such a steep rate? That, plus I would like um, the option of the smaller bins for those residents who, I mean, I couldn't fill my bins in a whole year if I tried. And I know a lot of residents are the same way, so we should have a we should have that option available to us. I know, again, Birdtech does that for others. I think maybe they should Offer it to us for those who who, um, who that would fit better. Okay, Councilman Sanchez, um, I understand that, but the option number two, as stated by the staff report, doesn't even come close to that. What it says is to extend the term by five years to March 31, 2031. So I want uh, I want there to be a reflection of a preference for option two. I would also ask of staff to bring an option four that includes a subsidized 10-year agreement. And the third component of this is to also include in all option one, two, three, and let's call it option four, a smaller bin option for residents who don't create that much trash. So those are three components to my motion. And each one of those. Wait, to support, to augment option two as staff report. No, no, no. I want option two brought as a preference, but I also want council to be allowed an option four, an option four, which is a 10-year subsidized rate. 
so that the increases aren't so steep. And look, we may not pick it for one reason or another, but I want, basically we can throw out one and three, you bring us back on option two and an option four. Both of those including a small bin option. Does that make sense? No? Okay, is there support for that from the council? All right, let's go back to the staff report here. The staff report gives us three options. Um, Council Member Calvin, you had a suggestion or alternate? I do. Um, in looking at the, the chart, um, option one, when we got to 2026, which is when Vertex contract expires, the, the difference, but there's no difference actually between option um, one and option uh, two at that time. And option one then allows us to um, ne renegotiate at that time as well versus uh, picking a option that guarantees a five-year extension. So I'm not, e I'm not really uh, sure what the difference, what council, what staff was looking at um, with option two because the amount that the um, community will be paying is the same amount um, as option one yet we don't have the five-year extension guarantee. So that is, what, um, that is what I like to recommend, allowing us to still have an option to choose to be able to renegotiate that contract in 2026. So what's your, what's your suggestion, ma'am? So my motion is that we uh, choose option one um, so that we don't have the extension. It's the same amount of money that the council, that staff is recommending um, um, to us in 2026 when Vertex contract expires the community will be paying the same exact amount, but they will not have a, a guaranteed five-year extension. So yes, the main difference is the five-year extension and the deferral of the implementation cost in uh, year one. But after that, the costs remain the same, just like. Right, so we still have an opportunity at that time to discuss that deferral cost, and we have an opportunity at that time to renegotiate the entire, the, the contract itself. We, we're not locked in. That's correct. <clears throat> okay, um, I appreciate that, council member. So on the packet page number three, uh, staff is recommending, apparently our staff has analyzed this. Uh, Mr. Hernandez, talk to the council here, please, on the option two and why there was... There was no second. There was not. I, I, I'm going to go back and second uh, Sanchez. Okay. There was, there was a, a staff recommendation for option two, uh, as was stated in the report. Can you help us walk us through the, you've spent time, your team has spent time, you have conferred with Mr. Bertek. Tell us option two and why do you support that? Because that's your recommendation. So there's two items that converge here. One is their natural CPI increase per their agreement. But as a result of SB 1383, it's opened up the agreement, which is the change in law provision within the agreement that allows them to uh, negotiate the, the price associated with it. So that's really why these two items converge. It's the CPI, um, which is a consumer price index, and the cost to implement SB 1383. So as indicated in, in option one by uh, Council Member Calvin, it's a straight implementation off the existing terms of the agreement um, where we maintain the, sta the same terms of our agreement where, uh, where Burtec is only allowed to increase the service rate uh, on, the, um, on a component of the actual rate structure. Uh, because of SB 1383, there is a lot of the provisions that allows them to pass through the cost of disposal and processing. So only the organic waste will be, um, will be imposed the uh, disposal and processing, where the service remains consistent with our current agreement. So that's option one, so I wanted to give that example because option one was considered. So option two is the exact same um, rate structure where we still cap the service rate at 5% maximum per the agreement, still allow Burtec to, per the change in law provision, to recover pass-through costs on the disposal and processing, but we extend them for five years. and the. Um, the incentive there is that they defer the implementation in year one. Uh, so since this is an existing um, term or provision within the existing agreement to allow 
for an extension, which is why staff is recommending that since it is, we, uh, from a staff perspective, we're happy with the level of service that Vertex provides. Um, we re rarely receive service-related complaint on the residential side. We do run into some um, some concerns on the commercial side because of the fact that it is a franchise hauler, but it's not really a service issue. It's more about the rules and regulations associated with the municipal code. But overall, staff is per pretty pleased with the um, level of service, um, the communication with uh, Mr. Uh, Mike um, Aregi. So we, we feel like we... Um, we, we have that relationship and we want to continue to foster that, which is why option two. Uh, additionally, on option three, this allows that service cap to be removed. So we are at the mercy of whatever the rates are in, in the future. The, the, what's provided in the staff report are all estimates, but the beauty of option two is that it caps it at 5%. So we know at a maximum what you see here is the maximum what a resident will pay on average on a monthly basis. With option three, it opens it up in terms of that increased cost. We have no control over that. So that's why option two was presented to the council that we know it's almost like, as I was mentioned up here, it's that, that happy medium where we're estimating a worst case, but as presented in the staff report, CPI has not reached that 5%, even though that's the cap. So we gave the, the council a worst case scenario so that they could see that. But on average, over the last three or four years, it's been at around 3%. So that number is actually gonna be lower, maybe lower. Okay, course, option, course. option number two, the, the phraseology that is used by staff, except for the organic waste processing and disposal components related to SB 1383 change in laws, which will be passed through and charge a full rate. Is there an estimate or an analysis by the staff on what those potential rates might be? So those rates were estimated and prepared by Vertec, which we validated the, the, the rate methodology. Okay, so what are they? What are the potential rates because it says here that except for so there's going to be an additional fee on top of that so the the on top of the 37.97 so look at the table chart table number one yes so the 37.97 is my base fee in 2023 if yes. i go with option two but that doesn't include the additional uh, SB 1383. That's all inclusive. So that price of 37.97 is all inclusive, which in, uh, includes the solid waste, the recycling, and the organics. So we didn't break it. Uh, we we gave obviously this the, the, because the the rate methodology is is pretty okay. Maybe I'm reading this wrong. According to this, it says except for organic waste processing, which will then be passed through and charged at a full rate without being subject to the cap. So that, that, is, that statement is correct, but the price that's listed in the table is all-inclusive of all three components. But so, they're contradictory in terms. I mean, if the chart says it's 37.97 and you're telling me that it's all-inclusive, then the language in option two, the last sentence there, is inconsistent with that. How? So, Why? So in the rate calculation, it's segmented, right? So the, each component has a rate component, a sub-rate component. Okay. Then it's the aggregate is the thirty-seven ninety-seven, so the the five percent is only uh, applied to the service rate. So if we have three sections on this, just for, for the council will indulge me, this this spreadsheet, we have three sections of each of the. So it contain, uh, contains the solid waste, the recycling, and the organics or gr green waste. So that five percent is only applied to the very top, which is the the, the service component of that element. But below, uh, on the organics, the contractor, in this case Vertec, is allowed to pass through what their actual costs are to, uh, to provide that service. So the only element that doesn't factor in that 5% cap is the organics waste. But it's inclusive of that $37.97. So, are you done, Mr. Mayor? Yes. I, I, great, and I, I appreciate that, and I, I, I think option two, but from the 22 to 23, it's, it's the same option as we have in, in option one. So what, so what benefit is that to our rate payers? I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I would like option three, but option three is not an issue because there's no cap. So how do we help our rate payers who, how do, how do we help them? Because this does not seem fair to them. I, I, I like Vertec, 
Vertec is does a great service except for the subcontracting of their street sweeping. But other than that, uh, they, they 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 provide a service. But how do we help? How do we how do we bring that down? How, how do how do we bring that down for our ratepayers in our city? Can, is or is there is there time for renegotiation, or do we have to do this now? Is it is it is it we have to vote on this today? So we do have, um, so option one will actually take, since it's not deferred, uh, based on the schedule, if we were to choose option one, to, which we uh, indicated in the staff report, our target would be to implement March, uh, March 1st. 2023. No, 2022. That would be year 2022 on the, on the table. 2022? So, excuse me, 23, sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. 20, tw you're, you're absolutely right. My, my apologies. No worries. So March 1st, 2023 would be the implementation if we go with option one. Right. So if we go with option two or a hybrid of option two, we still have time because our target is July 1st. So my, my thing is negotiation to bring this down for our rate pay. I keep going back to the people. So how do we bring this down? Can we negotiate back with them? Do we have time to say, hey, Burtech, you know what? Can you bring it down a dollar? Can you bring it down two dollars? Can you can you help uh can you help our ratepayers out in the city? So one of the things I do want to advise council. So what allowed the negotiation to open up was the provision and change of law. So our staff's focus and working with Bertic was solely focused on the organic side. If we didn't get into the solid waste because the provision to open up the ability to adjust the rates and to incorporate this was due to the solid waste and. For continuity's sake, we felt, um, uh, by all accounts, the relationship with Vertec is a solid one. So we wanted to continue just for a continuity and the ability, the fact that it was already a recommendation within the existing. I mean, it's already a term within the existing agreement, which is why we made that recommendation. So you didn't even answer my question. Well, I, I believe I, I believe I did in the sense that we did not negotiate any other element of the of the rate structure. It was only solely focused. My question was, can you go back? I, I and did, do we have to vote on this today? So the, today the action before you is the notice of intent to release the, the notice. So okay. really no action is other than actually having the staff prepare the notice, send it out so that we have the public hearing. However, if we're not comfortable with the option, then we, we should take a step back and present the option that the council wants, and that would just push back our schedule. So today's action is, is really just to issue the notice. If it's option two, if it's option one or option three, we will adjust the notice in the rate structure to accommodate the, the actual rate that's selected. So now I have a question. When, when the, can I go council member count? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, so you're, through, this, through this 218 requirement, you're, you're looking for direction on a specific rate that would be noticed to the rate payers? Oh, okay. Yeah. So that might make things a little difficult because now we're a little iffy. Because, uh, like Councilmember Alexander, we're trying to soften the blow of essentially uh, a state mandate passed down to us for organic waste. And so. And by the way, it's an uh, unfunded mandate. Unfunded. Government. So this, is, this is coming state from State of California doesn't provide any incentive to the local. Yeah. So, agency. Um, so uh, look, there's. there's safety measures in place with option two on the caps for service and disposal um, and that is over a five year now i want to know on the two things that help drive those numbers down first one is extending the contract over a 10-year period so that there can be a subsidized rate so that the, that the that the rate increases at a slower pace as opposed to as steep as it is presently here so the 10-year put that on there as as a hybrid of option two so the caps on the service, caps on the, on the disposal for the five year, the 10 year, and the option of the smaller bin. Those are, those are two concrete components that could help drive down the cost for the rate payer. Um, so I would hope that if the council is on board with trying to soften the blow of these costs from these state mandates, that we support this motion. So that's my motion. Okay, well, uh, Mr. Arrigan is here. M Mr. Arrigan, can you join us at the microphone here? He's our Burtek uh, lead expert, and we thank you, uh, Mr. So, Burtek, for. So, question to to you, sir. Um, at the end of this, if say we do this five year extension, would we not go back to well to whatever another uh, waste management company and get another franchise fee when they want to do services in our in our city? 
Wouldn't that be the case? So at the end of the at the end of the five year term after the extension going into 2031, uh, at that point, staff would prepare to potentially RFP the, the, the service. Right, yes. but when we got this service, they paid a franchise fee, I believe of $5 million, Mike? How, how much, is that what they paid us? A franchise fee when they first came aboard? Mayor, mm -hmm. t was it 10 million? 13 million. <laughs> well, just, it's not a franchise fee, it's a buyout fee, right? You'll have yeah. your own operation. Yeah, because the franchise fees are built into the agreement. Yeah. Are you talking about when you first um, uh, privatized your services, they basically paid you a fee to buy out the right, right so to it's called some like I think they call it a franchise fee. Or uh, the franchise fee is actually an ongoing fee that the law allows you to charge. It's just a, for the privilege of doing business here. But when you first go out and privatize your services, oftentimes a city will negotiate both the buyout fee, because okay. you're, you're selling your business. If you are doing your own operation, you sold your operations. And then there's an addition to that, a franchise fee which is the right to, to operate in your city and to do business in your city. Do we, I don't know what your percentage yes. is now, but it's... So the franchise phase is built into the rate calculation as well. So uh, we do have a representative to, uh, from Vertec who could provide a little more insight into that as well. Mr. Ergen. Very good, Mayor and uh, Council. Thank you very much, Mike Ergen, Vertec Waste Industries. <clears throat> um, we have worked with staff for quite a long time in coming to this, this point. With regard to um, meeting compliance issues with 1383, I believe this, <clears throat> please excuse me, I have a bit of a raw throat. Um, I believe this council was here when we um, uh, had Calvary Cycle come down and make a presentation to council. Um, myself and one of my associates also made a presentation with regard to AB 1383 or SB 1383, um, and the program to this point still has not been implemented. Uh, the target date was January 1 of 2022. <clears throat> it is in the city's best interest to put this program forward. We developed a program and presented it to staff. Um, other than that, we would have our normal annual adjustment. Since this was being worked on and, and moving forward, we had no adjustment in uh, July of this year. And we created um, a series of options uh, that um, would give the council a, a choice. Um, what what uh, Mr. Hernandez was trying to explain is the way that the rates are, are uh, developed right now, there is a 5% cap <clears throat> on the entire rate. So to give you an example, if the disposal cost to pick up a residential home is $8 a month, we are only getting compensated $4.75. And that, that shortfall, we're allowed to roll it over to the next year, but in combination with CPI increases, you never catch that up. So what we had asked is if we could remove that cap from the only the disposal and processing components so that if it cost us a dollar we are able to recuperate a dollar not a dollar ten but not eighty cents <clears throat> that was that was the proposal in item three in item two we left it as it is um, in option two I should say however <clears throat> With the five-year extension, we would hold the costs of the 22-23 uh, rate increase. That was over $9 jump from the current rate <clears throat> to what that rate would be. Uh, quite a savings to the, to the residents. However, in the subsequent years, it goes back to the full price. Um, we, had this, we had developed other models, very similar to what um, Councilman was, uh, Sanchez was talking about with um, a greatly reduced rate. However, those costs have to be recuperated over a longer period of time. So what we had asked staff, and, and, and um, it's still on the table, I believe, that we could still discuss is, is to, uh, uh, could possibly increase uh, that term. Uh, so that's out there. So I agree, agree with uh, uh, Councilman Sanchez, that there are um, 
uh, options that are out there that will greatly reduce the rate, but spread it over a period of time so that we can amortize out those costs. Um, the, um, the implementation of 1383 could happen as soon as, as soon as this number goes out and it's advertised, um, the soonest we can come back with that program, once it's approved by the council, uh, would be February or March of next year. We are working with Calvary Cycle to get waivers or excuses, uh, or for them to excuse us, excuse me, um, from, from implementing that program until it's approved by council. Um, so, so when you send out, what we're looking at tonight is sending out a 218 notice that would have the maximum rate could be charged. When we come back at, at a later point in time, I think February 15th, it could be a program that is much less, but it couldn't be any more. And that's the notice that's, that would be going out, and that is the recommendation in option two. I know it's very confusing, there's a lot of information out there, but I'd be happy to answer questions that might clarify things. You just made it a lot easier for us, because now we don't have to have an exact number. So our cap can be, if we were to go with option two, our cap is the exactly. is the, the five-year program with the caps on the service, caps on disposal, and we know that's at most. Then you can go ahead and bring this back, but you can also go ahead and bring us back an option four with, a, with the five-year extension, 10 years total, as opposed to the one five-year extension. If five five-year extension, yeah. 10 years. Yeah, so that and my little, and our little bins. Yes. Our little bins at a, at a, at a cheaper rate. Right. So, so I, would, I would support staff's recommendation, option two. Um, and, um, and then maybe the direction if, if uh, the council would like us to, to present additional numbers. Yeah, basically so, a cheaper option. So if I, I may, for regards to that conversation, so uh, a 10-year option was uh, discussed uh, and, and provided to staff, but to stay with the, uh, with the original terms of the agreement, which allowed a five-year extension, is why we didn't propose that, it, just to stay consistent with the agreement. But if it is the council's... Uh, you know, wish to bring this back with a potential ten-year um, or two five-year extensions, then uh, we can we can prepare. And if we don't feel comfortable, we tell them, "Hey, look, thanks thanks for offering cheaper numbers, but we'll pay more expensive rates." And so, I want I want staff to bring us the options. Bring us the options. Bring us the five-year option. Bring us the ten-year option. The small bins, and notice it at option two with the caps on service. Notice it with with the option two rates. I see my our city attorney getting funky. What? I just think that if you're going to notice your residents and you're going to provide them Prop 218 notice, you can't have a lot of wiggle room in that. You've got to tell your, you're talking about two apples and oranges. You're talking about contractual terms in your contract. And what we brought you tonight was what do we notice under Prop 218 to our residents? Because the residents have a right to be told or the customers have a right to be told how much they might be charged for the service, and they have a right to come and file a protest. And so it's gonna be hard for them if they don't know that number. That's why we noticed the 218, the 218 notice with the option two, with those caps in there, right? Can, can we not do that? Because that will be an option, we can't do that? So we have to agree on an option, because that's what will be um, given to the re residents and the uh, 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 commercial, uh, so commercial we're basically, customers. We're, so we're not only just doing deciding on the 218 notice. We are also basically deciding on a rate. So you will you will ratify that decision after the public hearing. So option two will be formally presented to the council after you've hear, heard the testimony for any anyone who chooses to speak on the item. So today's item is to allow staff to move with option two to notice that um, after 45 day, days, and we come back in February when we actually have the public hearing. That's when the council can actually take action on accepting yes. option two. See, in a normal Prop 218 situation, in a normal situation where you have a contract, Prop 218 says that the service haulers, you can do CPI increases for up to five years for, before you have to go back and get approval from your residents. So in a normal situation, your staff would be able to say to you, We're gonna, we propose to increase the rates by 14%. And by increasing it by 14%, it's going to be $27.32 a month. And then you would take that number and you would notice it. What is complicating this scenario is you already have rates agreed to by a contract that was entered into 2016, but you have this new law that went into effect. 
that new law is having, because you got to comply with the new law, <laughs> your service provider has said to you, hey folks, this is how much it's going to cost us to implement the new law, and this is how much your, your, our customers' rates have to go up to implement the new law. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, the, that's very easy. What I think happened, because I'm talking with Dan here, is that they were looking at ways and options, your, your provider and staff, of easing your residents into that rate. And in order to do that, you started to have some contractual revisions as well. So tonight, you're only here to decide what the rate is so that he can notice it, but it may require changes to the contract amendment as well if you're talking about about um, pushing those rates off over the five or 10 years. So we, if we we're gonna talk about maybe considering a different option, we would have to hold off on the 218 notice. That, that is correct. We would have to bring back basically another item where we just talk about option two and a potential option four. And at that point, once the council makes that decision, then we can notice it. So we'll just have to shift the dates. What and do we, you guys think? Should we, should we wait and try to wait out for small or for, for less rates or go with the option two? Option two with the five-year extension, with the with the staff recommendation. I can go with that. I have I have some comments or questions. Okay, um, uh, council member, hold on, uh, Councilman Alexander, your option two is that your motion? Yes, sir. Okay, is there a support? Yeah, with the five-year recommendation. Support by Sanchez, Council Member Barra. Yes, Mr. Mike, com I commend you on the work that you do. Thank you me. are very responsive. However, I still get complaints from my constituents, quite a bit. And, I, and every year I mention them to you. One of them is a the street sweeper. Mm -hmm. They go straight to the middle of the street. I, I'm just, I'm just, if, don't interrupt me. <laughs> um, and the recent one, I, I don't know if there's something we can do about the customer service, because if we're gonna present these increases to our constituents, they're, they're not gonna be happy. They're not happy right absolutely, now. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I believe when we, first contracted with Vertec, they were paying $20 a month for the refuse service. Oh, and right. and wow. with these five additional years that we're adding now, it's, on, it's more than doubled than what they were originally paying when refuse was with the city. So how, how um, so what we're improving right now are these increases and you're gonna ask for the citizens themselves to come here and protest the, the amounts? Well, through the 218 process, you notice, then you hold a protest hearing, and that's in February. Now, in other cities that I've been in, we've advertised a program. In between, there's a 45-day gap. In between that gap, and, and again, I am not an attorney, <clears throat> but I've worked with a number of cities that we've come back with because council says, hey, let's, let's see if we can find something that works and might be a little more acceptable. Uh, at the protest hearing, then that option is also discussed, either the one that was advertised or anything less. And uh, nine times out of ten, it's the, it's the lesser cost. Um, so I don't believe you are saddled with the absolute 218 costs that are advertised. That is the maximum that can be charged and the program accordingly. But you can or we could come back with a lesser rate with different terms, and is for the council's review and approval. That's the way I've worked with other cities, but again, I, I don't want to be in conflict with your attorney. Okay, and, and, but the, the hearing will be held with us. Oh, absolutely, council. correct. So as, as recommended, it would be on uh, February 3rd. Okay, I, I mean, I- oh, Excuse I, me, February 15th, sorry. Yeah, and, and I'm also single, and I don't even fill up my trash cans at all. And we're paying for all three receptacles every single month, month after month. We, we and, have, and, and, and as... we have senior citizens on fixed income that this is going to really hurt their wallets. I'm, yeah. I'm very concerned. Okay, let, let, me, let me argue the case here. On the notice of filing, you have various rates, Mr. Uh, Bertek. Commercial barrel is 26. It's much lower. There's a mobile home barrel. There's all sorts of other barrels available. The resident, it's incumbent upon the resident, they need to take ownership and call in the customer service center and say, hey, I'm in a mobile home or whatever, do you have a smaller barrel? Do, they, do residents have that option? They don't right now. They do that, not. That is, that is the point that Councilman Sanchez is making. So we are going to make available, at least I'll give to staff, um, right now they have a 95 gallon trash barrel. Everybody's familiar with the big black barrel. And you're issued it. 
You're issued it. You, yes. You got it. 95 gallon. It. We also offer a 35 gallon container, which is very similar right, to. Right, that's on your rate sheet. Um, that's right here. Okay. Residential's 35 gallon barrel. Okay. Then, then because I know that um, Councilman Sanchez has asked for that in the past, um, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I didn't know that we had put that on. $31.87 versus $37.97. Okay. okay. So it's a yes. Um, so that's the other is the 35 gallon. So uh, um, I think we had had a conversation on that, and I apologize. I didn't know we got that put in. So that was good. It's there. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second, folks. Option number two, cast your votes. Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? No. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Councilmember Sherat? Councilmember Kelvin? No. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Okay, the motion passes four to two with Councilmember Ibarra and Kelvin voting in opposition. Okay, thank, thank you. you thank you very much uh, to our partner, Birdtech. Thank you for your t presentation tonight, Mr. Ergen. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Okay, uh, this is item number nine. This is a ward design build contract for the Carousel Mall demol demolition. Uh, the staff report is there. The approval and the recommendation is there before you. It's sixfold. Um, we have heard the complaints, the comments, and the suggestions from our council. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just, because uh, we, we need to keep moving here. It's already midnight. Uh, council, what say you? you? We've had a lot of banter back and forth. This has reflected what uh, the council has decided to bring this back for 30 days and review. Uh, what say you, council? Uh, so I know some, um, some concerns were, were voiced during public comment. Uh, if you could address those, also concerns about the, uh, about the material, the asbestos, the lead paint in the building, how the, what the mitigation plan is for that. Um, we want to make sure that if this is being done, it's being done right. Um, usually we think, oh, the more you pay, the better the quality. And this may be a case where that's, that's not quite, quite true. Sure. We may be getting a good deal for, for a cheaper rate, but you need to prove that to us right now that that's going to be in fact the case. And I'm, I'm happy to do that. So we have worked with the resources, the um, recommended contractor. And in the staff report, we've gone through all the mitigation efforts and uh, check references and really stand behind staff's decision. But I think it's best that we bring up the representatives from resource to exactly explain how we're addressed those, those concerns. So if I, if I may, I, I think we still have members of the, um, they're still in the audience, so we're gonna ask them to, uh, to come up to the mic. I missed it the first time, I missed it the second. I apologize, I'm getting up in three and a half hours to go to work. <laughs> so, um, is there any direct questions or would you like me to talk about our process of the mitigation yeah. efforts? I have a question. Um, did you guys do an asbestos uh, analysis of the mall? Yes. I I, f I feel that what set us apart from our competitors and our pricing is that Resource completed over 200 samples of the mall for asbestos. We checked every nook and cranny, every inch of the mall, the roofs, the fireproofing, the floors, the debris, the contamination throughout the mall. Looking through the other reports of our competitors, the most we saw was 25 samples taken. So in your, in your sample taking, did you find asbestos in, in the mall and, and lead? Yes, we have extensive uh, hazardous materials throughout the mall, but by our testing and completing the survey, we know these uh, regulated hazardous materials, where they are, what they are, and we work closely with South Coast Air Quality Management District on all our jobs, and uh, this is what we do every day. And from what I understand, that once once we I'm sorry about the television. No, no, you're good. I'm sorry about the television. I can talk loud too. Uh, okay, that's okay. Uh, but once uh, once from what I understand, once you uh, you destroy the demolition demolition. Uh, 
demolish them all. Or, uh, et, de demolish. Thank you. Whew. Lord have mercy. Demolish them all. Don't Doesn't the city it has a responsibility when you even move it to uh, another location for disposal? Doesn't the city still have a responsibility? Well, well, the process of, of the project would be the abatement of all the asbestos regulated materials. That's an extensive hazmat procedure that, that is governed by not only a third party consultant that watches us, but also the air quality management district. That also involves the transportation of the disposals of the hazardous materials with a licensed regulated hauler and going to a licensed regulated landfill such as waste management, Arizona, you have one in Azusa, you have some in Nevada. I don't want to cut you off of all, all yeah. the Arizona places. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. But the question is, is, is the city still responsible once you move it to some other location for a period of time? Yes, well, well, no. Well, all regulated materials, I believe there's a cradle to grave. So meaning that you own the material no matter how you do it or when you do it. I mean, it, it, it's with all hazardous materials. So that's a, is that in short a yes? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. You ain't got to get all that. Just just yes or no. I appreciate it. Environmental reports. Phase two. Have did you guys do a phase two subterranean environmental report? That's not part of the scope for this RFP. So then, how do you know what's down there? So, so the phase two is for underground um, soil contaminated materials, yes. and that's not part of this project. So my question is, how do you know what's down there? So how can you make a proper bid if you don't know what's down there? If I can, uh, Councilman, that's not part of their scope. So they're only affecting what's above the surface. Right, I, I, I understand that, but this is just a question. If you don't do a phase two, and you don't know what's down there, how can you make a proper bid on demolit? Oh my God, <laughs> we can't do it tonight. That's a D word. Demolish the mall, thank you, yes. thank you. Keep throwing that D word out there. Can Demolish Councilman. the mall if you don't know what's down there. Does that not make sense? Councilman, I can answer that question. The, the, the answer is we did a proper bid for the materials that were tested. They're all above ground. The proposal, the design build proposal does not include Below ground mitigation. I, 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 I think that answer. No, I, I, I really have a simple question. Phase two is the chemical, and when you go below ground subterranean, right, and you do that, and if the, we have the the two auto to two auto buildings that are there, how do you know how much is it going to cost to demolish that and remove that? If you don't know, if you don't do the, the test, the phase two, how do you know? So as part of the development process, when the actual subsurface will be disturbed, they will, if they, there is contamination in the surface, it will have to be mitigated by, by the, the developer who is going to actually do the work of disturbing the ground. Right now, resource of what's on the table is for them to just demolish the building, to have it ready for a future developer. So the phase two is not needed at this point because of the fact that we are not removing dirt or disturbing the dirt to, uh, for a future development. Right now, the, the, uh, the proposal that you have before you and what they propose, the amount they propose is to demolish the building and the two adjacent buildings. And that's it? Yes. So what about, so what about the contaminants in the, in, in the ground? What about if we have that? So as, as, if there is that, then obviously the phase one has identified certain, a more extensive uh, study would need to be done, but that will be done as part of the development process. So, so with, this de with this demolition of the above surface, um, does it irritate, move, disturb underground in doing that process? So I'll, I'll defer that question too. I think probably, the, I think the, the question would be, when you're going through the demolition process, to what extent are the soils disturbed and how far down do those soils get disturbed by, I don't know, equipment on the property, watering things down? Is that, I, just to clarify, I think that's the question. 
in the areas where there is um, suspect for contamination below ground, those areas will not be disturbed by virtue of leaving slabs on the ground. So nothing will change from what exists there now in the suspect areas. How, how do you know where the suspect areas are? Just where the automotive From, from the phase one that, that you provided. So, so the, the, the as, as indicated, the phase one did identify some potential zones that would require further testing, but they're all really outside the area of the mall. My question is, is how is your bid significantly lower than other um, demolition companies that are in your, you know, they're in your field. These are your competitors, right? Uh, why, how is it possible that your bid would be such significantly less? So it's a, it's a design build proposal rather than a low bid proposal. The answer to your question is we took, we believe, many, many, many more samples of material to understand better what needs to be removed and remediated and disposed versus making very large and very dramatic assumptions for what exists throughout the mall. And I think this, this is evident if you look at the proposals, um, one of our competitors that uh, included it all in their proposal, the most we saw reviewing everybody's proposal is 25 samples. That, that contractor took those 25 samples and then highlighted areas as assumed asbestos containing materials. Resource took the much, much extra steps and identified all the actual asbestos containing materials and took well over 200 samples. Which, and that, and, and that approach of the assumed is very typical in uh, demolition and abatement projects that are not design build. People, if a, if a city wants a mall demolished, they say, assume this, because they're typically not taking as many samples. And so th that is a standard approach that apparently the other proposers took by virtue of making assumptions about what material exists there and what material does not exist there. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other further questions? Uh, Councilman Charette. I'm just gonna st state uh, again kind of for the record that my concern is just the complete disparity in, in the bids. And I know you'll have an answer for that. Um, I would if I was in your position. Um, and you're bonded, and if something happens uh, and you can't finish the job for the seven million seven point eight that you've, then then you leave us with a real mess, potentially. But we get the bonding, we get the insurance money, so to speak. Um, but we've still got a real problem there um, if you're not able to finish. Um, and we want to finish, of course. And I uh, and I've been accused uh, lately of uh, wanting something different to happen at that mall, which is just absolutely ludicrous and not true. I want to see that thing done, probably as much as anybody here. And I certainly want to get it done for the lowest uh, reasonable and and. Um, What's the term they use? Uh, responsible bid. And um, I don't have any reason to doubt you, except that in my experience in business, um, if I would be real concerned about a bid that was, at, in this case, half of the next closest bid. It's half of the next closest, and it goes up to 29 million from there. So from $7 million to $29 million with all qualified vendors, I, I just really have a problem with that. I just do. I hope you can understand that. Um, I, I certainly would like to get it done for $5 million. But uh, you get my point. We want to get it done as cheaply as possible. But 
I, I just don't personally, for my vote, don't feel comfortable supporting a, a bid that is so far off the off base. And you've done actually more work. Kelsey. I mean, you're going to do you're going to do you're doing more work, and you're not not even getting half of of what the next lowest bid is. Kelsey, Mr. Brett, can yeah. I can I maybe help you out right yeah. here? I think that I might have found something um, with the AM, what is it? Uh, AMCO. AM, AMCO. Mm. Um, on page four. Let me see. Hold on just one moment. I think I might have missed it. Can we go back? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, AMCO, I believe I understand why. In phase four, they um, have above grade demolition, and then they have a phase five below grade excavation and demolition. So that must be the reason why. So you don't have that in yours, correct? Because you just said that you're not touching anything underneath the ground, but this may be why the other companies have listed that in their report. So. Why is it in their report? Why, why did they present that? We accepted that, but yet they're not working underneath the ground. Okay, uh, resource? So can I answer both questions? Sure, let's, let's go, okay, let's do it. So, you know, to start with, resource can bond over $50 million. Um, that takes, you know, we have over 200 employees. Um, we're on a project right now for LA County, it's almost $14 million, 105 buildings with procedure five hazardous material abatement in every single one of them. So this is what we do every day. We've mentioned it over and over. The reason our bid and our, our design build proposal is less is because of our due diligence, which is I've been harping on is the 200 samples. The other companies are making assumptions that everything is hot. And by us doing our due diligence and taking our 200 samples as if it was a real survey and a bid that you handed to us, we went ahead and took those steps. The other companies are taking 25 samples and making assumptions. There's no assumptions here. We've done our work. We know what's hot. We know what we're getting into. That's the easy say of why our bid is where our bid is. We have the information to do the job right. As far as AMCO, what they're referring to is the excavation of the footings and the, the underground of, of, of the concrete. We have that in our bid. They are not referring to the excavation and removal or remediation of contaminated soil. They are referring to the below ground demolition of the concrete. The other difference is between our price and theirs is that they're removing the concrete off site. That's a few million dollars in itself. We're crushing. We design build this and we do this on many, many projects. We design build it to crush the concrete, recycling it for the community, for this county, the cities, and using that crushed material on site for soil stabilization and for drainage. Just, just a question. So you're not, there's a foundation and you're including eliminating that foundation. You're not just knocking down the four walls and leaving a pad. Abs absolutely. And so, we're so crushing the material to three quarter inch rock, which your future development will use absolutely and leaving it on site in piles yet yeah, we're no we're sp we're spreading it on the soil to create soil stabilization and water control runoff for your sweeps okay. so when you're ready to build you're in good shape then how do so we do, do phase do two and go under they bore right through it right oh, through the okay. crushed concrete without a problem Thank so you. You what do you do with the con what do you do with the asbestos? The asbestos is, is before any any work is to begin, we submit to the SCAQMD, 
They regulate the, the, the project. They're aware of everything that comes, goes on. They come in and do their inspections. There's a separate consultant that comes in, watches every day on a daily basis, and so we So are you saying removal? Yes. Are, are you saying removal? Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank yes. you. So it, it, I'm, I think, though, still, point to be made to Councilman Charette's point is why your bid is so different is because you're not doing all of the work that is listed here above the ground because they're talking about removing utilities, um, uh, demolish and remove the concrete, asphalt, paving, gutters, boundaries, all of that, excavate and remove underground utilities within the building footprints, cap the sewer laterals, final grading to provide, it to be, to provide site drainage per the requirements of SWPPP to provide drainage towards the pit left behind from the demolition since no material is to be left on site or imported from outside of the job site. So it seems like we have a total different plan for the other developer, uh, demolished companies, than what we have for resource. Or we changed it somehow or another. If Why would they submit all of these details, all, uh, all of this work, and resource does not have to. So I spoke to our city engineer and each of the uh, qualified proposals were told that crushing on site was a possibility. And it, I it's, think- It's more I, than just, I think it's more than just the crushing on site. Council person, I think you've just outlined a design build proposal versus a standard lowest apparent bidder process, which is not what the city undertook here. What the city undertook is a design build proposal which the contractors were responsible for designing the project and what work was gonna go on as part of the city's key objectives. And I will say that everything you're saying that they're doing, we are doing. We're doing it in a different manner. We're taking out the utilities. We're, we're, ta we're capping the sewers. We're doing all that work, the same as them. The difference is, is we're crushing on site. So th this is, we did check with planning before obviously allowing that uh, provision. So we did check with the uh, planning department and we did, uh, there was, since this is a, a government building, uh, there is uh, um, an, an allowance to do that. Th this is at crushing it's concrete. It's where's it's where's that allowance? Where's that allowance? It's, it's exempt. I mean, I, I, I could defer to- Where's uh, that our, allowance? Because that's going to need to be, where's that allowance? Because I don't even see where it says that they're going to be crushing on site anywhere in there. It's, uh, it's part of our pricing. It's included in our pricing. And I will say that 99% of our projects for military, uh, cities, counties, municipalities, ask us to crush on site. We just, El Camino College, we just crushed 15,000 tons. Santa Monica College, 14,000 tons. We're, we're, we, we crush we, on most every job that they allow it because it is recycling and it, is impair, it saves the city and the new development tons of money to reuse this crushed concrete. It keeps trucks off the road. It and it's part of the environmental plan, the yes. climate action plan. That well, the it's part of the mitigation right. plan by keeping trucks off the road as well Correct. as saving costs. You're filling up landfills by taking concrete to their landfills. We're trying to eliminate filling our landfills and recycling. Resource recycles an average of 95% or greater on our Just projects. with respect to the bidder, I don't think the issue for them is the environmental policy issue. The issue is whether their current land use regulations allow it to occur. There could be many good reasons for it to occur. And I don't think we'd argue with you that there are good reasons. I think the point that's being made is, can, any, can anybody in this community, given their current zoning rules, crush on site? And would accommodations have to be made to your code to allow it? That's, I think that's the question. We're no one's arguing with you now. that you're doing it the better way. And I think staff's going to answer that question. So yeah, there is, uh, I, I think I heard a comment, that is a, an item that is gonna be considered by the planning commission. And obviously uh, we, uh, we can defer to the uh, CED to actually articulate a little, a little further on what the intent is there. Uh, but it, this was a, a conversation that we had prior to pre presenting this as an option. Okay, uh, thank you. Very comprehensive, thank you, resource. We appreciate the uh, back and forth and the questions being answered. Very good questions from our city council. We appreciate it. 
Okay, uh, the matter is there before you, council members. Um, will I entertain a motion for uh, approval? Move to approve. Okay, move to approve staff recommendations, sir. Is that right? Second. Okay, and there's a second by Sanchez. Members, cast your votes. Councilmember Kelvin and Alexandra, your vote. Motion passes five to one with Councilmember Kelvin voting in opposition. Okay, it passes, folks. Um, a moment to celebrate. Thank you. Thank you, Resource, and thank you, City Council, for your support of this. Uh, and thank you, and thank you for our Don't city. Don't bother going to bed. Thank you. you Got to get up three hours. <laughs> thank you to city staff, uh, city manager. Thank you. This is a, this is a step forward. Okay, let's uh, move on, folks. This is item number ten, Belmont Residential Subdivision Project. I have a verbiage here. Bear with. Um, I'm opening the public hearing at 12.20 a.m. Um, we'll have the opportunity for a staff report, although, um, do we have any members of the public wishing to address or speak on this item, item number 10? Hearing none. No, we do not. Um, thank you. Members, um, We'll go ahead and suspend uh, the presentation. Is there a motion to entertain? Move to approve. Okay, I'll close it at 12.21 a.m. Motion to I'll approve start. by Sanchez, second by Charette. Members cast your votes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, uh, item number 11, this is an urgency ordinance, Development Code Amendment 22-07. The time is approximately 12.22 a.m. Um, staff report on this item is available. However, uh, do we have any members of the public wishing to address the public, uh, the council on item number 11? Item number 11. Hearing none, we will entertain a motion. Move to approve. Motion by Sanchez. Second by Figueroa. Any other final comments or questions? Okay, members, cast your votes. Mayor, I need to read the title of the ordinance into the record. So okay. It's ordinance number MC1604, Urgency Ordinance of the Mayor City Council of the City of San Bernardino, California, approving Development Code Amendment 22-07, amending Chapter 19.04, Residential Zones, Section 19.04.03, Subsection 2P, Accessory Dwelling Units, of Title 19 Development Code of the City of San Bernardino Municipal Code and finding this such action statutorily exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. Okay, I'm now closing the public hearing at 1223 a.m. for deliberation. We have a motion. Members cast your votes. Sorry, who made the motion? And the second? Figueroa. Okay, take a voice vote on this one, please. Council Member Sanchez? Yes. Council Member Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Councilmember Charette? Yes. Councilmember Kelvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Item number 12 to adopt a new purchasing policy and introduce ordinance number MC1605 amending section 3.04 of the municipal code. The recommendation is twofold, and it's there before you, council members. The time is approximately 12.24 a.m., and I'm opening it 
for consideration. We have staff available for a report. However, let's pull the uh, community. Any uh, members of public wishing to address the council on item number 12? City no. clerk? No. None? Okay. Uh, I'll entertain a motion for approval. Is there a motion for uh, approval? Yes, I would like to add something. Um, and this is so that the public's aware, council's aware. Uh, are we upping the signing signing authority for the city manager per slash purchasing agent? Um, we are not adding signing authority for the purchasing manager because mm -hmm. when we researched other municipalities, we found that the purchasing manager and people in purchasing generally did not have purchasing authority themselves. Mm -hmm. They were the internal control. Mm -hmm. They were the people who like approved the purchases and verified that everyone was doing it correctly. So to give them authority would create an issue with internal control and we would have to then have somebody else basically overseeing them or we would have to have a larger purchasing staff and fewer people with authority. And what we found with municipalities was that generally you had some level of authority at the director level and then a higher level at the city manager and fewer purchasing staff that were more in an internal control function. So that's the model that we did and we did um, Department or agency directors up to 50,000, 50,001 to 100,000. Well, I mean, city manager could go zero to 100,000 would be city manager authority, and anything over that would require council authority. So, uh, what is it currently for the city manager? Currently, city manager is up to 49,999. So, with this action, it would then allow him or her. Mm -hmm. to go up to $100,000? Yes. So this is the change? Yes. That's okay. Right. So um, I know that this was per, per the, uh, what was it, our strategy of adjustment um, through bankruptcy. Uh, the bankruptcy court actually recommended this sort of move. Um, it allows us to be more nimble, uh, and I'm fine with that, but I will be adding something because at the end of the day, we are responsible to make sure Mm -hmm. that the money is properly being spent. And if we're not properly noticed, we'll never know. Uh, so I would like that when the, what is it, what do we call them, those director, deputy directors? What do we call them again? The agency, agency or directors. department directors. So agency directors and city manager, when they, um, when they make those expenditures, um, use their signing authority above, we need a minimum. 50,000. No, no, no. So. Yeah, so it's going from 50000 to 100000 for the city manager. But we don't want him, if he spends 50 cents on a piece of gum, you know, we don't want him having to apply that in a report that comes out quarterly for the council to review. Yes. No, 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 no. We want, we want below that. I would want something. What's a good number? Give us a 25, good number. 25000 All right, 25000 Well, actually, what we have in the policy is that over 40000 requires a formal bid, and so that might be a good threshold would be anything that's requiring a formal bid, or you could use as a threshold instead like anything that's contracted. Wait, 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 so mm -hmm. 80, okay, 80,000, okay, so everything will be require a formal bid above 40,000. Oh, and then a formal bid, would that have, that doesn't always come for council for approval. It doesn't, does it? Are there cases that it doesn't, though? Other, no, it can, there's plenty of cases where that's happened, but, the city manager can up to, up to that. Well, with this new policy, could spend up to nine hundred ninety-nine thousand without coming to council for approval. So I would like those signatures, the, for those approvals, to show up on a quarterly report, so that the money doesn't get spent, and we never know that it got spent. Right? We would. I would really prefer if on a quarterly report, hey, over the last quarter, the city manager and the deputy agency director, whatever the, it's called. Um, this is, this is where they used their spending authority. We used to get those, yeah, the published reports, and they happen on a quarterly basis. We used to get those, and we used to be able to question the city manager, hey, why did you go ahead and spend money here? Um, In the same way right that you get like a check register or the payroll register, no, that kind of. Yeah. So yeah, we need to, if we can add that, that would be my amendment um, to this and then approval and on and a quarterly basis. Would you like it to be 
just contracted things or what would we like the threshold to be? Oh, yeah. Um, oh. Well, Mr. Sanchez, hold on. Let me help you, Councilman. I think, I think the other way to do this is not only do that belt and suspender approach is to also include on the city manager's update. He gives us a bi-monthly or bi-weekly update. Couldn't he just add a chart there of what he spent that exceeds that threshold? It Excel, would be one or Excel spreadsheet like on yeah. that too? Is just that for as part of his financial report and his uh, report to the count mayor and council, he reports it there on that report. Well, not just the not just the city manager. I want the directors to do it as well. Okay, that's fine. Directors the, do the directors well. report to the city manager, so the city manager has the authority. He's signing off on any of that. Right, but so included on the on the biweekly report. So directors as well. That keeps it more current than the quarterly or whenever we do get the deal. We Which by the way, we never do get it. We always we can, ask for it, but we never get it. Right. We can do we can either do it quarterly or we can do it at the same time that we do the check registers, the payroll registers, and the uh, investment well, report, well, which is usually separately? monthly. Because otherwise they, they get lost in there. Right. They get lost in there. Have you seen those? Can it be There's, yeah, it needs to be. Can we just get it with the city manager's report? That's what you should do. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's just easier to get it and it's, yeah. and with it's the more current. With the director's. So what's the bottom? What's the what's the floor and what's the ceiling? Obviously, we know what the ceiling is. The ceiling's there. But the what's, forty thousand. Forty thousand. Are we going forty thousand? Forty thousand is good for me. What the right? Who's making the motion? Is it full? Is there a motion to that effect, Councilman? I made the motion. Okay. Second. Second by Kelvin. With those caveats, members cast your votes. Council Member Alexander, do you want to give me your voice vote? Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you very much. Can I just clarify one yeah. point? You're not asking that that be codified in the municipal code. You're just asking that we do that. Okay, because then that will, okay, then we'll bring this back in January and then it'll be effective at the end of February. Because this will count as a significant, this will count as a significant change to, to this. All right, then I guess we'll just bring it back, huh? Okay. All right. All right. Okay, great. Um, item number 13, public hearing on annexation number 25, the Community Facilities District 2019-1. Uh, this is six staff recommendations there is a long public hearing script i'll be quick folks the public hearing is to consider annexation proceedings and elections for the city of san Bernardino, cfd district number 2019-1 annexation number 25 it's now open do any council members wish to hear the staff report hearing none do any members of the council have any questions of staff or wish to make any comments Hearing none. Okay, we'll now receive protests from the uh, from um, the community. Comments, protests, questions from many persons in the audience who wish to speak and address this matter. Each person is addressed uh, may address the city council for a maximum of three minutes. Is there any members of the public wishing to do so? Okay, uh, has the city clerk received any written protests? I have received zero written protests. Okay, uh, Ms. City Clerk, are there any persons registered to vote within Annexation 25 of Community Facilities District 2019-1? The County of San Bernardino Registrar of Voters has certified that there are no registered voters within Annexation Number 25 of Community Facilities District Number 2019-1. Okay, I now declare the public hearing closed, the time being approximately 12.33 p.m. May I please have a motion to adopt the Resolution 2022-247 of the Mayor's City Council? 
Um, calling an election to submit to the qualified electors a question of levying a special tax within the area proposed to be annexed to CFD District Number 2019-1, Annexation Number 25. Is there a motion? I'll move to approve. Okay. Figaro, I'm sorry, uh, Charette and Abara, the city clerk. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Councilmember Sherat? Yes. Councilmember Kelvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, now may I have a motion please to adopt the resolution 2022-248 of the Mayor City Council and City Council of the City of San Bernardino declaring election results for Community Facilities District 2019-1 Annexation number 25. So motion, motion to approve. Move to approve. Calvin second. and Charette on a second. Um, I need to read this statement. The official ballots have been open and all votes are in favor of the proposition presented on the ballot and the election is now closed. Okay. Council member Sanchez? Yes. Council member Ibarra? Yes. Council member Figueroa? Yes. Council member Charette? Yes. Council member Calvin? Yes. Council member Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, I'd now ask for a motion to waive further reading and introduce by title only ordinance number 20, I'm sorry, uh, MC 1606 of the Mayor and City Council, amending ordinance MC 1522 and levying special taxes to be collected during fiscal year 2022-23 to pay for the annual cost of the maintenance and servicing of landscaping, lighting, water, uh, quality improvements, graffiti, streets, street sweeping, parks, trail maintenance, and a reserve fund for capital replacement and administrative expenses with respect to the facilities district number 2019-1 maintenance services. Is there a motion? Move approval. Charette? Second. Sanchez on the second. All right. Council Member Sanchez? Yes. Council Member Ibarra? Yes. Council Member Figueroa? Yes. Council Member Charette? Yes. Council Member Calvin? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, great. Uh, this is um, item number 14, public hearing on annexation 21 to Community Facilities District 2019-1. Um, the recommendation is there before the council. Um, this is item number 14. 14. The public hearing to consider annexation proceedings and elections for City of San Bernardino Community Facilities District 2019-1 Maintenance Services. Annexation number 21 is now open, the time being 10, 12.36 a.m. Uh, any council members wish to hear the staff report? Do any members of the City Council have any questions of staff or wish to make any comments? Okay, we will now receive comments, protests, and questions from any persons here in the audience who wish to speak on the matter. Is there any member of the public wishing to address the council on this matter? We Hearing none, uh, Ms. City Clerk. Late I have received zero written protests. Okay, uh, Madam City Clerk, are there any persons registered to vote within annexation number 21 of CFD 2019-1? And if so, how many registered voters are there? The County of San Bernardino Registrar Voters has certified that there are no registered voters within Annexation Number 21 of Community Facilities District Number 2019-1. Okay, I now declare the public hearing closed, the time being 12.37 a.m. May I please have a motion to adopt Resolution 2022-249 of the Mayor's Council, uh, calling an election to submit to the qualified electors the question of levying a special tax within the area proposed to be annexed to CFD district number 2019-1 annexation number 21 is there a motion Moving. Charette second. second by Figueroa okay council member Sanchez yes council member Ibarra yes council member Figueroa yes. council member Charette yes council member Calvin yes council member Alexander aye Motion passes unanimously. The official ballots have been open and all voters are in favor of the proposition presented and the ballot and the election is now closed. Okay, thank you. May I have a motion please to adopt resolution 2022-250 of the Mayor's City Council of the City of San Bernardino, California declaring election results for CFD District 2019-1 annexation number 21. So Figueroa on the first and Charette on the second and call the roll. Council Member Sanchez. Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. 
Council Member Figueroa? Yes. Council Member Shurek? Yes. Council Member Calvin? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. I'd now ask for a motion to waive further reading and introduce by title only ordinance of the Mayor City Council of the City of San Bernardino, California amending ordinance number MC1607 and levying special taxes to be collected during fiscal year 22-23 to pay for the annual cost of the maintenance and servicing of landscaping, lighting, water quality improvements, graffiti, streets, street sweeping, parks and trail maintenance, a reserve fund for capital replacement and administrative expenses with respect to the City of San Bernardino's Community Facility District 2019-1. Is there a motion? Second. By Figueroa, second by Charette. Mayor, just a correction. Um, there's a typo on your script, and okay. we're introducing ordinance MC1607 and amending ordinance MC1520. Okay, with that mm -hmm. amendment, thank you. Okay. Uh, you still have the motion before you, and uh, we'll call the roll, please. Council Member, sure. oh, Council Member Sanchez. <laughs> We look alike. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Councilmember Sherat? Yeah. <laughs> Councilmember Calvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, it's uh, 1240, folks. We're on consent. Keep it short. Any pulls? I've got about four to pull. Are you playing? I'm kidding. Okay. All right. I'd like to pull. I'd like to pull number nineteen. Number nineteen. Okay. Question. And I have a. <laughs> and um, I need to recuse myself from item number twenty-eight due to uh, my employer is an awardee. Question on number twenty-six. Okay, uh, Councilman. Question on twenty-six. Is that right? Okay. Um, all right, Councilman. Go ahead with your question on twenty-six, please. Yeah, on question on number 26, I noticed that I'm always going to talk to you directors until I find out why we don't patronize our own local vendors. And all I see this is is a design, print, and mail preparation service, and we went out to Lake Forest in Orange County. You, you, are you guys going to tell me there's nobody in the city of San Bernardino that does, does print, mail, and preparation service? I know they do because I'm, I'm an elected official, so I, I use a local person that does that. <laughs> so that's my question why are we going so far when we have local talent here in the city of San Bernardino we've had success with the printer that we were working with and with the designer that we were working with and so this was more of us to be able to continue that service with four one-year extensions and if we want to do an RFP and go out for another vendor and try and see if we can do that we will when we did go out for the RFP for this there was no uh, local vendors that completed the RFP. That is my understanding. That was done before I. So, so how do we RFP. announce that? Because I can think. Well, there's one sitting on the dais, and and there's one that I use that's right there on Highland. So how how do we how do we do that? We can go out for another RFP. No, I'm saying how do we announce? Like yeah, how do we announce how we market that? So so local businesses, small businesses know that because there's a there's a plethora of small businesses that, that would be the purchasing that that. department that would do that. You know, yeah. who, who department? Purchasing department. Purchasing. Procurement. Purchasing. Is that Precious Carter's department? Yes. Who's, whose department is that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So try to go local next time, please. Will do. Local. Okay. Uh, and then the uh, recusal of number 28 by Councilmember Kelvin. Uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we do the balance? So we'll do the Move balance. to the balance. For the balance by Charette and Alexander. Okay, call the roll. Only item 19 was pulled, correct? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to deal with that after the vote. Cast your votes. Council Member Ibarra. Council Member Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. It's getting late. It's late. Council Member Alexander, your vote on the balance. Yeah. 
I, I went ahead and recorded your vote. Great. <clears throat> okay, the motion passes unanimously. Okay, um, Council Member Calvin pulled number 19. This is uh, Emergency Rental Assistance Program Update and Obligating ERA 1 al Reallocated Funds. Council Member? Thank you, um, Mr. Hodges. I appreciate you and all the work that you've done with bringing forth and working with Council Member uh, Ibarra and uh, Reynoso and myself uh, being on the ad hoc committee. Uh, when we approved this for Inland SoCal the last time, we council stipulated that they would work with um, local nonprofits. I want to make sure that that is still part of the agreement or do we have to request that at this time? That would be one item, that I, one question that I have for you. Uh, I believe you gave them that direction and that they said that they would. Um, I can triple check with them that they are still doing that. Okay, thank you very much. And then with um, number four, um, a suggestion that came from the ad hoc, adopt the emergency rental assistance subcommittee recommendations to prioritize utility debt eviction prevention services with any remaining or future disbursements of emergency rental assistance. So I believe that you had given us a number at the, the not the last meeting, but the meeting before last, of what would, what should be left, correct? Yes, that was an estimate based on the pipeline of applicants that we had. So is that, is that, um, that number, thank you, is that number still accurate or it's, it's, an, it's just an estimate or? They'll know it's, more as they go through that pipeline and verify if people are still in their homes and if they'll still require rental assistance. There'll be an attrition rate, but they'll have a more a clearer idea once they get through all of the applicants in the pipeline. Okay, and can we put? Um, can we then also request a reporting timeline to, um, with with Inland SoCal, so that the council is receiving or the ad hoc yes. is receiving a update on a regular basis, providing Councilman uh, Councilwoman Ibarra. What do you? think that that time frame should be? Um, I don't remember what it was for us the last time, but at least, you know, maybe every two months or something, or another, um, because we don't know how long this is going to take sure. to disperse these funds, uh, right? Yeah, um, your suggestion of quarterly is, is fine. Because uh, because you originally they stated that a lot of these were just um, folks that residents that were on the waiting list, right? Correct. So we probably would need to know sooner than later how many of those folks are actually still in need, how many of those folks are actually able to be found, because it's been quite some time since they've been operating from that from that list. Correct, and I think what delayed us in getting through the pipeline is receiving funds from the treasury and passing them along to United Way. Um, they'll get through them as quickly as possible. Um, I think what takes a little bit of time is that they need to verify if they're still in their residence, if they still need rental assistance instead of just distributing the money without verifying that. But I can have them try to work through the applications as quickly as they can and then report back to the council. So a quarterly report, then we can expect that by uh, March? Yes, if not sooner. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there a motion to approve 19? Move to approve. Second. Second by Alexander. Okay, cast your votes, please. Give me one moment. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Councilmember Sherat? Yes. Councilmember Calvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, these are items to be considered for future meetings. Item number 42, explore options for increasing, increasing both bike and pedestrian lanes of, of existing roadways in the downtown area. It's part of the general plan update and downtown specific plan. Uh, yes, but I would like to add something. Um, can we add uh, a, a safe streets plan? Um, so I know that they do this in New York, Chicago, uh, San Francisco. They have a safe street design. Everything from intersections to neighborhood streets to, to uh, uh, busy downtown streets. Everything from chicanes to wider sidewalks. Um, so all sorts of things like that. If we could implement that in the plan. But I would move to approve with that addition. 
Okay, is there a second? Second by Alexander. Cast your votes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, uh, item number 43, resolution to realign the California Big Cities Mayor Coalition to include cities with a minimum population of 220,000. Council Member Alexander, sir. Yes, this is uh, to design um, to make sure that we come in alignment with big cities because there's the Big 13, and then we won't have to um, go to the county for money. Those monies come directly from Sacramento straight to the city of San Bernardino instead of having to, uh, going through the county. And who is the resolution to? It's for us to proceed forward to uh, talk to the League of Cities, petition the uh, SCAG, all those other bodies to get them on our side and talk to the other cities that are above us that are also not receiving funds because uh, they're not a part of the Big 13. Okay, so that will come back in some form of staff report, I guess, to the council at a future later date. Okay, uh, is there a support? I'll move. Second. Okay, cast your votes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Item number 44, this is an urban forestry program that includes tree planting program, a review of city rules regarding the preservation of trees on both private and private property and within the public right-of-way and urban green foresting events. Yes, uh, there are millions of studies out there that show that more trees um, increase uh, quality of life. And especially down in the first ward, I mean, there's plenty of places where there is not one piece of shade. Um, and so we need to implement a, uh, a strategic plan to ensure that future development has uh, a component related to trees. Uh, and then that our old neighborhoods, we have a plan in place to implement tree planting um, and a sustainable plan for trimming these trees as well. So that's what this is. Move to approve. Second. Okay, uh, guess your votes. Motion passes unanimously. All right, um, thank you uh, for that. Item number 45 is a moratorium on truck terminal parking. Council Member Kelvin. Thank you very much. Uh, too bad uh, none of our folks are still here. Uh, this is not um, a fight on uh, against truck drivers. <laughs> this is about where they are being parked. This is about uh, parking in neighborhoods, parking in um, commercial areas, just utilizing any space. Um, this is something that a lot of my constituents uh, call about. I do understand uh, vacant land, uh, blighted land, that is just something for else for us to have to deal with. That it means that we have to contact property owners and get them to clean up their blighted land. Doesn't mean that we can then just go park uh, uh, big rigs in that space or any other type of vehicles um, that is not zoned for. So this is something that I would like for us to do until a study is done on updating the codes and creating spaces for truck terminals to come uh, into play. Okay, is there a motion? Motion to approve. Is there support? Okay, Lex. No, this is not against building truck terminals. This is about placing, well, this is about putting terminals inside of, of communities, residential areas. Okay, is there, there's a motion. Is there support? Is there a second? Uh, okay. I don't mind listening to what the staff has to bring back, but uh, I don't want to stop it. I, I have a problem with trucks parking in the seventh ward. They, okay. they, they park everywhere. Express it as either support or not. You right. I'm just, I'm just saying, I, I don't express it, but I just want to make sure that they, and the public understands. I know you want to get out of here, Mr. Mayor. So, um, so yeah, I, I'll give a second, but I just want to make sure that I understand that I like development of truck terminals because they have to park somewhere. It's just about where. Okay, so right. there's a second. Thank you, sir. Uh, members cast your votes to add this to a future council meeting. The motion fails. 
Uh, I want to thank all of our city staff and all of our administrators. Thank you very much. It's been a delight to be here till almost one o'clock, one of my longest meetings. I want to congratulate uh, my colleague, uh, Council Member Charette, who will be uh, leading us fearlessly, I'm sure, uh, as Mayor Pro Tem. Um, we'll see, though. There's, there's doubts. Thank <laughs> you.